Okay, welcome to Jikesha classes. Today we are going to discuss the latest amendments applicable for May 2022 and November 2022 attempt of CA final for direct tax and international taxation that is your paper 7 of CA final. Now I am sure by now you must have already started preparing yourself. Those people who could not make it up in the previous attempt, this particular session, this particular lecture will be of an immense amount of help to them. There are numerous amount of amendments being made by Nirmala Sitharamanji. Most of the amendments are applicable with retrospective effect. The government has started with a new trend since last year due to Corona. Most of the amendments around 70-75% amendments are made applicable from AY21-22 and only 25-30% amendments are applicable from current year. This has become a new trend for government. The very first amendment is in basic concepts, basic concepts and introduction to income tax of my book that is chapter on tax rates. Now tax rates there has not been any great change, three amendments, small small amendments. Number one, the tax rate for domestic company. Such a domestic company which has not opted for section 115B AA or 115B AB. Then the tax rate is generally 30% for domestic company. But instead of 30%, the tax rate is 25% if turnover, sales or gross receipt of such domestic company two years back did not exceed 400 crore, was up to 400 crore. So last year, we had to see the turnover of previous year 1819 and that has been changed now. Now we'll have to see the turnover of 1920 because current year is 2122. So 2122, two years back would have been 1920. So there is no great amendment here. Second is surcharge rate for individual HUF, AOP, BOI and artificial juridical person, 5 people. Those 5 people who enjoy basic exemption. These people have got 5 different surcharge rates, 0%, 10%, 15%, 25% and 37%. This 25 and 37 were introduced 2-3 years back only during immediately before Corona. We know about it. This 25 and 37 percent is not applicable on three incomes. Now one more income has been added. 25 and 37 percent will not be applicable on dividend income also apart from short term capital gains referred to in 111A, long term capital gains referred to in 112A and income of FPI, foreign portfolio investor referred to in 115AD subsection 1 clause B. Apart from these three incomes, this benefit is given for or benefit is extended to dividend income also. Meaning thereby for these four incomes, surcharge rate shall not exceed 15% of the tax. And CII number, next amendment is CII number, cost inflation index number for the current year will be 317. And nothing great. Next amendment is very important, exempt income section 1010D. Section 10 clause 10D provides exemption on maturity proceeds of life insurance policy. However, this exemption will not be available on unit linked insurance policy, ULIP it is called as, on ULIP but high premium ULIP. If three conditions are satisfied, then this exemption under 1010D will not be available. Two provisos have been introduced, proviso 4 and proviso 5 to section 1010D. What is it? Fourth proviso states that it's three conditions. Number one, ULIP is issued on or after 1st February 21. A 1st February 21 is technically a part of the last year, previous year 2021. But it is also the date of introduction of budget, announcement of budget. So government says today we are announcing budget. So today onwards anybody purchases ULIP, ULIP is now issued on or after 1st February 21 and the annual premium of such ULIP exceeds 2,50,000 at any time during the tenure of ULIP. ULIP is generally for 10 years, 7 years, 15 years, different different periods available. Anytime if it exceeds 2,50,000 and ULIP matures otherwise by way of death. Now let us understand what exactly is the provision. So earlier, so first of all ULIP is insurance come investment. Now money invested, the premium paid by people like you and me to insure our life, the amount paid to insurance company, insurance company will deduct some mortality charges, administrative charges and invest in stock market. Earlier, income from investment in the units of mutual fund, units of mutual fund, if they are equity oriented fund, if it is equity oriented fund, such income by way of long term capital gains were exempt under section 10 clause 38. But 
फर्स्ट फेब्रुवरी एटीन फाइनेंशियल इयर एटीन नाइनटीन बजेट गवर्नमेंट रिमूव दिस टेन थर्टी एट एक्सम्शन एंड रिप्लेस इट बाय सेक्शन हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेल्व ए वी नो अबाउट इट सो इफ इनकम फ्रॉम यूनिट्स कैपिटल गेन फ्रॉम यूनिट्स नॉर्मल यूनिट्स इज इज टैक्सेबल नाउ सो इफ आई डिरेक्टली इन्वेस्ट इन टू यूनिट्स देन इट इज टैक्सेबल देन इफ आई एम इन्वेस्टिंग इन यूनिट्स थ्रू इंश्योरेंस कंपनी इन द नेम ऑफ यूलिप देन दैट शुड ऑल्सो भी टैक्सेबल वाई शुड दैट बी नॉट टैक्सेबल so government introduce taxability of this by removing exemption under 1010d on the maturity proceeds however this exemption will continue in case where the policy holder dies the policy matures because of death three conditions you'll have to remember this is very important from exam perspective 1010d fourth proviso three condition ulip issued on or after 1st february 21 annual premium exceeds 250000 at any time and third condition maturity is otherwise by way of death so technically first two conditions you need to remember however fifth proviso states that that in case assc has more than one insurance policy more than one unit link insurance policy premium does not exceed 250000 independently i've got three ulips independently premium does not exceed 250000 but when combined together the premium exceeds 250000 means assc has split his 250000 premium more than 2 lakh into 2 3 insurance policies then in such situation fifth proviso states that that exemption will however be available under 1010d only on maturity proceeds of only those ulips where the combined annual premium did not exceed 2 lakh 50000 first of all insurance policy should have been issued on or after 1st february 21 if already issued up to 31st january 21 then this new amendment is not applicable first february 21 on onwards if more than one ulip for example assc has got three ulips issued on or after first february 21 ulip 1 with the annual premium of 1 lakh ulip 2 with the annual premium of 1 lakh 20 and ulip 3 with the annual premium of 1 lakh 40000 ulip 1 1 lakh ulip 2 1 lakh 20000 ulip 3 1 lakh 40000 then assc can claim exemption on maturity proceeds of those ulips issued on or after 1st february 21 where combined annual premium that is aggregate annual premium did not exceed 2 lakh 50000 so here assc can claim exemption on maturity proceeds of these two ulip 1 ulip 2 where the combined premium is 2 lakh 20000 or he can claim exemption on ulip 1 and ulip uh, 3 where the combined premium is 2 lakh 40000 these two combinations are possible that is he can claim exemption on ulip 1 and 3 or he can claim exemption on ulip 1 and 2 but he cannot claim exemption on 2 and 3 if he tries to claim on 2 and 3 then the annual premium is 2 lakh 60000 or if he tries to claim exemption on all 3 then the premium is 3 lakh 60000 then in that case he will not be allowed so total aggregate exceeds 2 lakh 50000 but he will still be allowed to claim exemption on two of them however this is applicable only if ulips are issued on or after 1st february 2021 if there was another ulip suppose any assc has got ulip 4 also ulip 4 the annual premium is uh 2 lakh 80000 but if this was issued before 1st february 2021 then this new rule is not applicable to this is a very important amendment keep it in your mind along with example fourth and fifth proviso fourth proviso talks about three condition fifth proviso talks about exception right next is 104e and 104f both are unimportant you can skip them what is it 104e let's start with 104e says that if one non resident has entered into a non deliverable forward contract one non resident has entered into contract which contract non deliverable forward contract forward contract means contract in foreign currency market dollar trading with offshore banking unit located in an ifsc offshore banking unit of ifsc offshore generally means outside india but here offshore would mean special economic zones seebs special economic zone export oriented zones etc software technology park hardware technology park then income of that non resident from non deliverable forward contract will be exempt from here if he earns any income that income will be exempt however this is totally unimportant from exam perspective next is 104f 104f is also an important from exam perspective it says that understand this there is one non resident whose income is going to be exempt non resident has got one aircraft aircraft includes aircraft engine also 
aircraft, aircraft engine, helicopter, helicopter engine, four things. We will use the word aircraft. This aircraft is given on lease to unit of IFSC. If unit of IFSC has commenced this operations on or before 31st March 2024, then income of non-resident by way of royalty or interest from aircraft, aircraft engine given on lease to unit of IFSC, whatever income is received, this income will be exempt under section 10 clause 4F. However, this is totally unimportant. I am not expecting any question in exam. Next is 10 clause 50. This is slightly important, but this we will be repeating once again in, in, a, in amendment pertaining to equalization levy chapter. If you recollect, there are two types of equalization levy covered by section 165, 6 person equalization levy on providing of certain online specified services and section 165A, 2 person equalization levy on online sale or supply of goods by e-commerce operator. These two, if you recollect, once equalization levy is paid, first of all section 165, 165A not of income tax act but of chapter 8 of finance act 16. If equalization levy is deducted 6% or paid from own pocket at the rate of 2%, then income of non-resident from such transaction was going to be exempt. However, this exemption will no more be available on two incomes. Any, any consideration received by non-resident, income of non-resident, any consideration received by non-resident from these two activities, if it is otherwise taxable in India in the form of royalty or FTS, fees for technical service, then exemption under 10 clause 50 will not be available. What is the logical reason behind it that I will discuss with you when we come to amendments pertaining to equalization levy. The next one, again important from exam perspective, amendments in section 111A and 112A. Now these are pertaining to ULIPS only, ULIPS which are issued on or after 1st February 21. This is 111A is short term capital gains taxable at 15% rate and 112A is long term capital gain exceeding first 1 lakh taxable at the rate of 10%. Now 111A and 112A are available only on transfer of only on short term or long term capital gain arising on transfer of three assets, equity shares of a company, units of equity oriented fund and units of business trust. Second asset is unit of equity oriented fund. Now this units of equity oriented fund will be called as equity oriented fund only if the mutual fund has out of the total proceeds has invested in listed shares of domestic company more than 65% of the total proceeds available under that fund. You are investing in units with mutual fund under a particular scheme. Mutual fund is investing in listed securities, listed shares of domestic company to the extent of more than 65% of the total proceeds under that fund or under that scheme. Then that particular fund or scheme will be called as equity oriented fund. Now, amendment has been made in these two sections with regards to meaning of equity oriented stating that stating that in order to be called as equity oriented fund more than 65 percent of the funds of the proceeds or funds under that scheme should be invested in listed shares of domestic company. If this condition is fulfilled by insurance company, now equity oriented fund means fund of mutual fund. Instead of equity oriented fund, now we have insurance company insurance company issuing ULIP. Units of ULIP, if more than 65 percent of the proceeds are invested by insurance company in listed shares of domestic company all throughout the tenure of the ULIP, then ULIP will be regarded at par with equity oriented fund unit, EOF unit and accordingly benefit of section 111A and 112A will be available on ULIP also. We just checked out that ULIPs are going to be taxable now. 1010D exemption is not available because of 4th and 5th proviso to section 1010D. If 3 conditions are fulfilled, then exemption is denied except in case of death. That means ULIP maturity proceeds will be taxable. So taxable at what rate? So there is a clarification. Couple of sections have been introduced. Number 1, ULIP will be called if exemption is lost because of proviso 4 and proviso 5 of 1010D, then number 1, ULIP maturity proceeds will be taxable under the head capital gain. ULIP will be considered as a capital asset. Capital assets have been defined in section 2 clause 14. Section 2 clause 14 
already had sub clause A and sub clause B. So now what is newly introduced is sub clause C. Sub clause C definition of capital asset states that ULIP will be considered as a capital asset. However, ULIP will be called as capital asset and accordingly income maturity proceeds will be taxable under the capital gain not under the income from other sources provided exemption is lost because of fourth and fifth proviso. Second amendment has been made by in capital gain chapter by introducing section 45 clause 1b. 45 clause 1b, it talks about the procedure, how to compute taxable capital gain on such ULIP. Third amendment which we will be discussing in capital gain chapter in detail at length, third amendment has been made in section 111a and section 112a stating that ULIPs will be called as or ULIP will be considered if exemption under 1010d is denied because of fourth and fifth proviso then ULIP will be treated at par with units of equity oriented fund. And if it is considered as units of equity oriented fund then it will be called as long term capital asset if period of holding exceeds 12 months, 12 months and it will be called as short term capital asset if period of holding, period of holding is up to 12 months. And in case it turns out to be long term then benefit of section 112A will be available 10 percent tax rate on LTCG exceeding first 1 lakh. And if it is short term then benefit of 111A will be available. However, this benefit of 111A and 112A will be available on maturity proceeds of ULIP only if such ULIP is treated at par with units of equity oriented fund. And when will it be considered or when will it be treated at par with units of equity oriented fund? Only when more than 65 percent of the proceeds available with the insurance company under that particular scheme is invested in listed shares of domestic company all throughout the tenure of ULIP. So what all sections have been amended or introduced? Number 1, Section 2, Clause 14, Sub Clause C has been introduced, Section 45, 1B has been introduced and third amendment is carried out in Section 111A and Section 112A. All these things will be repeated once again when we come to amendments pertaining to capital gain chapter. Proceeding further, Section 2, Clause 14, period of holding should be more than 12 months if it turns out to be equity oriented units, 45, 1B and benefit of 111A and 112A will be available on such ULIPs also. Next is TDS chapter, not till here clear, okay, TDS chapter. TDS chapter has observed various amendments but lesser in number as compared to amendments last year. Last year there were exorbitant number of amendments in TDS chapter but this time there have been still amendments but small small amendments. Two new sections have been introduced of TDS tax was deductible under 36 sections, now there are 38 sections, two new sections 194P and 194Q have been introduced. But before that, let us discuss some other provisions also which are introduced in TDS chapter. In TDS chapter, if you recollect there was one section, there are two parties, payer and payee. Payer makes payment to payee, we know about it and payer has to deduct TDS, agreed. But according to section 206AA which was introduced quite a few many years back, payee does not furnish his permanent account number or Aadhaar number, payee does not furnish permanent account number or Aadhaar number to payer, then TDS will be as per 206AA, TDS will be deductible either at the rate applicable that is rate prescribed in the finance act or the rate that is rate in force or the rate given in the respective section. Simply TDS will be at the rate applicable or TDS will be at the rate of TDS will be at the rate of 20 percent whichever is higher. This was already there, no changes have been made here. But apart from 206AA, one more section has been introduced in the series 206AB. 206AB is applicable with effect from 1st July 2021, correct? 206AB states that, that if payee is the person, payer makes payment to payee, but if payee has not furnished IT return of the last two years. Number one, ROI not furnished for last two years, ROI of last two years not furnished. Which two years? Two years immediately preceding the year in which tax is deductible. When is the tax deductible? Tax is deductible at the time of payment or at the time of crediting account of the payee, whichever is earlier. That earlier event is happening in the current year, financial year 21-22. The last two years IT returns are not filed, due date has expired plus due date of filing IT return given in section 
not the belated IT return, but the regular due date, regular IT return due date has expired and the amount of TDS plus TCS. Okay, first of all, IT return of both the last two years should not have been filed by PE. And third condition is amount of TDS plus TCS in each year, each of these last two years, each of last two years exceeds or is equal to, equal to or greater than 50,000. These three conditions are very important, you will have to remember. Which three condition? Payee has not furnished IT return of the last two years immediately preceding the year in which tax deductible plus IT return due date for both these years has already expired as per 139.1 and the amount of TDS plus TCS combined together in each of these years independently, each of these last two years independently was 50,000 or more than 50,000. These three conditions are fulfilled then payee will be called a specified person and in such situation while making payment to such payee TDS will be as per 206 AB. TDS will be either twice the rate applicable, twice the rate applicable or at the rate of 5 percent whichever is higher, whichever is higher. This is very important from exam perspective, TDS will be twice the rate, 206 double A was TDS at the rate applicable or 20 percent whichever is higher, but here TDS will be at twice the rate applicable or 5 percent whichever is higher. Of course, subject to some exceptions which I will discuss, but you need to remember three conditions from exam perspective. IT return not filed for both the last two years plus due date of filing IT return has expired for each of these two years and the amount of TDS plus TCS combined together in each of these two years was 50,000 or more than 50,000. However, there are six exceptions. This section 206 AB does not apply to six cases or in six sections. With six sections, I will tell you, but before that, remember it is applicable from 1st July 2021, financial year 21 22. Very important section. And there is a clarification, this entire concept that means specified person, concept of specified person does not apply to non-resident not having PE in India. PE means permanent establishment, not having PE in India as per Income Tax Act or PE as per DTAA as the case may be. Meaning thereby this section will be applicable to all resident PE, all resident PE plus it will be applicable to those non-resident PEs who are having a permanent establishment in India. Either PE should be resident or non-resident having PE in India. If he is not having PE in India, he will be exempted. And there are other six exceptions also, which are these six, I will explain it to you. So 206 AB, first of all, six exception, not applicable in case of TDS on salary, section 192, TDS on EPF account withdrawal, 192A, 194 B double B winning incomes from lottery, crossword puzzle, card game. 194 double B winning from horse race, 194 LBC that is amount payable by securitization trust to its unit holders and 194 N cash withdrawal from bank exceeding 20 lakhs or exceeding 1 crore. Now if you recollect 194 N is divided into two parts. Part 1, those who have not filed IT return for the last 3 years, no ROI for last 3 years, then TDS will be applicable on amount of withdrawal exceeding 20 lakhs. And in all other cases, if IT returns have been filed, then TDS will be on the amount exceeding 1 crore, if you recollect. So here in 194N, IT return not filed for last 3 years, but in 206AB, IT return not filed for last 2 years, both the 2 years. Remember this, no confusion, no mixing up. 194N, 3 years, 206AB, 2 years. Due date has expired, TDS, TCS exceeds or is equal to 50,000 and does not apply as per proviso to non-resident not having PE in India. Very important section. One more clarification is there that what if 206 AA also becomes applicable and 206 AB also becomes applicable. 206 AB will apply when IT return not filed by PE for last two years. 206 AA will apply if permanent account number or Aadhaar number is not provided by PE. Here the rate is maximum 20 percent here, twice the rate or 5 percent. If both of them get attracted, PE has not furnished PAN number also and PE has not filed IT return for last two years, then in such situation tax shall be deductible at that rate whichever is higher out of these two. Which rate is higher? By default 20 percent. But here 206 AB twice the rate, so in case rate was 30 percent, then twice the rate will become 60 percent or if the rate was 20 percent, then twice the rate will become 40 percent, then 206 AB ka rate will be higher. 
whatever may it be, whichever is higher, that is what is the clarification. 194 dividend, TDS on dividend, TDS on dividend, TDS on dividend is at the rate of 10 percent. Two amendments are carried out or two exceptions are introduced. Second exception is unimportant. First exception is slightly important. No TDS on dividend paid or payable by a special purpose vehicle SPV which should be Indian company, domestic company declaring dividend to business trust. Business trust because in the hands of business trust such dividends from special purpose vehicle will be exempt. In the hands of business trust, such dividends are exempt under section 1023 FC sub clause B. Since it is exempt, therefore, no TDS now under section 194 on this particular dividend. Huh. On regular other dividends, Reliance Industry paying dividend to me, TDS will be applicable if the dividend amount is more than 5000 in a year, 10 percent is the rate. Okay, This is slightly important, this will be repeated once again also when we come to business trust part. 194 IB, TDS on rental income, rent of immovable property provided rent exceeds 50,000 per month, 5 percent is the rate of TDS provided rent exceeds 50,000 per month and rent is of immovable property, not of plant machinery etc. 194 IB is applicable to those individual HUF who are not covered by 194 I. What is the amendment? Amendment is that, that 194 IB. 1st July 2021 onwards, if 206 AB gets attracted, that is payee has not furnished IT return for the last two years and the due date has expired and TDS is more than 50,000 or equal to 50,000, then the amount of TDS under 194 IB, which is 5 percent otherwise, read with 206 AB, amount of TDS should not exceed the rent of the last month of the financial year, TDS amount should not exceed the rent of the last month of the financial year or the last month of the tenancy as the case may be, last month of the financial year that is March month's rent or should not exceed the rent of the last month of the tenancy as the case may be. 194P very interesting section but I do not think so question will be asked on this, keep it in your mind still. 194P. Okay. Now, what happens is, if employee, employee is receiving salary, salary, then TDS is deductible under section 192 at the rate in force. However, instead of salary, if it is pension, pension, then TDS is not deducted under any section on pension. Pension is received after retirement. I am talking about monthly pension, which is called uncommuted pension. So, government wanted to cover up pension also. So, what government did, they introduced 194P. Now, unfortunately, 194P in my opinion should not have been introduced in this chapter. It should have been numbered not as 194P. This should have been introduced as a part of salary chapter. What happens is, now somebody is an employee working with ABC Limited. Earlier he was working with ABC Limited. Now he has retired. Let us say Mr. X, he receives from ABC Limited, his ex employer, he receives pension. This pension is deposited by him in his account with let us say Bank of India. Bank of India is a bank, this pension is deposited in this pension account. Pension account. If certain conditions are fulfilled, then the bank with whom this pension is deposited, that bank will be called as specified bank, bank will be deducting TDS on pension, bank will be called as specified bank. Well, this is such a section where pension is paid by ABC Limited. Somebody else is paying the pension, but TDS is deducted by bank. One person is paying pension, somebody else is deducting TDS. Isn't that surprising? Nirmala Sita Ramanji is brainchild. Okay. However, there are various conditions. Condition number one, first condition, this person is 75 or more than 75 years of age. Second condition, he is resident. Payee should be resident. Mr. X should be resident in India. And third condition, he has got maximum two incomes, only two types of incomes, no other income other than these two income. Which two income? Pension income, income by way of pension, pension is received from ABC Limited and second income is interest. However, it should be interest, but not any interest, it should be interest from specified bank only, from any account with specified bank. And specified bank means what? Specified bank means that bank in which he deposits his pension. 
only two incomes, three condition, he should be 75 years or more than 75 years of age at any time during the previous year plus he should be resident in India plus he should not be having more than two types of income that is pension and apart from pension at the max he can have interest. Interest could be from any account, savings account, recurring deposit account, FD account, any kind of account but only from specified bank and specified bank means the one in which his pension is deposited. All the three conditions are fulfilled then bank will be deducting TDS under section 194P. However, bank will deduct TDS not only from pension amount, bank will deduct TDS from both the incomes, total income. Of course, total income less chapter 6A deduction, deduction under chapter 6A, LIC, PPF, donation, etc. And also after taking into account rebate available under section 87A, which is available if the net income is up to 5 lakhs, rebate is available from tax up to 12,500 rupees. After considering that, bank will deduct TDS. However, this entire concept is optional for Mr. X. It is not mandatory. An option is to be exercised on a yearly basis, year to year basis. There is one more benefit given. First of all, if these three conditions are fulfilled, then Mr. X will be called a specified person. Bank will be called a specified bank. This person will be called a specified person. One more relief is being provided to this person, Mr. X, that if all conditions are fulfilled and as I said, this is optional, Mr. X will have to furnish one form, form number, you don't need to remember form number, that form will have to be filled up and furnished in physical form, not in electronic form. He will have to authorize the bank to deduct TDS. If he furnishes this form on a year to year basis, then only this TDS under 194P will be applicable. And if 194P TDS is deducted by bank, then he will be exempted from the requirement of filing IT return. ROI will not be required. IT return will not be required. This is really a nonsense concept. Why is it a nonsense concept? Because 75 years or more, how many such people are living in this country? And out of them, how many of them are receiving pension? And out of them, how many of them are receiving only pension and interest income from specified bank? That is a questionable thing. And again, government expects them to furnish this form in a physical form. Go to the bank, fill up and give all the details of your chapter 6A, rebate, etc. Fill up everything, bank will do the needful. Simply, simply and then IT return not required. In my opinion, this is not a great benefit to anybody. Reason is that instead of going to the bank and furnishing this form, this person might as well go to a chartered accountant or a normal accountant. Accountant will file IT return. There is nothing great here, nothing great here. So 194P is unimportant from exam perspective, applicable retrospectively from AY2122. TDS on total income. Now here TDS will be deductible on the total income of the specified senior citizen. Specified senior citizen who will deduct TDS? Specified bank will deduct TDS. That is banks notified by government. Specified senior citizen means resident citizen who is of the age 75 years or more plus other condition. Amount, any amount, TDS will be at the rate in force. That is slab rates. Whether he has opted for 115BAC or not opted depending on that. After chapter 6 a deduction and rebate under 87A, three conditions. Okay, he will have to furnish this form 12BBA in a paper form read with rule so and so. You don't need to remember the form number so it's okay. In my opinion, this section is unimportant. So I have clarified it here that this is optional and this is such a such an amazing section where payer is somebody else, payer is ex employer, ABC limited, ex employer, ABC limited is making payment of pension but the TDS is deducted by bank. Another thing which I have mentioned, uh, I have mentioned here is that IT return will not be required, will not be required to file IT return if TDS is being taken care by bank. However, nothing great. 194Q very important section from exam perspective. When we, when we discuss revision test paper RTP of May 22, at that time you will realize that institute has started asking questions on that. This is very important from exam perspective and even in real life also this section is very important. Why it is important you will understand. Okay, this is on the same lines. This was introduced from 1st July 2021. Now here you will have to remember the date. Date remembering will play a very important role because if you observe institute's questions, institute is specifically asking question with regards to date. They will give you two options in the question that what will happen if transaction takes place on so and so date and what will happen if the transaction takes place after so and so date. They specifically ask so you need to remember the date. What is 194Q? 194Q is on the same lines as in case of TCS. 
TCS tax collectible at source under section 206C subsection 1H which was introduced last year. 206C 1H was introduced with effect from 1st October 2020 last year and on the same lines TDS has been introduced under section 194Q exactly same provision everything is same minute difference on or after 1st July 2021 okay now what was TCS TCS was that that TCS under 19206C subsection 1H was applicable if sellers turnover or sales or gross received last year etc last year exceeded 10 crores exceeded rupees 10 crore same then seller will be required to collect TCS exactly same condition has been introduced that this TDS section is applicable on purchase of goods goods purchase provided turnover sales gross receipt of buyer buyers last year's turnover sales gross receipt exceeded 10 crore turnover etc of which year of last year huh? year immediately preceding the year in which TCS is applicable or the year immediately preceding the year in which tax is required to be deducted. Sales turnover gross receipt of last year exceeded 10 crore, exceeded rupees 10 crore. Then buyer will be required to deduct TDS. Rate of TDS TCS is exactly the same. TCS was also at the rate of 0.1 percent. TDS is also at the rate of 0.1 percent. However, both the sections have some threshold limit. TDS is applicable only, only on the amount exceeding first 50 lakhs per seller in a year, in a year. So, TCS was also applicable only if the amount of purchase exceeded rupees 50 lakhs in a year from the same buyer. TDS may who will deduct TDS? Buyer makes payment to seller for purchase of goods. Buyer will deduct TDS and as far as TCS is concerned, who will collect tax? Seller is receiving amount from buyer seller will be responsible to collect the tax. TCS will be on seller, TDS will be on buyer. Buyers last year's turnover etc should have exceeded 10 crore. Here sellers turnover etc last year should have exceeded 10 crore. Rate of TDS is same, threshold limit is also same. And there is a clarification that no TDS and no TCS under these two sections on the first 50 lakhs. 50 lakh rupees is a yearly limit but it is a limit per seller or it is a limit here per buyer for TCS, remember this. I have also covered the comparative analysis between TDS and TCS under these two sections after 2-3 points, you can have a look at it. TCS was introduced last year, TDS is introduced in the current year. There are two more differences which we will be discussing and highlighting them, these are institute's favorite point, you need to observe these two sections thoroughly. I hope you recollect 206C1H. 1st October 2020 it was introduced and this section 194Q introduced from 1st July 2021. Here buyer's turnover last year should have exceeded 10 crore. Here seller's turnover should have exceeded 10 crore last year. At what point of time? This is important point. TDS is applicable either at the time of payment to the payee or at the time of crediting the account of the payee that is crediting account of the seller whichever is earlier in point of time. However, for TCS, TCS is applicable under 206C1H only at the time of receipt. This is an important difference you need to keep it in mind. Threshold limit is same in both the sections, 50 lakh here, 50, uh, amount payable to, uh, amount payable exceeding 50 lakh per seller and here amount receivable per buyer in TCS chapter. Rate of TDS is 0.1, rate of TCS is also 0.1 percent on the amount exceeding 50 lakh. However, this is another point of difference that if payee or uh, the seller does not furnish his permanent account number or other number, then in TDS chapter, TDS section 194Q, instead of 0.1, TDS will be at the rate of 5 percent instead of 0 0.1, 206 AA. However, in TCS it is slightly different, understand, here 0.1 percent, but if buyer does not furnish his permanent account number or other number, then TCS will be at the rate of 1 percent instead of 0.1 percent. Here 5 percent, here 1 percent. This is one of the major difference. Concept is same, the other party has not furnished his permanent account number or other number, but the rate will be different. Instead of 0.1, in TDS, instead of 0.1, TCS will be at the rate of 5 percent and here instead of 0.1 percent, TCS will be at the rate of 1 percent. Actually, here instead of 0.1, it should have been 20 percent, 
20 percent as per 206 double a but instead of that it will be 5 percent this is an important point so two point of major difference is point number two and point number five which you need to keep it in your mind last point sorry second last point is date of applicability this section is newly introduced 194q from 1st july 21 however mind you same thing i told in the last year's amendment lecture when 206c1 h was introduced both the sections have a threshold limit of 50 lakh rupees and both the places it is clarified that no TDS and no TCS on first 50 lakhs with a, for transaction with the same person. It is not combined together. Suppose I am buying goods from 6 different parties, 10 lakh rupees each person, I am buying goods worth 10 lakh rupees from 6 different people, total 60 lakhs and my last year's turnover exceeded 10 crore, no. Here it is the transaction value is 10 lakh rupees per person, it is not exceeding 50 lakh rupees. Combined together it is 60 lakh rupees, agreed, but combined together not to be seen, it is per seller or per buyer, right. Okay, date of applicability, this section was introduced last year. No TDS or TCS on first 50 lakh and most important point you need to remember from exam perspective is that what if both of them get attracted, TDS and TCS both of them get attracted together. How is this possible? This is possible only if in a situation where the sales gross receipt or turnover of the last year of both the parties exceeded 10 crore rupees. Buyer's turnover exceeded 10 crore, attracting TDS. Seller's turnover also exceeded last year 10 crore, attracting TCS, assuming that transaction between them is worth more than 50 lakh. However, in such situation, it has been clarified that in such situation, TDS shall be applied over TCS under 206C1H. Both of them shall not be applied, any one of them and that one of them will be TDS. However, remember that TDS section was introduced on 1st July 2021. So, before that, that means transaction exceeding 50 lakhs up to 30th June 2021, TCS was only TCS was applicable. So, that you need to take care of. I hope you are understanding. Another thing which I was talking about is that last year I had explained for 206C1H, this time I am explaining for same point for 194Q. What is that point? Point is that the threshold limit of 50 lakh rupees in a year, agreed, but and the section is introduced from 1st July 21, agreed, but in order to verify whether threshold limit of 50 lakh rupees is exceeded or not, you need to check the turnover, you need to check the transaction value, not from 1st July 2021. For the purpose of finding out whether 50 lakh limit is breached or not, 50 lakh limit is exceeded or not per buyer, per seller, etc., we do not need to check the transaction value from the date of applicability of TDS section, not from 1st July 21, but from the beginning of the financial year, that is from 1st April 2021. Keep it in your mind, right? Okay. So, 50 lakh rupees, 0.1 percent on amount exceeding 1st 50 lakh, I have clarified it here that no TDS on first 50 lakh rupees very clearly I have mentioned, so no confusion. Nature of payment, payment is for purchase of goods. TCS section 206C1H, it was payment received for sale of goods, here it is for purchase of goods. Another thing, the turnover last year should have exceeded 10 crore, agreed, but then 10 crore from what? It should be 10 crore from the business, turnover from business, gross receipt sales turnover from business should have exceeded 10 crore rupees and not the total gross receipts, you know. So, you do not need to take into account income under other heads, only PGBP turnover should have exceeded 10 crore last year, okay. Then first point, points to be noted, first point is unimportant, there is a clarification, no TDS on notified payers or notified buyers. So, one of the buyer notified by government is Air India Assets Holding Limited, however, it is unimportant from exam point of view. Next point, seller does not furnish PAN number to the buyer, then TDS instead of 20 percent as specified under 206AA, the TDS will have to be at the rate of 5 percent. This is an important point, keep it in your mind. No TDS up to 30th June 21, agreed, but then I have clarified in order to find out whether 50 lakh is exceeded or not, we need to take into account, we also need to take into account purchase transactions carried out between 1st April 21 to 30th June 21. Purchase transaction with a particular party from 1st April 21 will be taken into account. No TDS under 194Q if tax is deductible under any other provision or any other section of the Act. Meaning thereby 194Q will work like a residuary section. 
first you try applying other sections of TDS chapter, if other sections fail, then only TDS will be applicable under 194Q. And secondly, if tax is collectible, so in two situation 194Q will not apply. Number one, in a situation where tax is deductible under other sections and number two, in a case where same transaction is, la is subject to TCS. If TCS is applicable, TDS will not apply, except of, except of TCS under 206C1H. What does that mean? What do you mean by except of 206C1H? Meaning thereby, if 206C1H is also applicable on the same transaction, then 194Q will prevail. This I have already clarified to you in this table, last point, that 194Q TDS will prevail over 206C1H. With that 194Q comes to an end, very important section, please read it twice, thrice, any number of times as much as possible. Next is 196D, nothing great in 196D, I am not expecting any question. 196D, TDS on payment to FII, for an institutional investor, the TDS was supposed to be on the income covered by section 115 AD subsection 1 clause A, that is income from securities, income from securities that is dividend, interest etc. TDS was supposed to be at the rate of 20% plus surcharge plus health and education says. However, now amendment is carried out, now instead of only 20%, we will have to compare between number A, 20% plus surcharge plus health and education says or TDS will be at the rate specified in the DTAA, whichever is lower. Up till last year, DTAA rates were not to be taken into account, but now with effect from last year only, AY21-22, retrospectively. TDS under 196D will be subjected to DTAA rates also. Now, this facility is being provided only for two sections, 195 and now 196D. Earlier, it was only for 195 where you need to compare between the rate given in the Act or rate given in Finance Act or DTAA rate. DTAA rates were not to be taken into account for any other section. However, only for these two sections in the entire chapter, DTAA rates will play a role where the payee is non-resident. Like for example, 194E, payment to non-resident sportsman who is not a citizen of India, TDS is at the rate of 20% on incomes covered by section 115, 115B AA, sports income, 20% plus surcharge plus. Here, DTAA rates are not to be, were never to be taken into account. So, even if DTAA rate was 5%, we had to ignore 5%, TDS had to be at 20% only for all other section. Only for these two section, DTAA rates will be taken into account. 206AA that we already checked out, 206AA says that if TDS is deductible under 194Q, where the rate is 0.1%, if payee does not furnish his permanent account number or other number, then TDS will not be at 20%, TDS will be at 5% rate instead of 20%. Very simple. Okay, then this brief comparison we are done with, this will play an important role. Please mark this as important. This would really help you. An institute has been asking question on this comparative analysis. This comparative analysis table has been of immense help to practicing CAs also, even in office also you can supply. Similar kind of amendments are carried out in TCS chapter. In TDS chapter, the way 206AB was introduced, stating that payee has not filed IT return for the last two years, due date has expired and TDS, TCS amount is 50,000 or more. Similar provision is introduced in TCS chapter 206CCA. Like here, the TDS will be, a payee has not filed IT return of last two years, then TCS, sorry, TDS will be at twice the rate or 5 percent. Here also same thing, twice the rate or 5 percent, twice the rate or 5 percent with the same three condition, exactly same provision. I mentioned it also, same as 206AB of TDS chapter. TCS on amount received from specified person will be at higher of the following two rates, twice the rate applicable or 5 percent. And what do you mean by specified person? Specified person means fulfilling three condition. IT return not filed for last two years, so and so, so and so. Specified person does not include non-resident who does not have a PE in India. Same thing was there in the form of proviso in 206AB. And second, if 206CC also gets attracted in addition to 206CCA, then tax shall be collectible at that rate which is higher of the two rates. What is 206CC? This was 206 CCA, double CA, payee has not filed IT return of last two years and 206 C means payee has not furnished permanent account number or Aadhaar number, PAN number or Aadhaar number is not furnished by uh, the buyer. 
same now in tcs also this provision is important 206 double ca and tds chapter 206 ab is important these two are both important sections from exam perspective next is 234 abc interest under 234 abc or fees under 234 efgh etc so technically amendments are carried out one 234h is newly introduced fees for failure to link permanent account number with other number, we will discuss. First is interest under 234C. 234C is one person per month interest or a part of a month for shortfall in the payment of advance tax installment within the installment due date. If advance tax installment is not paid within the installment due date, then this interest is levyable. However, there are some exceptions to applicability of 234C. What are these exceptions? Stating that three exceptions were there that 234 c will not apply if the shortfall in payment of advance tax installment is attributable to underestimation or failure to estimate failure to estimate winning income winning from lottery crossword puzzle card game capital gain failure to estimate capital gain or failure to estimate or underestimation of pgbp income if pgbp income is earned for the first time one more exception has been introduced called dividend dividend other than deemed dividend under section 2 clause 22 sub clause e. So, if dividend which was never expected and all of a sudden received naturally there will be shortfall in payment of advance tax installment for earlier installments which have already expired by the time dividend was declared. Such shortfall will not attract interest under 234c. Nothing great, it is okay, I mean normal amendment. 234f, 234f this is a fees. 5000 and 10000 for late filing of IT return. What is the due date to file IT return? Financial year applicable to you people is 1st April 2021 till 31st March 2022. This is your financial year. Then comes 1st April 22, the first day of assessment year. Assess is required to file IT return, let us say by 31st October or maybe by 31st July. If he files IT return, small people like me, 31st July audit people and company 31st October. If he files within this date, it is okay. If he files after the due date up to 31st December 2022, up to December of up to 31st December of assessment year, 1st November till December, then fees was going to be 5000 fixed. And in case if file after 31st December, that is file on or after 1st January 2023, Late may late, it could be filed up to 31st March 2023, up to the end of assessment year. Then the fees would be doubled, 10,000. However, amendments have been carried out in section 139.4, belated return. The IT return can now not be filed up to 31st March 23. IT return can be filed up to 31st December 22 only. IT return belatedly can be filed 3 months, maximum 3 months prior to the assessment year ending. Now, since IT return cannot be filed after 31st December 22, cannot be filed only for this period. Therefore, this 10,000 rupees of fees is given a go away. Now, in 234F, fees shall remain only 5,000. Of course, naturally you must have understood now. Of course, needless to say that fees shall not exceed 1,000 rupees if the net income does not exceed 5 lakh rupees. So, that 10,000 is gone now, is removed, only 5,000. But maximum 1000 if NTA does not exceed this. 234G. Now, in chapter 6 a deduction also we will discuss. If you recollect PGBP chapter, PGBP chapter there was one section called scientific R&D deduction, section 35. If you are contributing to scientific research association or to a company which is engaged into biotechnology or manufacturing production etc., then you contributing to them you will get deduction under section 35 and second is ATG, charitable trust and certain institution, associations, funds, university, etc., university, educational institution, hospital, medical institution. These two people here, whosoever is the donee that is recipient of donation for these two sections, recipient of donation for these two sections. Some new conditions were introduced last year that is AY2122. Now postponed, last year they were postponed to the current year uh, because of Corona. Doni, you are the donor. These people are the doni covered by these two sections. They will have to furnish one statement, new rule introduced to avoid any kind of bogus donation. They will have to furnish statement to the prescribed income tax authority, prescribed income tax authority 
and they will also have to furnish one certificate to the donor specifying the donation amount certificate to donor two conditions to be satisfied number one furnish statement covering the details of donations voluntary contributions received by them furnish details to income tax authority and plus second condition furnish certificate to the donor specifying the amount of donation date of receipt etc if these two conditions are not fulfilled statement is not furnished to income tax authority certificate not issued to the donor within the time limit given then punishment defaults will attract various punishment two punishments primarily number one there will be fees under section 234 g which will be 200 rupee per day of default 200 rupee per day plus there will be penalty under section 271 q this penalty under 271 q was also introduced last year but postponed to this year minimum 10,000 rupees minimum 10,000 maximum 1 lakh rupees penalty ranging between 10,000 to 1 lakh rupee will be leviable in addition to this 234 g 234 g is 200 rupee this can be asked by institute in the form of mcq you will have to remember 200 rupee otherwise these two sections are unimportant from exam perspective otherwise reason is that government has not yet specified or clarified the time limit or the due date or the last date to furnish this statement to prescribe income tax authority or the last date for furnishing certificate to the donor therefore it is unimportant from exam perspective however there is a clarification that the fees shall be in addition to penalty and the amount of fees amount of fees shall not exceed the amount for which default has occurred this you need to remember 200 rupee per day agreed but suppose any amount involved in the matter is 10,000 10,000 rupee if it is 10,000 then the fees can be charged up to 50 days 200 rupee per day into 50 days beyond that fees cannot be charged an amount of fees shall be paid before delivering such statement or before issuing certificate 234 h newly introduced this can also come in the form of mcq now if you recollect Aadhaar number section 139 double a 139 AA Aadhaar number subsection 2 government introduced new rule that anybody being individual Aadhaar number can be held only by individuals Aadhaar number person is having permanent account number also and he has got Aadhaar number also then he has to link permanent account number with Aadhaar number linking now linking is not called as linking in technical language in our layman language we say PAN number should be linked with Aadhaar number on or before specified date technical language mein, he has to intimate Assessi will be required being an individual intimate his Aadhaar number to prescribe income tax authority intimate Aadhaar number to income tax authority now this was to be done on or before particular date on or before particular date date has been extended by government number of times the latest date is 31st March 2022 31st March 2022 in case the permanent account number is not linked with Aadhaar number or simply Aadhaar number is not intimated to prescribe income tax authority by this date then last year amendment was made if this is not done then permanent account number will become inoperative it was to become invalid invalid instead of invalid last year amendment was made that permanent account number will become inoperative inoperative and then assess will have to unless and until or till the time assess intimates other number to income tax authority his pan number will not become operative again one more introduced this year new penalty or fees introduced apart from failure for this apart from permanent account number becoming inoperative there will be fees under section 234 h which will be flat rupees 1000 flat rupees 1000 when is this fees payable this fees will be payable it can come in the form of mcq so just remember the amount 1000 rupee will be payable at any time whenever assess wants to use his permanent account number permanent account number has become inoperative so wherever he wants to use it he will have to do this linking and whenever he does linking at that time after 31st march 22 whenever he wants to link that time 1000 rupee will be payable if permanent account number becomes inoperative no then for the purpose of tds 206 double a will become will get triggered and TDS could be at the rate of 20% or the rate applicable whichever is higher so one will have to be very careful 139 double a subsection to 1000 rupee at the time of intimating other number next is investment fund in investment fund very ordinary amendment which is totally unimportant the definition of investment fund up till now investment fund was defined to mean a company body corporate trust or LLP 
ट्रस्ट कंपनी एल एल पी बॉडी कॉर्पोरेट विच हैज बीन ग्रांटेड सर्टिफिकेट ऑफ रजिस्ट्रेशन एज कैटेगरी वन और कैटेगरी टू ऑल्टरनेटिव इन्वेस्टमेंट फंड एंड इट वॉज रेगुलेटेड बाई सेबी ऑल्टरनेटिव रेगुलेशन फंड इन रेगुलेशन सेबी ए आई एफ रेगुलेशन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व नाउ अमेंडमेंट इज मेड दैट रेगुलेटरी बॉडी कुड बी नॉट ओनली सेबी अपार्ट फ्रॉम सेबी आई एफ एस सी ऑथोरिटी इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल सर्विस सेंटर ऑथोरिटी अंडर आई एफ एस सी एक्ट टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन विद इफेक्ट फ्रॉम ए वाई ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी थ्री वुड ऑल्सो बिकम अ रेगुलेटरी बॉडी सो इन्वेस्टमेंट फंड वुड मीन ट्रस्ट कंपनी एल एल पी बॉडी कॉर्पोरेट विच इज रेगुलेटेड बाई सेबी और रेगुलेटेड बाई आई एफ एस सी ऑथोरिटी टोटली अन इम्पॉर्टेंट प्लीज कैंसल दिस मिनिमम ऑल्टरनेट टैक्स चैप्टर टू मेजर अमेंडमेंट्स हैव बीन मेड यू नो पिटी वेल मैट इज नॉट एप्लीकेबल टू फॉरन कंपनीज इफ सर्टन कंडीशन आर फुलफिल्ड वन वन फाइव जे बी सबसेक्शन टू मैट नॉट एप्लीकेबल टू फॉरन कंपनीज इफ सर्टन कंडीशन फुलफिल इफ दो कंडीशन आर नॉट फुलफिल दैन मैट इज एप्लीकेबल टू फॉरन कंपनीज बट इवन दो मैट इज एप्लीकेबल टू फॉरन कंपनीज वाइल कंप्यूटिंग बुक प्रॉफिट फॉर फॉरन कंपनी बुक प्रॉफिट रेट ऑफ मैट इज फिफ्टीन परसेंट यू नो अबाउट इट फिफ्टीन परसेंट ऑफ बुक प्रॉफिट बट इन केस इफ इट इज लोकेटेड इन इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल सर्विस सेंटर यूनिट ऑफ आई एफ एस सी देन रेट विल बी नाइन परसेंट यू नो अबाउट इट राइट सो इफ फॉरन कंपनी वाइल कंप्यूटिंग बुक प्रॉफिट ऑफ फॉरन कंपनी कपल ऑफ इयर्स बैक श्री अरुण जेटली जी लेट अरुण जेटली जी अवर एक्स फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर एट मेड एन अमेंडमेंट दैट वाइल कंप्यूटिंग बुक प्रॉफिट फॉर फॉरन कंपनी सर्टन इनकम्स आर टू बी रिड्यूस certain incomes of foreign company are to be reduced and expenditure pertaining to the same are to be added back if debited to pnl incomes credited to pnl have to be reduced and expenditure pertaining to these incomes incurred for earning these incomes will have to be added back which incomes and which expenditure so income and expenditure those those incomes and expenditure where the rate of tax which are taxable for foreign company at a rate lower than the rate of minimum alternate tax special incomes so which incomes two types of income number 1 capital gain arising from transfer of securities capital gain from transfer of securities not each and every capital gain only on transfer of securities long term short term either of them because they are taxable at less than 15% and second was this was first second was three incomes interest royalty interest royalty and fts fees for technical service apart from interest royalty and fees for technical service which are taxable as per chapter 12 of income tax act interest royalty fees for technical service and capital gain provided these incomes are chargeable to tax at the rate lower than 15% or lower than 9% one more item has been added here is dividend dividend well i am really surprised dividend has been introduced here but dividends are taxable at the rate of 20% see interest may be taxed at 5% royalty is taxable at 10% which is less than rate of mat fts is taxable at 10% which is less than 15% whatever incomes were already covered no even capital gain if it is long term capital gain then taxable at 10% till now it was absolutely fine all these incomes which are to be reduced were all taxable at a rate less than 15% and now the income which is newly added is taxable not at the rate of less than 15% it is taxable at the rate of 20% under section 115 a sub section 1 clause a if you recollect special rate of tax chapter so this does not make any sense however government has introduced it to so you just keep it in your mind so earlier four types of incomes were to be reduced and expenditures pertaining to the same were to be added back now one more income five income capital gain on transfer of security interest royalty fts and now dividend that is the first amendment retrospectively from ay 21 22 remember most of the amendments are from retrospective effect last year onwards if any amendment is applicable from current year it will be highlighted to you okay, this is applicable from current year ha huh. whether i tell you or not tell you it is given in the notes notes are given to you soft copy is here included here in the subscription section you can download it however uh i would suggest that you glance through in the entire video then only come to any conclusion we will discuss once again i'm let me not raise this point right now next is 115 jb subsection 2d now 115 jb this is bit confusing so but understand up till now 115 jb the minimum alternate tax chapter was whatever adjustments were to be made no book profit computation was governed by 115 jb subsection 
explanation 1 to 115 JB subsection 2. There were three subsections introduced 2A, 2B, 2C for those companies which are in AS compliant companies, in AS compliant companies. Now one more has been introduced, one more subsection 2D. The 2D though it is introduced in the same series, it has nothing to do with in AS. It is on a different line. This can be called as relief. Very extremely stupid provision has been introduced. Uh, I don't know what government's intentions are behind it, but government has introduced. Now government says that this is very much similar to relief under section 891. 89.1 was a tax relief available with regards to which you must have studied in inter CA or IPCC. 89.1 relief is with regards to arrears of salary, arrears of salary. Some earlier year salary, arrear, arrear it is called, which pertains to past year, earlier year, but received in the current year. Had it been received in that year, my tax would have been less. Because it is received in the current year, I am paying more tax, then government provides me some relief under section 89.1. On the same lines, this relief is being provided here. So let me explain it to you briefly with the help of an example. Supposingly, this is the story of AY 1819. In AY 1819, the book profit of that year, book profit of that year actually, and assuming rate of MAT was 15% only at that time and not 18%, AY 1819 rate of minimum alternate tax was 18%, 18.5% rather. Now it is. 15%, but let us assume it was 15% that time also. Book profit in that year was negative 200 crore, negative 200 crore. Accordingly, minimum alternate tax payable at the rate of 15%, ignoring surcharge and health and education says, would have been nil. Current year, AY 22-23, AY 22-23 current year's book profit current year's book profit is supposingly 300 crore positive, 300 crore. The mat payable at the rate of 15 percent is 45 crore, 45 crore. Clear about this? Okay. Now what is happening is the position of AY 18-19, AY 22-23. Now what is happening is there is some income which is counted or which is a part of book profit also pertaining to AY 18-19 book profit pertaining to past income, book profit pertaining to past income, past income which is pertaining to past year, pertaining to AY 18-19 but is taxable in the current year or it is includable in the current year income because of, so I am writing it here, past year's book profit, past year's income or past year's book profit includable in the current year, includable or I would say taxable in the current year, taxable in the current year due to any of the two things, due to two things, either due to APA, advance pricing agreement under section 92 double C or due to secondary adjustment under section 92 CE, due to section 92 double C which is APA or due to section 92 CE secondary adjustment. Because of this, past year's income, suppose any past year's income amount is 240 crore. This 240 crore should have been taxed, should have been taxable in AY 1819, but because of section 92 double C or 92 CE, it is getting taxable in the current year. Then this relief is, is given under section 115 JB subsection 2D, read with rule 10 RB, read with rule 10 RB. Well, you will be surprised to know most of the teachers have not covered this particular amendment in the regular notes or in the regular lectures also, but an MCQ, nice MCQ can be drafted. But uh, I do not find this as very important from exam perspective, I do not find it important. What is the reason? I will tell you. Let us first complete this example. So, this past year income is 240 crore. Technically, it pertains to AY 18-19. AY 1819's book profit excluding this 240 crore was negative 200 crore. If this 240 crore was received at that time, if this 240 crore would have been included in AY 1819 itself, then the book profit of that year would have come, come up to 40 crore and accordingly minimum alternate tax at the rate of 15 percent ignoring surcharge and health and education says would have been 6 crore, would have been 6 crore. Do you agree with this? 
the minimum alternate tax for this year AY 1819 at the rate of 15 percent was going to be nil. But provided this 240 crore is not included in AY 1819, if it is included in AY 1819, then the tax was going to be 6 crore. Now this 240 crore is included in the current year because it is taxable in the current year as per section 92 double C or 92 C. If 240 crore is included, the book profit of the current year will become 540 crore. And how much will be the minimum alternate tax on 540 crore? On 300 crore it was 45 crore, on 540 crore it will be 750 plus 6, 75 plus 6, 81 crore, 81 crore. Simply, if you can understand, if this 240 crore was included in that year, then minimum alternate tax liability would have increased from 0 to 6 crore. There would have been an increase of 6 crore. But if the same 240 crore is inclusible in the current year, current year, then my tax liability increases from 45 crore to 81 crore. It increases by 36 crore, 36 crore. Had it been received at that time only, my tax liability would have increased by 6 crore. 6 crore, but since it is received in the current year or it is taxable in the current year because of section 92 double C or CE, the amount taxable is, the tax payable is increasing by 36 crore. So, government says, okay, do not worry, whatever is the extra tax which you are paying because of this 240 crore not getting added in that year, but getting added in the current year, because of that, how much extra tax I am paying? So, if this would have been taxable in AY 1819 only, then 6 crore would have been the tax and if not included in 1819, the tax would have been nil, minimum alternate tax I am talking about. Tax increases by 6 crore. But if it is included in the current year, then tax becomes 81 crore, which would have otherwise been 45 crore, so tax has increased by 36 crore. So extra tax, which should have been 6 crore, instead of 6 crore, extra tax becomes 36 crore. How much is the extra extra tax? Extra extra tax which I am paying is 30 crore. 30 crore will be the amount of relief under section 115 JB subsection 2D. Let us understand this. Same example I have covered in your notes. No need to write anything. Getting this point, if you have understood well and good, not understood, do not worry. If the income of past year is included in the book profit of current year, Income of past year, AY 1819, 240 crore is included in the book profit of current year due to APA under section 92 double C or secondary adjustment, which results in increase in the book profit of current year. From 300 crore, book profit of current year shoots up to 540 crore. Then, on an application made by Assasi, Assasi company in form number 3CE double EA, you do not need to remember form number, AO will recompute the book profit of past year. AO will remove this 240 crore from AY 1819 and AO will recompute the tax payable of the current year in the manner prescribed in rule 10 RB. Rule 10 RB is as follows, this rule no one, no one has covered, even the topmost teacher of the country is also not covered. If you want to understand, this, will, this could help you in article ship or after becoming CA when you go for interview, this can help you. A minus B minus D minus C. This is given by, this formula is given by CBDT. So, do not ask me, sir, why the alphabetical order is deviated, A, B, then C, then D, instead of that, D comes first, C comes later. Do not ask this to me, I have not done it. What is A, what is B? So, A means, so simply, this is A, 6 crore is A, nil is B, A minus B, that will be 6 crore. So, I will use a different color pen to highlight this. This is A, this is B, A minus B, 6 crore. Simply A minus B is nothing but how much extra tax was payable in that year had this 240 crore been included in that year. And then D minus C, this will be D, this will be C, D minus C. That means, how much extra tax I am paying, answer will be 36 crore. How much extra tax I am liable to pay under minimum alternate tax if this 240 crore is included in the current year. So, mat payable on book profit of the current year including income of past year. B is mat payable on the book profit of current year excluding past year income. Including past year income, excluding past year income. D means aggregate mat payable on all the past years 
ऑन बुक प्रॉफिट ऑफ पास्ट ईयर और ईयर्स देर कुड बी मल्टीपल ईयर ऑल्सो इंक्लूडिंग रेलिवेंट पास्ट ईयर इनकम एंड लास्ट सी पॉइंट इज एग्रीगेट मैट पेएबल ऑन द बुक प्रॉफिट ऑफ पास्ट ईयर एक्सक्लूडिंग द रेलिवेंट पास्ट इनकम ऑफ द पास्ट इनकम विच इज नाउ गेटिंग टेक्सीबल फॉर एग्जाम्पल दिस इज सेम एग्जाम्पल विच आई हैव कवर्ड इयर यू कैन हैव अ लुक एट इट सो वॉट एवर एक्स्ट्रा टैक्स दैट आई एम पेइंग थर्टी करोड़ there is 36 minus 6 that will be allowed to me as a relief under section 115 jb subsection 2d and accordingly tax payable will be 36 crore minus extra tax payable will be extra tax payable will be reduced by 30 crore extra tax payable will be 6 crore only so and accordingly tax payable will be 81 crore minus this 30 crore 81 minus 30 the mat payable will be 51 crore however 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 for ay 1819 ao will carry out rectification under section 154 it will recompute the book profit of that year remove this 240 crore add this 240 crore in the current year plus current year's tax will be recomputed by ao after giving effect to rectification so first proviso says this relief uh, sorry before that adjustments required in the past year's book profit will be made by ao under section 154 rectification of mistake now 154 section has got a time limit of 4 years so 4 years will have to be computed not from the end of the year in which order assessment order of ay 1819 was passed but 4 years will be counted from the end of the financial year in which assessee's application for rectification for ay 1819 is received first proviso says that this benefit will not be available if assessee had already claim mat credit pertaining to this relief will be allowed only if assessee has not utilized the mat credit in any subsequent year after ay 1819 second proviso 115 jb subsection 2d shall also apply for ay 2021 and earlier assessment year though it is introduced in the current year but retrospectively from last year ay 21 22 but it is applicable for book profit of earlier years also no interest will be paid on the refund arising to the assessee well all these things are fine we understood the calculation part but what i have failed to understand what i have failed to understand is that how is this possible this is next to impossible in my opinion i have written a letter to cbdt to clarify this i have written letter to taxman people also taxman people had clarified all these things on their website they were boosting that they are the first people to come up and clarify this no then i wrote an email to them at please clarify me further how is this possible reply is still awaited they have not yet clarified so i think taxman people are also confused the fundamental thing is how is this possible under section 92 double c apa and 92 ce secondary adjustment if you recollect excess money to be repatriated back within 90 days to india because of that i have never come across any such situation that as per 92 ce earlier years income is to be removed from that year and included in the current year this never happens this doesn't happen when does this happen how does happens this doesn't happen only what to do that we have understood but when can this happen under 92 double c or c that is not being clarified by government randomly introduce formula given example given okay similar amendment is carried out in amt chapter not similar sorry a different amendment which is again unimportant that amt which is applicable to every person other than companies that is individual hof eop boi form amt provision will not apply shall not apply to specified fund referred to in 104d what is specified fund specified fund under 104d is same as fii the only difference is fii is incorporated and registered outside india and having investors also resident of that country on the other hand government came out with this new concept few years back only that specified fund is exactly same as fii but instead of registering in their own country they will be registering it in india fii is registered outside india specified fund is registered in india both of them have non resident investors who are residents of their respective country an important amendment assessment procedure chapter has got couple of amendments quite a few many amendments are applicable let us understand them okay now starting with amendments pertaining to assessment procedure chapter the assessment procedure chapter most of the amendments are with retrospective effect from ay 2122 the very first is amendment in section 13911 13911 talks about two things the very first section of assessment procedure chapter 
139.1 says who has to file the return and second is what are the due dates to file the return. Due dates to file the return are 31st July of the assessment year for a normal person like you, I mean you and me. Those who are required to get books of accounts audited and our company then 31st October of the assessment year and those who are required to furnish transfer pricing audit report in form 3 CD that is section 92C, 92E then the due date will be 30th November of the assessment year, 31st July, 31st October, 30th November. Now 31st October as far as is concerned if you recollect the language used states that 31st October is applicable for companies those whose books of accounts are required to be audited under 44AB of the Income Tax Act or under any other law and third if firms books of accounts are required to be audited then the due date will be 31st October not only for the firm or LLP but also for the partner of that firm even though partner is not required to get his books of accounts audited in his personal capacity. Similar amendment is carried out for 30th November due date also. This particular thing that firms books of accounts are audited then for firm also 31st October, partner also 31st October. Similar amendment is carried out in 30th November due date that if partnership firm including LLP, if partnership firm is required to get books of accounts audited for transfer pricing and furnish report uh, in form 3 CD then 3 CEB then the due date for firm also will be 30th November and the due date for partner of that firm will also be 30th November that is the first amendment if the firm LLP is required to furnish CA report under section 92E then due date to file IT return will be 30th November this 30th November just like 31st October will be not only for the firm LLP but also for the partner of such firm this is the first amendment keep it in your mind this is slightly an important amendment second amendment if if assessee is individual and is residing in the state of Goa or the union territories of Dadra Nagar Haveli or union territory of Deev and Daman and he is governed by Communiao uh, that is Communiao Dos Bens that is a system of division of property amongst husband and wife under Portuguese civil code 1860 which is governed by section 5A of the income tax act which is not for each and every person it is only for those who are staying or residing in Goa, Dadra Nagar Aveli, Deep Daman and are governed by Portuguese civil code where is it huh? Portuguese civil code 1860 then according to Portuguese civil code the total income of husband and wife other than salary income all other incomes other than salary income of husband and wife will be clubbed together and will be divided equally amongst husband and wife. If this particular rule which is governed by section 5A of the income tax act is applicable to the husband then, then whatever is the due date for husband same will be the due date for spouse and vice versa uh, in the sense wife. If wife is a partner in a partnership firm and firm's books of accounts are required to be audited, firm's books of accounts are required to be audited due date will be 31st October for the firm plus will be that wife as a partner of that firm plus for husband also due date will be 31st October that is the second amendment. If the due date for partner of a firm or LLP is 30th November or 31st October then same will be the due date for the spouse of that partner for firm also it will be the same due date partner of that firm also and now one more thing spouse of that partner provided spouse is governed by section 5A of the income tax act and section 5A of the income tax act which you must have studied a way back at IPCC or inter CA but must have forgotten that it is a system of community of property. System of community of property is prevailing in a state of Goa, union territories of Dadra Nagar Aveli and Deep Daman according to which total income except of salary income is to be apportioned between husband and wife. Okay, this amendment is not so relevant from exam perspective. I do not think so question would be asked based on this amendment is there. Next two amendments are in 139.4 and 139.5 belated return and revised return. The due date to file the, or the last date to file belated return or revised return has been reduced by 3 months. Earlier uh, both these amendments are from last year AY 21-22 retrospectively not only from this year. So up to AY 2021 the IT return could be filed belatedly up to the end of the assessment year or before completion of assessment. Same way revised return could be filed up to the end of assessment year or, or before completion of assessment whichever is earlier. Now the first time limit 
up to the end of assessment year is reduced by 3 months. Now the time limit says the revised return or the belated return can be filed up to 3 months prior to 3 months before the end of assessment year or before completion of assessment whichever is earlier for AY 21, 22 and onwards for IT returns of AY 21, 22 and onwards. Similar amendment is carried out in section 143 1 intimation which is not that important from exam perspective. The time limit to issue intimation based on IT return under 143.1 was 12 months from the end of the financial year in which IT return was filed. Now it shall be 9 months as compared to 1 year from the end of financial year in which return filed. Simply these 3 sections time limit reduced by respect to time limits reduced by 3 months. 143.1 clause A that is primary adjustment. Primary adjustment means without calling assessee on record. Of course after intimating assessee. Assessing officer AO is allowed to make some primary adjustments, some 4-5 types of primary adjustment that is uh, incorrect claim of the assessee can be disallowed, uh, certain rectifications can be made, certain expenditures can be disallowed. Here there are 5 types of disallowances or 5 types of adjustments which AO could make without bringing assessee on record. One of the adjustment was AO could disallow any expenditure, AO could disallow expenditure if that expenditure is indicated disallowance is indicated in the audit report but not taken into account in the IT return. Now apart from disallowance of expenditure indicated in audit report AO can also do this thing AO can increase the income retrospectively from last year's assessment AY 2122 if it is indicated in the audit report but not taken into account in the IT return in the income computation. And the second primary adjustment was AO could disallow some chapter 6 a deductions if IT return was not filed within the due date under 139.1. AO could disallow 6 chapter 6A deductions, 6 of them with 6 ATIA, IAB, IB, IC, ID, IE, 6 of them. However, not only these 6, now AO can disallow chapter 6A deduction under the heading C. AO can disallow some other deductions also apart from these 6. All of these 6 were covered by chapter 6A heading C only, they all were part of heading C. But unfortunately government had covered only 6 of the sections instead of other sections also. So now it will be applicable from A for AT, IA, IAB, IB, IC, ID, IE. Apart from that it will be applicable for AT, IAC also. It will be applicable for ATP also, AT, double J, A also. Disallowance will be attracted for AT, double J, double A also. You know new employees 30 percent, AT, QQB also, AT, RRB also. ATQQB, ATRRB also. These deductions which were not covered earlier can also be made provided IT return is not furnished within the time limit. Okay, this is nothing great. We know about these sections. All these sections we know. We have already studied them in chapter 6. 143.2. Here also scrutiny assessment notice. There was a time limit to serve. Whenever AO wants to pick up the case for scrutiny assessment under 143.3, AO has to serve a notice under 143.2 which had to be served within 6 months from the end of the financial year in which IT return was filed. Instead of 6 months, it shall now be 3 months from the end of the financial year in which IT return filed. IT return was actually filed. So for how many sections the time limit is brought down by 3, three months? 139.4, belated return, 139.5, revised return, 143.1, intimation issuing time limit, 143.2, scrutiny assessment serving time limit, 1, 2, 3, 4. One more item will come, so I am not completing this list. There are 5 sections in which the time limits are reduced by 3 months respectively with effect from, with retrospective effect from AY 2122 will be applicable from last year on. 143D totally unimportant. 143.3D was e-assessment was recently introduced with effect from AY 2021, 2 years back. However, this e-assessment concept 143. 3D is totally being removed and it is replaced by new section 144B which will be called as faceless assessment instead of e-assessment. Okay. However, this particular amendment, this is not the amendment of current year, this is not the amendment of Finance Act 2021. This amendment that is introduction of faceless assessment was already made by TOLA that is taxation and other laws, relaxation and amendment of certain provisions act 2020. Amendment was made last year during Corona, but it is applicable for assessment taking place on or after 1st April 21. So I thought of covering this point here so that you keep it in your mind. This faceless assessment was already discussed last year only. 
last year there are nothing great so in that case i am not repeating it right now it is just i am just reminding you major amendment is carried out in section 147 package section 147 reopening of the case if you recollect it was a package of section 6 section 147 148 whenever ao wants to reopen the case under 147 ao has to issue notice under 148 within the time limit given in 149 subject to some exceptions given in 150 with the approval of higher authority given in section 151 and some miscellaneous provisions given in 152. It is a package of six sections. A major amendment has been made 147, 148, 149 and 151. Four sections out of six sections have been revamped, means totally changed. Well, there is no need to change them entirely, but government, because whatever amendment government wanted to make, they could have easily made them rather than changing the section entirely. However, these four sections out of package of six sections, four sections have been amended. 147 is a reopening section and plus in addition to that one more section has been introduced called section 148A. So now there will be a package of seven sections instead of six sections. So what all are the major major amendments made? One of the major amendment made was in the language which is used, first amendment. What was the language used in 147? So language was whenever AO has a reason to believe, whenever AO has a reason to believe, First, I will explain you manually, brief point, briefly and then we will go in depth. AO had to have a reason to believe that income which is chargeable to tax for any assessment year has escape assessment. AO had to have reason to believe. Now, instead of reason to believe, AO needs to have only information. AO needs to have information that information which suggests, information, AO needs to have information which suggests that income chargeable to tax for any assessment year has escape assessment. Another major amendment made here in 149 section that earlier time limit to reopen was that is time limit to issue notice was 4 years, 6 years and 16 years from the end of the relevant assessment year. Now instead of 4 years, 6 years and 16 years time limit shall be 3 years, 3 years from the end of the assessment year to issue notice to reopen. Now instead of 3 years time limit could be 10 years in some exceptional case where the escaped income is more than 50 lakhs or equal to 50 lakh and it is in the form of asset which we will discuss. So earlier time, this is the major amendment that instead of 4 years, 6 years and 16 years. What was the time limit earlier? 4 years from the end of assessment year. If escaped income was 1 lakh or more than 1 lakh then 6 years. If escaped income was in relation to asset outside India then 16 years. Nothing will be applicable, new time limit by default 3 years very rarely in exceptional cases time limit would be 10 years and 151 which is approval of higher authority here also time here also whose approval is required that is totally been changed totally changed however this section had always been an unimportant section earlier also it was unimportant now also it is unimportant totally changed but though it is totally changed no need to focus upon it and another major amendment made is introduction of section 148a which is called inquiry procedure inquiry so what was happening earlier was that earlier prior to introduction of this new concept earlier ao had to have reason to believe and based on reason to believe ao used to straight away jump upon it ao is to issue notice under 148 and start the reassessment many people based on supreme court decision supreme court decision in some case uh, many people had filed a writ petition to various high court that sir AO has just jump upon some assumption AO has just assumed and in most of the cases SSC used to win the writ petition SSC used to win the case department that is revenue used to lose the case to uh, come out of that particular anomaly government has clarified it that now before issuing the notice under 148 AO will conduct an inquiry under 148A there is a four step procedure given here First, AO will have to have information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escape assessment for any assessment year. Based on information, AO will conduct inquiry plus issue notice to SSE. And now, based on reply of SSE, AO will take a call whether he should proceed further in reopening the case or not, whether he should issue notice under section 148 or not. So, 148A is a new procedure. And another major amendment that has been made is that that earlier, earlier there were four types of assessments if you recollect, which four types of assessment? There used to be 143.3 scrutiny assessment, 
140 for best judgment assessment, then this 147 reopening of the case that is assessment or reassessment of income escaping assessment and the last was 153A and 153C assessment of search cases. Now uh, these two were assessment and reassessment, assessment, reassessment. This was assessment, this was assessment, these two were assessment or reassessment of search cases, assessment, reassessment of income escaping assessment. Concept under 147 and concept under 153A and 153C were more or less the same only. But of the late government realized that now no need to have these two separate sections. Why to have separate sections when the concept is same only? Almost same, hardly any difference. So now government has dropped 153A and 153C stating that if the search is initiated, if search is initiated on or after 1st April 2021, after the date of introduction of this section, search initiated or survey conducted on or after 1st April 21, then compulsorily 153A, B, C, D will not apply, compulsorily case will be covered up under 147. So now, as of today, there are only three sections left out or three types of assessments left out, 143.3, 144 and 147. This time government has made major, major amendments. In upcoming provisions, we will discuss that government has removed income tax settlement commission, then authority for advance ruling also is replaced by board of advance ruling. Settlement commission is totally given a go away, totally removed, no more settling, but new concept is introduced, dispute resolution committee, whereby small, small cases settlement is still possible, similar to ITSC. These things we will discuss, but one of the major amendment in this chapter, in this section is that 153 ABCD is removed. So briefly speaking, I would put it this way, earlier versus now, earlier versus now, before we actually start off with these new sections. Now what has happened is, first of all this new concept was going to be applicable from 1st April 2021. However, it was postponed by issuing some notification to 1st May 2021 and again postponed finally to 1st July 2021. So now the new concept is applicable from 1st July 21. Earlier AO had to only issue notice under section 148, only notice under 148 whenever AO has reason to believe. Now the Initial stage will be divided into two steps. Step number one, AO will have to conduct an inquiry under section 148A, newly introduced section, which is a four step procedure. AO will have to conduct inquiry and then, then thereafter, he will pass order under 148A that it is a fit case to be reopened. Then he will issue notice under 148 and proceed further. Huh. In response to notice, assessee will be required to file fresh IT return. That concept remains the same, that is same. Another amendment is earlier time limit was 4 years, 6 years, 16 years from the end of the assessment year. Now the time limit is only 3 years from the end of the assessment year. Uh, very rarely it will be 10 years from the end of the assessment year if escaped income is 50 lakhs or more than 50 lakh. How we will discuss. And the third major amendment is in the language 147 section starting line was whenever AO has a reason to believe that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment. These wordings are given a go away because many people had challenged it in the court. Reason to believe, assessing officers always used to argue that they are not under any under any legal obligation to prove that on what basis they had a reason to believe. They were not required to answer to anybody, they were not answerable to anybody. That was the opinion. So now the concept is changed. Now AO needs to have information which suggests information which suggests that income chargeable to taxes escape assessment instead of reason to believe. And another major amendment is that assessment of search cases was governed by 153 ABCD, now it will be governed by 147 is the amendment. Achha, this 148A newly introduced section which is to be carried out which is a four step procedure to be followed by AO before issuing notice under 148. So in my opinion instead of 148A they should have numbered it as 147A because this is going to come before 148. So we will not be following chronological order. After 147, we need to jump to 148A and after 148A, we need to come to 148. It goes this way. So first of all, AO needs to have information which suggests that income has escaped assessment. Then it will follow four step procedure. Number one, he has to conduct inquiry from outsiders with the help of uh, other officers. Then issue show cause notice to assessee asking him to show a cause as to why his case should not be reopened why notice should not be issued to him under section 148. 
assessee will give reply ao will have to consider the reply of assessee consider reply and finally pass an order under section 148 148a so under 148a there will be show cause notice also there will be order also two things under 148a order deciding whether it is a fit case to reopen or not a fit case and based on that he will proceed further so now let's jump to the amendment sheet and let's understand i hope you are understanding in case you want to you know take a screenshot of this then i am minimizing it little bit so that you can take a screenshot you may pause the video and do the needful now this one 148a okay now proceeding further so 147 now i'll draw a line here to distinguish it 147 totally revamped with by finance act 2021 but it was going to be applicable from 1st april 21 applicability postponed to 1st may 2021 by tola and now finally postponed to 1st july 21 by issuing notification you need to remember 1st july 21 right okay last few months there have been number of case laws number of writ petition almost 2000 writ petitions were filed by different people against government when the applicability was postponed to 1st july 2021 government did not postpone this entire section from 147 to 152 government postponed applicability of only 147 so there was a lot of misunderstanding lot of chaos and finally government lost the case any which ways 147 in the case of an assessee if any income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment then which will be called as relevant assessment here then ao may assess reassess the income or ao may recompute loss depreciation allowance any other deduction any other allowance for such assessment here. there is no change except of dropping the wordings reason to believe meaning whereby ao may reopen the case by issuing notice under 148 within the time limit given in 149 after conducting inquiry under 148a and subject to provisions of other sections so this is okay now explanation to 147 which was already there in the earlier version also that once the case is reopened for one particular matter one particular matter and during the pendency of proceeding another matter or another income for the same assessment year comes to notice of ao comes to knowledge of ao then that other matter could also be included in the same proceeding without issuing notice under 148 same thing is reproduced now also but with a slight different language earlier only notice was to be issued now notice also is to be issued and 148a inquiry is also to be conducted so now what would be the language in this explanation now now it says once the case is validly reopened by following this step number one step number two inquiry and then notice for particular income for the same assessment year during the course of pendency of 147 if any other income or other matter comes to knowledge of AO then that other matter can be covered up without issuing notice as well as without conducting inquiry or without following procedure under section 148A exactly the same concept so I am reading it out once the case is reopened under 147 on any one particular issue or matter and then during the pendency of the same proceeding some other income or some other issue which has escaped assessment comes to the notice of AO then AO may assess reassess some other income also irrespective of the fact that provisions of section 148A or 148 have not been complied with for such other issue very simple now notice under section 148 we are going in a slight chronological order with effect from 1st July 21 so now whenever AO wants to reopen the case under section 147 on or after 1st july 2021 ao will have to carry out new procedure ao will issue notice under 148 asking assessee to file fresh return of income within the time allowed in the notice and assessee will be required to file the fresh return if assessee does not file the fresh return if he files well and good does not file then best judgment assessment under 147 in the manner provided in 144 section but best judgment assessment will take place under 147 that's okay b point anything which i have highlighted in bold italics that is the technically new amendment that is the amendment on or after 1st july 21 before issuing notice under 148 ao will have to conduct an inquiry under section 148a and pass an order under the same section to the effect that it is a fit case to reopen conduct inquiry pass order that it is a fit case 
Then issue notice under 148 asking SSC to file fresh return. However, once the however, don't forget that we already discussed here in this explanation to 147, stating that once the case is reopened, once 148A procedure is complied with, case is reopened for particular income. Later on, some other income comes to knowledge of AO, then without conducting 148A, 148A will not be required. Without complying with it, AO can proceed further as per explanation to 147. Notices to be issued within the time limit given in 149, that is okay, we know about it. Next, point number D. Now, 148, if you recollect, we discussed that earlier language was AO had to have reason to believe. Now, instead of that, AO has to have information. This was given, reason to believe was given in section 147. Where was it given? It was given in 147. Now, information which suggests that is given in section 148 instead of 147 reshuffling. So, now government has clarified in 148 section that no notice can be issued unless AO has information which suggests that income chargeable tax has escaped assessment or the relevant assessment year in the case of assessing. Nothing great. Instead of section 147, now it is covered in 148. Okay. Now, what do you mean by information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment? So, income information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment means six situations. There are six situations clarified. Earlier, what was the language? Reason to believe. What is reason to believe? That was not clarified. When can we say that AO has a reason to believe? Nothing was clarified. Now, it is clarified that AO will be deemed to be having reason two explanation, explanation 1 and explanation 2 to section 148. Out of 6 situation, 2 situations are covered by explanation 1 and 4 are covered by explanation 2. Which 2 are covered here? Number 1, there is an information flagged about the SSC for the relevant assessment here. As per risk management strategy of severity. As per risk management strategy of severity. What do you mean by information flagged? Where? Where is it being flagged? Flagged means popping up. Flagging means popping up. You know about it. It is a technical language. Uh, you must have studied in some computer related subject. Information must have been flagged in the computer system of department. Depart that okay. This person has particular fishy transaction. Cover his case. Computer will decide. Artificial intelligence will decide that it is a fit case to be reopened. But then after computer's work is over, after computer has selected the case by flagging the information, AO will be conducting manual inquiry or a case where there is a final objection raised by CNAG. What is CNAG? Controller and Auditor General of India, CNAG of India. CNAG has raised final objection that according to them, assessment is not being made for a particular assessment year. Assessment is not made in accordance with the provisions of the act. If CNAG has raised final objection, it would be considered as information which suggests that income chargeable to taxes escape assessment. Or four more situations covered by explanation 2, stating that there is a search conducted in SSC's own case under section 132 or requisition is made under section 132A in case of SSC's own case. Or there is a survey being conducted under section 133A subsection 1 in case of SSC's own case. Search is conducted or survey is conducted in own case, own case or again search, again search, 3 and 4 are also search. But this time search is conducted in somebody else's case and assessee's assets are found from that other person's case. A last situation again on search, search is conducted in any other person's case and assessee's books of accounts documents are found. So, point number 1, 3 and 4 are pertaining to search. Point number 2 is for survey. 1, 3 and 4, what is the difference? When can we say that there is information which suggests that income chargeable to taxes escape assessment? So, if there is a search, 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 search conducted in own case, search conducted in other person's case, search conducted in other person's case. 3 and 4 are practically same only, it is just that government has split them into two parts. That search is conducted in somebody else's case and assets are found. And last, search is conducted in somebody else's case, books of accounts of associate are found. Then it will be believed that AO has reason to believe. You can, if you want to take a screenshot, uh, I have minimized it, you can take a screenshot. Okay, now proceeding further. So, now whatever we discuss, we will read it out directly. I will read it out from here and then we will come back to this shortcut. 
Okay, so point number E explanation 1 and then point number F explanation 2. Explanation 1, 2 situations whereby we can say there is information. Number 1, information is flagged in the system. Information is flagged in the case of assessee for the relevant assessment year in accordance with the risk management strategy formulated by CBDT. You do not need to remember as per risk management strategy of CBDT. You can simply remember information about the assessee is flagged in the system for the relevant assessment year. And number 2, final objection raised by Comptroller and Auditor General CNAG to the effect that assessment in case of assessee for the relevant assessment year is not made in accordance with provisions of the Act. Information flagged in the system of department or CNAG has raised objection. Which are the four situations extra given by explanation to search, survey, search, search. Okay. So, first is search. Search we includes requisition also. Search is conducted under section 132, initiated or books of accounts, documents or assets are requisitioned under section 132A on or after 1st April 21 in the case of assessee's own case, in the case of assessee, in the case of assessee. Or number 2, survey is conducted on or after 1st April 21 in the case of assessi, everything in the case of assessi. Third and fourth search in the case of third party, AO is satisfied that money, bullion, jewelry or valuable article or a thing seized under section 132 or requisition under section 132A in the case of any other person, search conducted in the case of any other person or requisition made in the case of any other person on or after 1st April 21 such money, bullion, jewelry etc. belongs to assessi. And last one again search conducted in somebody else's case. Search in the case of any other person on or after 1st April 21 and those books of accounts documents AO is satisfied that they pertain to assessi or information contained therein relates to the assessi. Okay. Now, but the why, why it is divided into two parts explanation 1, explanation 2, two situations here, four situations here. Why to bifurcate? They could have kept it under one roof only, newly introduced, no. So, they could have easily kept all the six situations together. Answer no, there is a logical reason behind it. In these two situations, these two situations, which are normal situation, here AO will be deemed to be having information, AO will be deemed to be having information for the relevant year only. Information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escape assessment, information for the relevant assessment year only for that particular relevant assessment year only and here these four situation AO will be deemed to be having information not only for the relevant assessment year information for three last three assessment years also last three assessment years immediately preceding the year of immediately preceding the current year immediately preceding the current year. Concept is same only, the only difference is here at a time only one year under explanation 1, information flagged or CNAG final objection, here case can be reopened for one year at a time for that particular year for which information is flagged or final objection is received. It could be two years also, three years also, but practically at a time one year and here explanation 2, search and survey and etc. compulsorily for last three years. AO will be deemed to be having information about income escaping assessment for 3 years combined together immediately preceding current year. Total 4 years, current year plus last 3 years. Coming back here, then in the above 4 cases, search, survey, search, search. Above 4 cases, AO shall be deemed to be having information which suggests that income chargeable to taxes escape assessment in the case of assessee for compulsorily the last 3 years consecutively. Immediately preceding the year in which search is initiated or books of account documents assets are requisition or survey is conducted in the case of assessi as the case may be. Or three years immediately preceding the year in which money, bullion, jewelry, etc. are seized under section 132 or requisition from or in the case of third person when the search was conducted in the premises of third person. Are you clear? So, for these two situation, AO can reopen the case of one year, two year, three year, but here compulsorily three years. Okay. Now 148A. 148A is a four step procedure which I already explained you. I am repeating it again. So first of all, AO needs to have information. First of all, 
that income chargeable to tax as escape assessment based on an information he will follow four step procedure he will conduct inquiry inquiry means inquiry from outsider issue show cause notice from assessee that okay we feel that your case needs to be reopened what do you have to say assessee will have to reply within minimum 7 days maximum 30 days plus extension possible if satisfied if it authorities or ao is satisfied that there was a genuine reason for the delay and then pass an order pass an order in writing under 148a clarifying whether it is a fit case or not show cause notice also under 148a and order also under section 148a only clear about this so i am asking you clear or not it's a one way communication you can't see me except in the video i can't talk to you and i can't hear what you are saying therefore just chill right okay so section 148a now for each and everything out of these four steps inquiry show cause notice reply of assessee consider and pass order under 148a so it says that it should be done very carefully done very carefully so what is it so 148a conducting inquiry before issuance of notice under 148 before issuing notice under 148 before issuing notice on a 148 with the approval of specified authority approval granting authority is not been specified yet if ao before that ao shall conduct an inquiry if required with respect to information which suggests that income chargeable to taxes escape assessment ao will have to conduct an inquiry now what second step do you recollect second step ao will issue show cause notice to assessee by serving show cause notice giving opportunity of being heard assessee will have to reply back within particular time limit minimum 7 days maximum 30 days extension possible okay on the basis of information which suggests that income chargeable to tax as escape assessment in the case of assessee for the relevant assessment year there should be information which suggests that that income chargeable to tax as escape assessment or results of the inquiry conducted under 148a clause a results of inquiry conducted under clause a clause a means this okay after conducting inquiry what will ao do assessee will have to be furnished with a copy of his reply assessee will have to give reply to the show cause notice within the time allowed which can be extended up to 30 days or which can be extended by ao on an application made by assessee 7 days is the minimum time for assessee to reply maximum time is 30 days extension is possible but that's okay i don't think so question would be asked to you then he has to consider the reply of assessee and fourth he has to pass order deciding what is to be done whether it is a fit case to reopen or not on the basis of material available on record and reply of the assessee ao will issue order what is the time limit to issue such order within one month from the end of the month one month from the end of the month in which reply of the assessee received and if no reply received no reply received then within one month from the end of the month in which time limit allowed to assessee expires if assessee is allowed four months time then by the end of fifth month ao will have to proceed further now we have proviso to section 148a proviso says that in three situations there is no need to follow the procedure given in section 148a no need to carry out inquiry straight away notice under 148 straight away case can be reopened which are these three situation three cases it says number one search is conducted in the premises of assessee himself or books of account documents assets are requisition either search under 132 or requisition under 132a in assessee's own case or number two second situation is second and third are on the same line search conducted in the premises of another person but assessee's assets are found or assessee's books of accounts documents are requisition books of account documents here assets so b and c are same only three situation all the three pertaining to search search in the premises of assessee himself and next to a search in the premises of third person but assessee's assets are found or assessee's books of accounts documents are seized or requisition simply out of these six situations first two situations that is information is flagged in the system or objection raised by cnag 148a procedure will have to be followed four situations given in explanation to out of these four situation barring survey in case of survey if survey is conducted under 133a1 
then this procedure under 148A will have to be conducted. Remaining three situations, search in his own case, search in another person's case and assets found, search in another person's case and assets his books of accounts documents found. These three cases no need to follow the procedure laid out in section 148A. So I have clarified it also that unlike explanation 2 to section 148, explanation 2 to 148 means these four situations. Unlike explanation 2 to 148 where AO will be deemed to be having information which suggests that income chargeable to tax has escaped assessment for the last three years immediately preceding the year of search, survey, etc. Where four situations were covered, search in his own case, survey in his own case, search, search in somebody else's case. Here in proviso to 148A only three situations are covered, survey is not covered here. So survey is conducted, I hope you have understood this, survey is conducted then 148A will have to be followed. Now 149 section read with section 151, I am combining both of them, very simple. This we have already discussed, totally revamped, earlier time limit to issue notice was 4 years, 6 years, 16 years, now it shall be 3 years. 3 years time limit from the end of the relevant assessment year, approval of so and so authority will have to be taken. And in case a notice is to be issued beyond 3 years, it can be issued up to 10 years. But up to 10 years notice can be issued only if income chargeable to tax is represented in the form of asset. Condition 1, escaped income should be in the form of asset. And condition number 2, amount of escaped income is likely to be 50 lakhs or more than 50 lakh for such a relevant assessment year. Now this 50 lakh or more for such relevant assessment year, so there is a confusion which government should have clarified whether this limit of 50 lakh is for each assessment year individually beyond last 3 years. Notice can be issued for 10 years, that means 3 years primarily, 7 years extra. So each of these 7 years escaped income should be 50 lakhs or more or for one of the years for which case is to be reopened. Nothing is clarified, but by using the word such relevant assessment year, government is indirectly trying to indicate that 50 lakh is for each assessment year respectively, independently. Then approval of PCCIT, PDGIT, Principal Chief Commissioner, Principal Director General. And if Principal CCIT, Principal DGIT are not available, there is no such PCCIT, PDGIT, then approval of CCIT, DGIT. Of course, I am sure you must have understood approval is not to be remembered from exam perspective. Most important thing to be remembered is two conditions, 50 lakhs or more escaped income for availing 10 years time limit and secondly asset means what? Asset is defined in an inclusive manner, it says asset includes, asset includes four items, immovable property, shares and securities, loans and advances and deposits with banks. Immobile property, shares and securities, loans and advances, deposits in bank. Bank account would mean any bank account, savings, current bank account, recurring deposit, fixed deposit, any. Immobile property would include land, building, land plus building. Now this kind of same language was used in section 153A also. In 153A case could be whenever search is conducted, last 6 years were covered by assessment under 153A, last 6 years. But in addition to last 6 years compulsorily, 4 extra years were allowed. But these 4 extra years, whenever search is conducted, 10 years assessment could be covered by 153A. 4 extra years were possible only if escaped income was in the form of asset and the value of asset had to exceed or equal to 50 lakhs. Here also the same meaning was given. Now 153A does not apply anymore. But here also same meaning of asset was given. Asset would mean any of these 4. Exactly same language was used in 153A. However, at that time, our instituted asked one question on 153A. Similar question can now be asked. Institute stated, according to institute, though it is clearly mentioned here in the act that it is inclusive definition, asset includes 1, 2, 3, 4. Our institute was of the opinion that uh, this kind of definition where 4 particular assets are given, such definition could not have been an inclusive definition, it has to be exclusive definition. Though the word includes is used here, according to our institute, this is an exclusive definition, meaning thereby the meaning of asset cannot be stretched beyond these 4. Asset would mean these 4 and nothing else. This is institute's interpretation which institute applied in one of the past exam questions on 153A. I believe that institute will continue following the same interpretation. You take a call accordingly. Otherwise, in my opinion, it is an inclusive definition. 
but i somewhat agree with institute that this could not have been an inclusive definition if this way government wanted to define then rather government should not have defined the word asset at all we know the meaning of asset asset includes everything each and everything so instituted as this question in this question on 153a instituted at given jewelry if jewelry is given then jewelry is not one of these four assets so according to institute it is an exclusive definition so we will also interpret it that way for exam purpose right okay now proceeding further now this 149 section has couple of provisos proviso 1 2 3 and 4 four provisos are there first proviso is slightly interesting slightly interesting what is it so i'll explain it to you manually understand now earlier time limit to reopen the case was 4 years 6 years and 16 years 4 6 and 16 years we remember this right so now there is a clarification that these new time limits are applicable 3 years time limit and 10 years time limit is applicable from current year ay 20 23 so if case of ay 20 23 is to be reopened no then the time limit would be 3 years and more than 50 lakh equal to 50 lakh then 10 years from the end of assessment year and after ay 20 23 also for upcoming years same time limit ay 23 24 ay 24 25 ay 25 26 all the upcoming years time limit would be same 3 years or 10 years 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 that we have understood now as far as earlier years are concerned which are prior to ay 20 23 that means ay 21 22 2021 19 20 1920 1819 i'm just giving example of these years for all these years what would be the time limit to so new time limit only will be applicable as compared to earlier time limit of 4 years 6 years 16 years but proviso 1 to section 149 understand very carefully it says that for earlier year time limit was supposed to be 3 years and 10 years but for these years for these years earlier years prior to ay 20 to 23 upper limit will not be 10 years upper limit will be restricted to whatever was the old time limit so by default a new time limit will apply 3 years but maximum time limit will not be 10 years maximum time limit will continue to be the earlier maximum time limit of 6 years meaning thereby there is a clarification for any earlier assessment year prior to ay 20 to 23 that means ay 21 22 or any earlier assessment year no notice can be issued no notice under 148 can be issued now if the time limit to issue notice as per earlier provision had already expired given in 149 1 clause b had already expired old time limit was 6 years if 6 years has expired then 10 years a time limit cannot be availed this will be only for earlier assessment year so government has clarified otherwise what would have happened if government would not have carried out this amendment if this proviso was not there then for these years also time limit would have been 3 years and 10 years 3 years and 10 years and if government would have stated that this new time limit will be only for ay 20 to 23 and onwards then for all the earlier years time limit would have been 4 years 6 years 16 years 4 6 or 16 but 4 6 16 will not apply time limit will be 3 and 10 but 3 and 10 subject to old time limit of 6 year okay then 149 second proviso second proviso states that if search was already initiated up to 31st march 2021 then the old provision of 153a and 153c will continue to be applicable if the search was initiated under 132 or books of account documents were requisition under 132a on or before 31st march 21 then notice under 153 a and c was required to be issued this will continue this proviso is not so relevant i am skipping this i hope you have understood this exclusion of time this is also not that relevant stating that while computing this time limit to issue notice under 149 3 years and 10 years while computing this time limit two things to be excluded while computing this time number one time given to the assessee to respond to the show cause notice issued under section 148 a including the extended time what is the time limit given to the assessee time limit given to the assessee time allowed to the assessee is minimum 7 days maximum 30 days can be extended also beyond 30 days upon request of assessee but maximum 30 days the time limit shall be excluded 
so eventually time limit to issue notice will become 3 years and 30 days or 3 years and 7 days as the case may be and secondly the period during which the proceeding under 148A was stayed by injunction order of any court, stay order of any court, nothing great. And then there is a fourth proviso stating that then after exclusion of time given in proviso 3, if the balance time left out with AO to pass order under 148A clause D is less than 7 days, it shall be extended to 7 days. This is again unimportant. Some teachers including me during the class, during the regular lecture, we have discussed this in detail with 2-3 examples. However, that is not needed. Institute has not found it to be relevant at all. So, you can ignore it, don't worry. 153.1, important major amendment carried out. 153 subsection 1 talks about time limit to complete scrutiny assessment under 143.3 or best judgment assessment under 144. The time limit was 12 months from the end of the relevant assessment year. This time limit is reduced by 3 months. Now it is 9 months from the end of the relevant assessment year. This new time limit that is reduced time limit will be applicable not only for AY 20 to 23 and onwards will be applicable retrospectively from AY for assessment of AY 21, 22 and onwards. However, this 3 months reduction is applied only for 143, 3, 144 given in 153, 1. No changes have been made in 153.2 and 153.3. These two places time limit continues to remain 12 months from the end of given year. 153.2 is a time limit to complete 147 reassessment. Where the time limit of 12 months will continue, 12 months from the end of the financial year in which notice under section 148 was served. And 153 was time limit to do fresh assessment based on cancellation of original assessment by higher authority that will continue to be 12 months. So, if you observe, 5 places the time limit is reduced by 3, 3 months. Everywhere it is reduction of 3 months only. Which 5 places? These 5 places. 153, 1 now I am adding. Belated return, revised return, 143, 1 intimation, 143, 2 scrutiny assessment notice and 153, 1 time limit to complete 143, 3. All the 3 places time limits respectively have been reduced by 3 months. You can make a note of this it will be easier for you to remember like this if you jot down all of them, all the five things under one roof. Okay. Now, a fourth proviso to explanation 1 to section 153. Now, before this, I need to take you to settlement commission chapter. Understand, the thing which we are going to discuss is, you know, it's section 153, 153, 1, 2, 3, etc. are the time limit to complete various types of assessment. After 153 is over, there is something called explanation to 153. Explanation to 153 section talks about exclusion of time, time of AO lost in 10 situations to be excluded. Time lost due to stay order of any court, time lost in giving opportunity of being reheard, time lost due to associate approaching settlement commission, time lost due to associate approaching AAR, time lost in giving associate the time to get his books of account specially audited, etc. 10 situations. After explanation is over, there is a proviso. There are 4 proviso. Proviso to section 153 stating that after exclusion of this time given in 10 situation, if the balance time left with AO is less than 60 days, it shall be increased to 60 days. Do you remember? Then there is a proviso 1, proviso 2, 3, 4. One of the provisos talked about second proviso. I think now it is converted to fourth proviso. Now fourth proviso talked about a situation where associate approach settlement commission. Fourth proviso to explanation, explanation to section 153. So, 153, 153, then explanation, explanation mein proviso, fourth proviso. I, before I explain you fourth proviso, let me take you to settlement commission chapter. If you recollect, settlement commission chapter is applicable only when associate applicant approaches settlement commission by way of making an application with 500 rupees of non-refundable fees. However, settlement commission is now abolished with effect from, this is no more there, with effect from 1st February 2021. I just told you sometimes back only. But whatever cases were pending before settlement commission, those who already applied to settlement commission up to 31st January 2021. This is the amendment of current year. Finance Act 2021 has abolished this settlement commission. However, central government has constituted one more authority to deal with the pending cases. 
He was as he had already approached before 1st February 21. His case is pending. Then now his case will be handed over to authority called IBS, Interim Board for Settlement. Interim Board for Settlement. This is introduced by way of introduction of new section, section 245M and 245MA. Now it is being clarified that Assasi is given an option. Assasi's case will be handed over to IBS, but Assasi will have an option, two options. Option to either continue, to continue his application and get it settled by IBS, get it settled by IBS, interim board for settlement, or Assasi may withdraw his application. Withdraw his application latest by 30th June 2021. 30th June 2021 within 3 months from the beginning of the current year. If SSC withdraws his application from IBS that I do not trust, I do not rely on IBS, I want to withdraw myself. Then in such situation, SSC may want to withdraw. Why? That is a different thing, different story, but if he withdraw, if he withdraws, then if you recollect, SSC could approach settlement commission only and only his case was pending before AO by way of assessment, reassessment, etc. SSC could apply to settlement commission only when his case was pending before AO as on the date of applying to settlement commission plus additional tax was more than 10 lakh, search case then additional tax had to exceed 50 lakh rupees, assessment had to be pending etc. Some conditions were there. In case if SSC withdraws his application from IBS or uh, does not want to continue then his case will be sent to his AO. His pending case will be sent to his AO before whom it was pending before SSC approached settlement commission. Pending case will be will come back to AO. Now time of AO lost, AO will complete the assessment whatever was pending before him, AO will complete that within a time limit of one year and there is a clarification that time of AO lost starting with the date on which SSC made application to settlement commission and ending on the date on which SSC withdrew his application. Starting with the date on which SSC made application to settlement commission, ending with the date on which SSC withdraws his application. This much time of AO lost shall be excluded and after exclusion if the time left with AO is less than one year, it shall be increased to one year. This I do not think so question can come on this, but let us read this. Fourth proviso to explanation, 1st February 21, settlement commission is abolished now, so and so, so and so. Okay. After exclusion of this time limit mentioned in first proviso to 245M, if the time left with AO to complete assessment reassessment is less than one year, it shall be increased to one year. Well, what time is to be excluded that we already discussed. Last in assessment procedure 153 ABCD shall no more apply for search initiated on or after 1st April 2021, not search concluded on or after 1st April 21. If search is initiated on or after 1st April 21, then the matter will no more be governed by 153 ABCD because the matter will now be covered by section 147. This we already discussed. With that assessment procedure related amendments are over. Next is settlement commission only what we just discussed. So now settlement commission story is this, this way. Uh, the SSC could approach settlement commission only if some conditions were fulfilled. One of the condition was that additional tax in this case had to exceed including surcharge and health and education says, but excluding interest and penalty, additional tax had to exceed 10 lakh. If it was a case of search assessment, then additional tax had to exceed 50 lakh. Then he could approach settlement commission. This means clearly that settlement is possible only in big case. Big case. Small people, settlement was not possible. This was something wrong. Another thing which was wrong happening here is, even if SSC was caught red-handed as a result of search, even if search was conducted, then also SSC was allowed to approach settlement commission, which was again wrong. So what government did, new government, as compared to these provisions incorporated by Congress government in past, new government abolished all these things, new government removed this authority totally, announcing it on the date of budget itself, 1st February 21. And now there is a clarification, new authority IBS is set up, which comprises of two members, and these two members shall be not below the rank of not below the rank of CCIT, not less than CCIT level, okay. And IBS will be set up at various places wherever government wants to and generally at three, three or four places they are going to set up. 
ओके ना आई बी एस विल बी हैंडलिंग द पेंडिंग केसेस ऑल पेंडिंग एप्लीकेशन विल बी हैंडल्ड ओवर टू आई बी एस एंड आई बी एस विल हैंडल दिस अनदर थिंग नाउ आफ्टर अबोलिशिंग सेटलमेंट कमीशन गवर्नमेंट इज इंट्रोड्यूस समथिंग कॉल डी आर सी डिस्प्यूट रेजोल्यूशन कमिटी विच वी विल डिस्कस आफ्टर फिनिशिंग सेटलमेंट कमीशन वट आर दी प्रोविजन इन द होल चैप्टर ऑफ सेटलमेंट कमीशन विच इज चैप्टर नाइनटीन ए वेर एवर देर इज सेटलमेंट कमीशन इट शेल बी रिप्लेस बाई आई बी एस no more application can be made to settlement commission on or after 1st february 21 settlement commission shall cease to operate from 1st february 21 pending applications will be handed over to interim board for settlement set up by government central government shall constitute whole chapter 19a wherever the word settlement commission is used it shall be substituted by interim board of settlement sorry not two members three members and each member shall shall be of ccit rank Six point is the only point which you need to remember from exam perspective. If you can, if there is a, if the members of IBS differ in opinion on any point, then the decision will be taken according to the opinion of majority of them. What do you mean by pending application? Pending application means application already filed on or before thirty first January twenty one, which is neither finalized, no final order is passed on that application, and it has not even been rejected. It has not even been declared invalid. neither been declared invalid under 245 d2c nor has any final order been passed thereon that will be pending i don't think so question will be asked on this assessee will be given two options either he can continue with ibs and get it settled or he can withdraw if he withdraws he has to withdraw within 3 months from 1st april 21 3 months from the beginning of commencement of finance act 21 that means latest by 30th june 2021 correct then uh in case assessee withdraws his application then the matter will be handed over to ao or income tax authority before whom assessment reassessment was pending before making application to settlement commission uh, and assessee will have to inform ao that i have withdrawn my application and then provisions of the act will apply as if no application was made to settlement commission ever 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 okay and then ao will do the needful okay now 11 point 11 point it says that if assessee withdraws his application and the matter is handed over to the local ao wherever it was pending then that assessing officer will complete the assessment or reassessment whatever was pending as per normal provisions of the act but ao will not be allowed to make use of any material any evidence any record any inquiry conducted by settlement commission or furnished by assessee to settlement commission while disposing of the case ao shall not be entitled to use any material information or evidence produced by assessee before settlement commission however third proviso states that if such material was already available with ao that material was available with settlement commission also but it was available with ao also then this restriction will not apply then ao will be allowed to use that material i don't think so question would be asked on this but just keep it in your mind it can help you in real life If the application is not withdrawn within the time limit of 30th June 21, then the matter will be deemed to have been received by IBS on the date on which application is allotted to IBS by CBDT. IBS interim board of settlement will be constituted by central government, but it will be handled by CBDT. Okay, uh, then nothing else. Then, uh, ha, this particular point: if final order was already passed by settlement commission before 1st February. but rectification time limit has not yet expired what is the time limit to rectify by settlement commission if you recall eh? settlement commission could rectify within 6 months from the end of the month in which order was passed by settlement commission so final order is already passed nothing is pending as on 1st february 21 but if there is any mistake found in the order then it could be rectified but then settlement commission is no more there so it has been clarified that mistakes will now be rectified by ibs ibs will rectify and accordingly time limit will be decided a uh, time limit available to pcit cit or time limit available to applicant to apply or time available to ibs to amend the order of settlement commission if it is less than 60 days it shall be increased to 60 days uh not that great but just keep this point in your mind i'm not cancelling removing the cancellation no? just keep this particular point in mind uh the time limit to withdraw the application 30th june 21 and uh, if order is already passed by settlement commission it can be rectified by ibs 
then faceless proceedings are introduced before IBS. But this IBS is not going to survive for a longer period. Once whatever pending cases were are settled by IBS, matter will come to an end. IBS will be shut down. IBS is not going to last perpetually. Faceless proceeding 3 subsection 245C 11, 12 and 13. This is same as what we discussed in other chapters. Everywhere faceless proceedings are introduced. Central government will make a scheme by issuing notification in the official gazette to impart to impart greater efficiency, transparency and accountability, ETA, efficiency, transparency, accountability by doing three things, by eliminating interface between the IBS and ASSE, eliminating interface, secondly by optimizing the utilization of resources through economies of scale and functional resources, functional specialization and team based dynamic jurisdiction will be allowed. For this purpose, central government by issuing notification, central government may clarify that particular provision of the act will not apply or will apply with such modifications, specifications, adaptation as may be given in the notification. No notification shall be issued or no direction shall be issued after 31st March 23 and every such notification direction shall be laid before each house of parliament, lower house, upper house, Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha. This is not to be done again, faceless proceeding nonsense question will not be asked to you. Next is dispute resolution committee. As I told you that settlement was possible only in big cases, big cases additional tax had to exceed 10 lakh 50 lakh. Small people were deprived of this benefit. So now government has introduced this benefit for small people. Instead of settlement commission, government has set up dispute resolution committee. Remember what we had studied in transfer pricing chapter was dispute resolution panel governed by dispute resolution panel DRP section 144C. However, dispute resolution panel is different, dispute resolution committee is different. Settlement commission was chapter 19A, 19A, this will be governed by a new chapter is introduced chapter 19AA. Very simple chapter it is, only some conditions to be remembered, who can apply to dispute resolution committee. So, small people can apply. Here condition is that if you want to, anybody can apply, individual HOF, AOP, BOI, company firm, LLP, resident, non-resident, ROR, RNO, anybody can apply. Only if first condition variations in the order proposed by AO, variation proposed by AO, amount of variation proposed by AO should not exceed 10 lakh rupees, should not be 10 lakh, more than 10 lakh. Secondly, the net taxable income shown in the IT return, if IT return is filed, then net income should not have exceeded 50 lakh rupees. Variation proposed by AO does not exceed 10 lakh rupees and NTI does not exceed 50 lakh rupees. These are the two fundamental conditions anybody can apply. Simply if you can observe, settlement commission was for big cases and this DRC is for small cases. This is for small cases for people like me, small cases. Ha, the only thing is most important thing are these two conditions which you need to remember, MCQ can be asked to you. Then there is one more thing, prohibition, who cannot apply, who can apply and who cannot apply. Any person who fulfills these two conditions can apply and any person who does not fulfill following condition or any person covered by following list cannot apply. Who cannot apply? So, there is a list. So, simply those people who are convicted guilty of offense under other acts including income tax act, those who are found guilty under Benami Properties Act, uh, FERA, FEMA. Kofi Posa, Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, NDPSA, then Money Laundering Act, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, those people who are found guilty under any other act relating to all these things, all other fiscal law, those people cannot apply. So, technically chapter gets over in three points. Section number is section 245 MA, only one section is there governing the whole chapter. Chapter 19 double A, section 245 MA three points to be understood. So, DRC has been introduced with effect from AY2122 retrospectively. The moment settlement commission was abolished, this authority was constituted as a substitute for settlement commission, but for small cases, only for small cases. I would not call them as small cases, medium level cases. Central government will constitute one or more DRC and will be available to persons who fulfill specified condition. So, it should be specified order who can apply, who cannot apply, three things. Specified order means the one where aggregate sum of variation. Variation means 
additions made by AO in the income. Variations made or proposed to be made in such order does not exceed 10 lakh. First of all, there is a clarification that order includes draft order also. So, it could be even if it is draft assessment order, then also based on draft order, assessee need not wait till the final order, draft order, provided variations do not exceed 10 lakh. And such order is not based on search or survey or information received under DTAA. It should not be based. This was one of the main thing which government wanted because previously, long back, settlement was not possible for search cases. If you are caught red handed, then you have to be punished. You cannot be granted settlement. That was the original concept. But in between, Congress government changed the provision and they allowed those people also to apply for settlement, those who were caught red handed during search or those people whose information was received under DTAA, which was totally wrong, which was totally wrong. So, this political action was taken number of years back to provide facility to some corrupt people. However, unfortunately, those days are gone now. India is improving. And secondly, if IT return has been filed, then the total income as per IT return does not exceed 50 lakh. If IT return is not filed, then no worries. Then variation should not exceed 10 lakh. IT return is filed, then net income should not exceed 50 lakhs. Any person can apply, but who cannot apply, the following people cannot apply. Number one, person who is found guilty, person against whom detention order is passed under COFE POSA, that is Conservation of Foreign Exchange and Prevention of Smuggling Activities, COFE POSA 1974. Person who has been convicted guilty of an offense under Indian Penal Code, IPC, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UPA, UAPA, Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act, NDPSA, Prohibition of Benami Properties Act, Prevention of Corruption Act, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, PMLA, person in respect of whom prosecution proceedings are initiated by Income Tax Authority under Income Tax Act or under Indian Penal Code for any civil liability, person who has been notified under Section 3 of Special Court, trial of offences and so and so. I don't think so you will be able to remember anything. But simply in one line remember that person who has been held guilty or convicted means proved guilty under other financial law. Everything is financial law only. Prevention of Corruption Act, Money Laundering Act, all of them are financial law. Except of this narcotic drugs, NDPSA, this is not financial law. Barring that everything is some or the other financial law. Powers of DRC, so DRC will have exactly same powers which Settlement Commission had. That is granting immunity from prosecution and granting immunity from penalty. They cannot reduce the tax liability, reduce a wave of penalty and grant immunity from prosecution for an offence under in Income Tax Act. That is it, exactly same as what Settlement Commission had. 245 MA 3, 4 and 5 faceless proceeding before DRC. Everything is same as what we discussed for Settlement Commission faceless proceeding before IBS. Okay, this is not to be done again, faceless proceeding. If you want to read, it is same as what we study in each and every chapter. Now, major similar to this, another amendment is made in Authority for Advanced Ruling Chapter AAR, where AAR is now abolished. Now, what was happening was, this Authority for Advanced Ruling AAR was there in Income Tax Act also. It was there in Income Tax Act also. It was there in GST also. It is there in GST. But under Income Tax Act, Authority for Advanced Ruling is was located only at one place, Delhi, under Income Tax Act. Then government expanded the scope. They set up one more center for AAR at Delhi only, two places at Delhi and one place at Mumbai, Air India building. AAR is located under Income Tax Act at three places and it was a single AAR for the whole country. Whereas under GST, the AAR, Authority for Advanced Ruling, is available state-wise. And under Income Tax Act, it is only one, only one AAR for the whole country and here state-wise. That was one problem. Second problem was ruling pronounced by AAR under Income Tax Act was not appealable, no, not challengeable, not appealable. It is binding. It was binding. But under GST, it was appealable. You know about it. It was appealable, nay, I would say it is appealable. So now government has changed the provision. Under GST, it will continue to be called as AAR, Authority for Advanced Ruling. Under Income Tax, it will no more be called as AAR. Instead of AAR, from the appointed date, it will be called as Board for Advanced Ruling, BAR. Name has been changed. That is the first amendment. This amendment will take place on or after 1st September 21. 
settlement commission is abolished from 1st february 21 this is after 7 months 1st september 21 but settlement commission is totally closed down shut down aar is not shut down name is change bar board for advance ruling and this particular point that the order or the ruling pronounced by aar would be binding would not be appealable that is also given a go away now the ruling pronounced by bar will be appealable but appealable directly to high court ruling of bar or order passed by bar will be appealable appealable where appealable directly to high court directly to high court within what time limit normally time limit to file acha why high court first of all understand normally cit appeal itat high court supreme court we have four authority ar ruling instead of that now will be bar ruling pronounced by bar now bar is at par with itat cit appeal itat high court supreme court bar is at par which ar was also at par with itat same level so order passed by bar cannot be appealed before cit appeal because it's a lower authority cannot be appealed before itat also equivalent authority therefore compulsorily high court even in gst also it's like this but normally the time limit to appeal to high court is 120 days instead of 120 days here the time limit is 60 days 60 days from the date of receipt of copy of ruling of bar extension possible extension possible by 30 more days if high court is satisfied that there was a reasonable cause for the delay these are the primary amendment and everywhere in the whole chapter wherever aar is used it shall be replaced by bar in this chapter also and in other chapters also so one of the major amendment is that order passed by bar will be appealable and no more be binding that is the amendment and uh, one more amendment is that earlier which is unimportant that earlier authority for advance ruling under income tax act had the power to regulate its own procedure had the power to regulate its own procedure now that power is taken away it cannot regulate its own procedure everything will be controlled by central government so authority for advance ruling chapter is to be done or not the answer yes you will have to do this chapter because up to up to 31st august 2021 this chapter is for the current year it is still applicable and for the remaining half of the year 1st september 21 and onwards this chapter will be applicable bar with the same provisions except of one or two minute changes right so you will have to for the current year may 22 and november 22 attempt you will have to do both the chapters there is nothing great it's not that you you are put to any prejudicial condition there is no extra hard work required only two three extra points to be understood that's it so now let's understand what changes are made ar shall cease to operate from appointed date appointed date is announced by notification to be 1st september 21 provision a uh, new section is introduced 245 dash ob 245 dash ob why do we put the dash you know about it okay not for each and every section only for some select ones which i had explained you in my first lecture in the regular course central government shall constitute one or more board for advance ruling bar as may be necessary so they have set up three bar just like aar two at delhi one at mumbai even aar was also at the same place simply aar staff will be appointed as bar staff bar 1 bar 2 and bar 3 these are the numbering system given to them 245 ob bar shall consist of two member ibs shall comprise of three members here it shall comprise of two members nominated by cbrt and each of them shall be of not below the rank of cci okay so uh, simply i would say we discussed ibs we discussed uh, drc and now we are going to discuss bar bar shall comprise of two members ccit level ibs shall comprise of three members here also they should be of the level of ccit not below that for drc there is no clarification government has not clarified who all will be there in drc how many members will be there who will decide what are their powers nothing is clarified ah powers are clarified but what are their qualifications they should be ccit level irs officer ias officer ips nothing is clarified okay but this point is not so relevant from example you you can skip this further 245p 245r8 245t 245u all the four places ar shall be substituted by bar nothing great 245q subsection 
all those pending applications which were pending before AAR shall be transferred to BAR. In settlement commission chapter, when the pending applications are transferred to IBS, RCC applicant has an option to withdraw or to continue. Here no such option is given because it does not change the position, does not alter the position. Along with relevant records, documents, materials, everything will be handed over to BAR. Well, they are saying everything will be handed over to BAR. In my opinion, AAR and BAR are one and the same only. What changes are made? Changes are hardly visible. Okay, faceless proceeding for giving advance ruling by bar. Faceless proceeding not to be done again. Everything is same. Central government by issuing notification will make a scheme for imparting greater efficiency, transparency, accountability by doing three things. Number one, by eliminating interface between SSE and uh, BAR then uh, optimizing the utilization of resources by way of uh, functional specialization and economies of scale and third introducing dynamic jurisdiction and for this purpose central government may issue notification clarifying or direction clarifying that some provisions of the act shall not apply and some provisions of the act shall apply with modifications no such notification direction after 31st march 23 and every such notification shall be laid before each house of parliament not to be done again 245 S, this is important, this is important, institute has kept one question on AAR in RTP of May 22, which we will be discussing. But in that question, institute has clarified, institute has asked the question, what if AAR already pronounced ruling before 31st August 21 and what if ruling is pronounced on or after 1st September 21. If ruling is pronounced before 31st August. 2021 on or before 31st August 21 it would be pronounced by AAR if it is pronounced on or after 1st September 21 it will be pronounced by bar if it is ruling is pronounced by AAR then binding it is binding on applicant binding on the transaction and binding on commissioner and subordinate authority if the ruling is pronounced by bar then it is appealable directly to high court within 60 days you need to remember this which was an important point so coming back here, binding nature 245S, 245S shall no more apply, nothing containing 245S shall apply on or after 1st September 21, which stated that the ruling will be binding on applicant, transaction, CIT and all income tax authorities subordinate to CIT, cannot be appealable. So now it can be appealable, will no more be binding. Power to regulate its own procedure, this section is deleted, now it cannot regulate its own procedure, bar procedure of BAR will be regulated by central government. 245W is a new section introduced which entitles applicant as well as AO to file appeal to high court. High court. Who can file appeal? Applicant also, AO also. Applicant can file appeal if he is aggrieved, aggrieved by the order passed by ruling pronounced by bar and AO can apply to high court only if directed to do so by CIT, PCIT. Within a time limit of 60 days, extension of 30 days possible, nothing beyond that that you need to remember, time limit you will have to remember, this is an important point. In fact, this entire section is important, you will have to remember. Okay, And then scheme for appealing to high court by AO. If AO is filing appeal to high court against the order of BAR, then faceless proceeding is introduced. If ASAC wants to file appeal, who can file? Two types of people can file appeal, applicant as well as AO. AO files then faceless proceeding, ASAC files then physical proceeding and uh, so these three are faceless proceeding so I am cancelling them. However, faceless is possible here only when AO is applying. Appeals and revision chapter again nonsense provision this is totally unimportant faceless appeal to ITAT. Now faceless appeal to ITAT was already introduced by way of 253.8 and 253.9 recently by taxation and other laws amendment act and relaxation act TOLA recently. However, 253.8 and 253.9 were applicable only when appeal is filed to ITAT, appeal is by AO, appeal by AO then faceless. ASAC files appeal then no clarification that means physical, physical. Just the way we discussed for appeal to high court against ruling pronounced by bar, if AO wants to file appeal then only faceless proceeding. Same way for ITAT also it was already like that, that AO wants to file appeal then faceless, ASAC wants to file appeal then physical. However, that has been changed now. So, 255 subsection 7 and 8 are introduced, faceless appeal to ITAT by anybody, whether AO, earlier it was introduced by TOLA, but that was only when AO files appeal. 
now 255 subsection 7 8 and 255 subsection 9 stating that anybody who files three things central government will make a scheme for eliminating interface optimizing utilization of resources introducing dynamic jurisdiction central government will issue notification and clarify no such direction after 31st march 23 and shall be laid before each house of parliament same provisions not to be done again by you clear okay now we have assessment of public charitable trust or institution a couple of amendments made here some of the amendments are being announced by finance act 21 and some amendments especially section 12 ab was introduced last year but is postponed to the current year ay 22 23 which was already covered in the last year's notes and the last year's lectures still i'll be repeating it briefly section 12 ab but before that whatever amendments are introduced by finance act 21 that we will discuss first first one is 11 subsection 1 clause d corpus donation now corpus donation is basically capital received and corpus donations were not taxable were not considered as income as per section 11 subsection 1 clause d and accordingly corpus were not taxable again corpus is still not taxable even today also however one condition has been introduced for claiming exemption on corpus that corpus will not be an income will not be an income means will be exempt will be capital received only and only if it is invested or deposited in one or more of the specified modes of investments specified under section 11 subsection 5 11 subsection 5 has got 14 specified modes if you recollect chapter however this is going to create lot of litigations this is going to become a litigative issue nice idea but then government needs some further clarification they can't just simply wrap it up saying that corpus will not be income only if invested in specified modes reason is that what is corpus donation corpus donation is basically a capital received donation received with a specific direction from the donor that i am donating for this particular purpose suppose if somebody i am running a trust and somebody donates to my educational trust somebody donates me 10 lakh rupees corpus stating that with this 10 lakh rupees please purchase desktop computers and laptops for your students i received corpus without investing in specified modes what if i directly purchase computers i received the corpus donation new provision says that i need to invest it in specified modes uti units etc but without investing i directly spend then what that is one thing secondly so it is going to create litigation i already spent it for the purpose for which it was received i have complied with all the conditions all the law but i have not invested in specified modes another alternate view is that that investment in any kind of deposits savings account deposit also with a scheduled bank or post office bank is also considered as one of the specified modes of investment so if corpus is directly received in my bank account I have already automatically invested in specified modes of investment. What about that situation? Government really needs to clarify all these things. So provisions incorporated are not sufficient enough. Nirmala Sita Ramanji, this is becoming a trend for her that every now and then most of the amendments require further clarification. Any which ways, assessing officers may not understand what we understand. Explanation 5 to section 11 1. Any which way, so point A is an important one from exam perspective, corpus will be exempt or will not be regarded as income only if invested. Explanation 5 to 11 1, deficit of earlier year. Deficit of earlier year brought forward, that is excess application of income over and above the income. Excess of application over and above income in the past years, which is called deficit. It was allowed excess application of income of the preceding year this was considered in the current year as application of 85 percent of income and was allowed to be deducted and no tax was payable however this will no more be considered as application of income towards approved object and accordingly benefit will be lost this is also an important point well let's try to understand what is it institute has asked the question on this particular point in rtp of may 22 even on corpus also they've asked the question small small question let us understand suppose any this is one charitable trust abc last year story of last year was that last year's income was 100 lakhs and out of 100 lakhs 15 percent is automatically exempt balance 85 percent that is 85 lakh is required to be applied towards approved object so was any amount applied is 105 lakhs restricted to 85 lakh taxable income thus would be nil but there would be deficit amount applied over and above this income 
5 lakh will be deficit. Deficit will not be 20 lakhs, huh? deficit will be 5 lakh. So, this was the story of last year, 5 lakh of deficit created. This year, what was going to happen if this amendment was not made? Income of this year is suppose any 200 lakhs. 15 percent of 200 lakh, 30 lakhs is allowed as an automatic application. 170 lakhs is left out. From this 175 lakh, this brought forward deficit of last year, 5 lakh was allowed to be subtracted. And the amount required to be applied towards approved object was only 165. As per amendment, this 5 lakh will no more be allowed and the amount required to be applied towards approved object will be 170. In our example, deficit is only 5 lakh. Now, this is also going to create problem. You know, what problem? Government has not imagined what will happen to this. So, now what will happen? Now onwards, if my income is 100, 15 is exempt, 85 I am required to apply. I will not apply more than 85. Suppose I am a charitable trust, I have already spent 85 lakhs, 85 is already spent. I still have 15 lakhs in my pocket, somebody approaches me, some needy person approaches me asking for some money, I will refuse, bluntly refuse. I will say come next year, my this year's quota is already over. This is what is going to happen. Any which way government needs to reconsider this. So, deficit of earlier year which is called excess of application of income over and above the income will no more be allowed to be carried forward or simply it will lapse. Important point. Next, Proviso to 11 subsection 7. Now, what had happened was, if you recollect few years back, government introduced this 11 subsection 7. 11 subsection 7 stated that, that once you are a trust registered, once you are a trust registered under section, registered under section 12A, 12AA, etc. Now, 12AB also. Then, as a trust, you can claim exemption under section 11. You cannot claim other exemptions. Exemption under section 11 allowed. Other exemptions will not be allowed. But the government said, okay, fine. Apart from section 11, we will allow you to claim section 10.1 agricultural income, 10.23c for educational institution, hospital, medical institution, and we will allow you to claim 10.46. Other exemption other than these three cannot be claimed. Apart from section 11, once you are registered, you can claim three more under section 10. 10 1 agricultural income, 10 23 C, 10 46. This was the amendment made few years back by introducing 11 subsection 7. Earlier, people were claiming section 11 also and other exemptions also, people were claiming everything. The government says you are a special entity, you are a trust, you can't claim everything. You can claim only by spending 85%. Now, in this 11 subsection 7, government has surprisingly introduced this proviso, first proviso and second proviso, two provisos are introduced, putting restriction on this. Now, it says section 11 you are registered under 12A, 12AA, section 11 you are claiming, so you can't claim 1023C and 1046, these two will no more be allowed, only 101 will be allowed. How government has done this? The government said that once you are registered under section 12A, 12AA or under new section 12AB and after registration you apply for approval under section 1023C for school, college, hospital, medical institution, education institution or you apply for approval under 1046. If this is, you are already registered under 12A, 12AA entitling you to claim exemption under section 11. But after being registered under 12A, 12AA, 12AB, if you take approval under 1023C or this, 1023C and 1046 both combined together not possible, eh? any one of them would be possible. So, it is basically this versus these two. If you are registered here and you go for this registration or approval also, then this registration under this chapter will become inoperative, will become inoperative. Meaning thereby, government says if you are claiming, you are trying to claim under both, then this will be given priority or this approval will continue. This approval under 12A, 12AA, 12AB will become inoperative. Means you will not be eligible to claim section 11. But now if you realize that you want to claim under section 11, then you apply for re-registration. Re-register yourself, apply for registration once again. And once you re-register, once you re-register yourself, then these two, either of them, whatever you had applied for 1023C and 1046, either of them, they will become, they will cease to operate. These two registration will cease. Meaning thereby government says either you can claim this or this. Also meaning thereby, apart from section 11, you can claim maximum trust can claim 101, 
no other exemption can be claimed. Apart from this, 1023C was allowed, 1046 was also allowed. Rather than disallowing them, government has disallowed it this way. Let us try to understand. So, there are two provisos. Proviso 1, registration under 12A, 12AA, 12AB shall become inoperative. This registration will become inoperative from the date on which trust or institution is approved under 1023C or 1046. In case already approved last year or prior to that, then this 12A, 12AA, 12AB registration will become inoperative from the date on which this proviso to 11.7 has come into force. That means from 1st April 21 either from the date of approval under 1023C1046 or from the date of introduction of this proviso whichever is whichever is later. Means after registering under 12A, 12AA, 12AB if you take approval under 1023C in future then from that future date this registration will become inoperative and you are already registered under both of them which was allowed up till last year. You are already registered under 1023C also and section 12A, 12AA also. Then this registration under 12A, 12AA, 12AB will cease to operate, will become inoperative. However, meaning thereby, in other words, at any given point of time, trust or institution can either claim exemption under section 11 plus 10.1 or can claim 1023C or 1046, but not both. Simple language. However, this registration has become inoperative as we discussed. If the registration has become inoperative, as per the first proviso, trust can once again apply to get itself registered or its registration operative. In such case, approval under 1023C or notification under 1046 will cease to have effect. So either you come here or go there. If you are going there, this will you can't come here and if you want to come here, surrender this or this will automatically cease to apply. And simply you can't claim both, that is one. Okay, so this particular 11 subsection 7, 2 proviso, I do not think so are relevant from exam point of view, but you just need to keep in mind that trust can now claim apart from section 11, it can claim only 10, 1. Proviso to explanation 4 clause 1, explanation 4 clause 1 and explanation 4 clause 2, 4, 1, 4, 2, newly introduced, both are on the same lines, but slightly on different thing. If you recollect, First point that we discussed was about corpus. Corpus will not be income provided, invested or deposited in specified modes of investment. Now, out of corpus, if you are spending money or spending it for application of income, application, then it will not be regarded as application of income. Understand, application of income for charitable or religious purposes out of corpus, spending money for approved objects, spending money for religious or charitable purposes out of corpus donation will be considered as an application of 85 percent of income not in the year of spending that money because you are spending out of corpus it will be regarded as application in the year in which such amount is redeposited back or invested back into specified modes of investment which are specifically maintained for such corpus meaning thereby year one i am receiving corpus donation so, as per 111D, in order to not offer it to tax, in order to save tax, year 1 I am receiving corpus, same year I am depositing in specified modes of investment. Now, in year 2 I am withdrawing money from specified investment and spending it for approved purpose. Then whatever is spent from the corpus by withdrawing it from specified investment will not be treated as application of 85 percent of income in that year in which it is spent. However, amount spent out of corpus will be considered as application of income in that year in which the amount is redeposited back in the corpus or redeposited back in the specified modes of investment from where it was withdrawn. Let us try to understand this. This is something you need to keep it in your mind. Year 1, 10 lakh corpus received, 10 lakhs corpus received. Same year, 10 lakh deposited in specified modes deposited under section 11.5 and accordingly this 10 lakh will not be regarded as income. Year 1 is over, I have deposited in specified modes. Year 2, I am withdrawing 6 lakhs, 6 lakhs withdrawn and after withdrawing 6 lakhs from this deposits, 6 lakhs is spent towards approved object, spent for approved object, will not be regarded as application of income. This 6 lakhs, no benefit. However, 
now what is happening is i had deposited 10 lakhs here from which i withdrew 6 lakhs 4 lakhs must be the balance out there now in year 5 my income is income of year 5 is 100 lakh out of 100 15 percent is exempt balance is 85 from this 85 i am depositing back redepositing back deposited back 4 lakh rupees in the 11.5 specified modes of investment wherever it was withdrawn so now this 4 lakh rupee will be deemed to be application of income towards approved object in year 5 amount spent in year 2 was 6 lakh rupees but out of corpus out of corpus which were deposited in specified modes which are withdrawn and spent then in a year of spending it will not be considered as application of income it will be considered as application of income in that year in which it is redeposited back in specified modes but only to the tune of whatever amount is redeposited back i had withdrawn 6 lakhs i redeposited back 4 lakhs so in year 5 application of income will be 4 lakhs now in year 6 again i am depositing 1 lakh rupees redeposited back then 1 lakh rupee will be considered as application of income of year 6 and so on correct nothing great simply remember amount spent out of corpus will not be considered as application it will be application only in the year in which it is redeposited back in corpus this is again a litig this is going to be a very big headache for government or courts because this is going to be litigative issue amount spent out of corpus what if corpus was received for one of the approved object and i deposited in specified modes and i am withdrawing and spending it for that purpose only then i am not going to redeposit it back into specified modes of investment but then corpus was not an income and it anything spent out of corpus should not be treated as application of income but obvious any which ways so that was proviso 1 proviso 2 explanation 4 1 similar lines this is more important f point mark it as important amount spent towards approved object out of loan or borrowing this will also be on the same line will not be treated as application in the year in which it is spent it will be treated as application of income in the year in which the loan is repaid in the year of repayment of loan this position was there earlier also nothing new this we have understood in the chapter but up till now it was based on karnataka high court decision of janmabhumi press trust versus cit 1999 now no need to follow karnataka high court decision whatever karnataka high court stated that is officially introduced so nothing great but it is an important point it had always been an important point in exam now once it is clarified in the act it will become more important explanation 2 to section 11 1 what is it it is this way if you recollect amendments were made couple of years back that one charitable trust which is registered under section 12 a 12 double a or 12 ab 12 a 12 double a or now 12 ab also contributes to another trust one trust contributes to another trust so it's okay no problem another trust that trust is also registered under section 12 a 12 double a or 12 ab voluntary donation given then this first mentioned trust will be entitled to claim this amount as an application of income allowed However, means one trust can contribute to another trust and claim it as application of 85% of income towards approved object. However, there is a clarification inserted few years back that if this donation by one trust to another trust is with a direction that it shall be corpus, is with a direction, with a direction that it shall be corpus. corpus for the doni trust corpus for doni then it will not be considered as application of 85 percent of income no such direction if no such direction is issued while donating then it's okay it will be treated as application of income okay so what all amendments are made here this is explanation 2 to section 11 1 what is the amendment made Amendment is this one introduction of 12 AB at both the places 12 AB newly introduced last year postponed to this year so now 12 AB needs to be added here. Second amendment made here is that up till now it was one trust donating to another trust 
trust to trust. Now, this exactly this point shall be applicable not only from trust to trust, it shall also be applicable from trust to university, educational institution, hospital or medical institution which is registered or approved under 1023C sub clause 4566A. One trust donating to another trust with the direction that it shall be corpus for you, not allowed. One trust contributing to hospital etc. again specifying it shall be corpus, again not allowed. That is the amendment. So explanation to trust registered under 12AA or 12AB contributes to another trust registered under 12AA or 12AB or contributes to any fund, trust, institution, university, educational institution, hospital, medical institution referred to in 1023C sub clause 4566A will not be considered as an application of 85% of income if that contribution is with a specific direction that it shall form part of corpus of the recipient trust. Okay. Uh, this is nothing great, this was already there, it is just that one more item is added. Specified modes of investment, this we already discussed that earlier specified modes of investment, there are 14 modes. What was required to be invested was only accumulated income under 11 subsection 2. Now apart from accumulated income with effect from AY 20 to 23, corpus donations will also have to be invested, surprisingly. 12AB which was already there last year, in case you want to skip, you have already studied 12AB, then you can skip this, you can fast forward the video. Those who have not studied, this was introduced last year with effect from AY 21-22 postponed to AY 22-23 because of Corona. Uh, well, what was happening was up to AY 96-97 the application for registration had to be made under section 12A and the registration was also granted under section 12A only, same section. However, with effect from AY 97-98 the rules were changed. Application had to be still made under section 12A only. But the registration would not be granted under 12A, registration would be granted under section 12AA. Now from AY 21-22 or rather postponed to AY 22-23, uh, AY 22-23 onwards application is still to be made under section 12A only, but registration will be granted under section 12AB. This new registration section has been introduced and this new section will be applicable not only for those charitable trusts which are now applying afresh section will be applicable to existing trust also which are already registered under 12A or 12AA. Now what was happening was one of the major reason for this changes is that, that earlier registrations were perpetual registration, lifetime applicable, perpetual. Once registration is granted, then unless it is cancelled by CIT, the registration was valid lifetime and it was becoming difficult to keep a track of uh, charitable activities carried out by these trusts. So, what government did, they introduced 12AB stating that the existing registration which was perpetual unless cancelled, existing registrations will all stand cancelled. Whosoever has already applied in last so many years, all registration cancelled, everyone apply again. Once again apply, application will still be in form number 10A under section 12A only, but registration will now be granted under 12AB and this registration will not be perpetual, it will be valid for 5 years at a time for 5 years at a time and upon expiry of 5 years, trust can once again apply for re-registration or it is called renewal of registration, 5 years at a time. So that is what one of the government's intention was that. So now out of compulsion all commissioners of income tax will have to keep a track of all the trust that what are they doing. Every 5-5 five, five years they will have to keep a track so that necessary action can be taken. Now one of the major reason for this was that, that there are so many NGOs which are receiving funds from uh, particular type of countries and from underworld also and God knows and then they are not actually spending for charitable or religious activity in the name of charity and in the name of religion, they are spending it for some terrorist activities and uh, anti-social activities. To curb down these kind of activities, somebody has to keep a track. Last year government cancelled registration of 800 NGOs with huge amount. We were all being funded by uh, uh, terrorist countries, some people were receiving money from Pakistan, Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, etc. So somebody has to keep a track. Okay, any which way, so this one thing introduced. Okay, so two types of people will have to apply, existing trust, 
existing trust they will have to reapply they will have to apply by 30th june 2021 and they will be granted registration by cit within next 3 months valid for 5 years and those who are new trust newly created newly created now what was happening was whenever newly created trust would approach cit for registration or pcit the cit was supposed to grant registration after confirming three things number one the whether the trust is carrying on charitable activity or not the cit had to check whether newly created trust which is newly applying for registration that trust is carrying on charitable activities or not that is what is written in the act however what happened was few years back one trust so what was happening was anybody approaches cit that sir we have just created the trust please grant us registration under income tax act under section 12a 12a the cit would simply used to refuse saying that boss you have just started your trust you have just created the trust you come to me after 2 years down the line come to me after 2 years and then you show me what charitable activities you conducted in last 2 years and then based on that i will grant you registration which was fair enough so that is what was happening so however recently around 3 years back one uh, madras high court took a decision in favor of trust trust was recently created trust was created and within 7 days they applied for registration to cit cit bluntly refused assessor went up to the court that how can cit refuse so high court stated high court took decision in favor of the trust holding cit irresponsible saying that that if the trust is just created you can't check the activities you can check the activities of the trust whether they are genuine or not only after after the trust commences activity so right now you can't refuse to grant registration so new provision inserted that any trust which is newly created will be granted registration right now whenever they apply but that registration will be provisional registration and that provisional registration will not be for 5 years just like normal trust it will be valid for 3 years at a time valid for 3 years and that will be provisional registration within this 3 years time period trust will have to start or trust will have to commence its charitable or religious activity and once again approach cit that sir we have started our charitable activity so i repeat existing trust existing registration will stand cancel will cease to apply they will have to apply afresh by 30th june new registration will be granted valid for 5 years and every 5 years they can apply for renewal those who are newly created they will also have to apply by what date they have to apply i'll tell you but they will be granted provisional registration which will be valid for 3 years which is actually not a real registration it is a provisional registration and then when they actually commence their activities charitable activities they will have to within 6 months reapply that sir now give us a final registration and then cit will give them or pcit will grant them final registration which will be valid for 5 years and again they can keep applying for renewal that is what is the story so two things which we talked about here is that number one registration was perpetual registration unless cancelled by cit so there was no one to keep a track accordingly new concept introduced whereby registration will be effective only for 5 years and new concept introduced that newly created trust will not be granted a complete registration they will be granted provisional registration valid for 3 years now the question is what is the time limit for existing trust to apply by what time cit will respond back what is the time limit for new trust to apply when will cit respond four time limits to be discussed for two types of trust one by one this newly created trust will have to apply one month before the commencement of assessment year commencement of assessment year for which they want registration so supposing if they want registration for ay 20 to 23 ay 20 to 23 so one month before the commencement of assessment assessment year commences on 1st april 2022 they will have to apply latest by 28th february 2022 one month before the end of the financial year or one month before the beginning of the assessment year meaning thereby if you want registration for current year apply one month before the end of the current previous year and then registration will be granted otherwise come next year and if they want this registration it will be valid for 3 years provisional registration 
they can apply for renewal within 6 months from the date of commencement of charitable activity or 6 months before the expiry of 3 year period. When can they apply for final registration? Final registration such trust will have to apply either 6 months before expiry of 3 years, 6 months before 3 years expiry or 6 months after the date of or 6 months from the date of from the date of commencement of charitable activity once they started. So let us understand this concept. Earlier registrations granted under 12A up to 96-97 or 12AA with effect from 97-98 assessment year were perpetual registrations unless cancelled. Now with effect from 22-23 form 10A application has to be still made under section 12A only but registration will now be granted under 12AB. Existing registration would stand cancelled. Everyone will have to apply for registration. Newly created trust will certainly have to apply now. They will also have to apply under 12A only. Registration will be under 12AB. Registration will be for temporary period of 3 years. So technically section starts now from here, fifth point. Existing trust will apply for registration within 3 months from 1st April 21. That means they will apply by 30th June 21. CIT, PCIT will pass order grant registration within 3 months for valid for 5 years. They will do it within 3 months from the end of the month in which application for registration is received. And uh, renewal upon expiry of 5 year period, such existing trust will have to apply for renewal within 6 months before the expiry of 5 year period. Getting this point? Completely fresh registration. So existing trust will apply for fresh registration by 30th June 21, valid for 5 years. 6 months before the expiry of 5 years, they will have to apply for renewal. Completely new registration, fresh registration, those which are applying for the first time, they will have to apply at least one month before the commencement of previous year for which registration is sought. Sorry, not assessment year, previous year. Previous year, previous year. So if they want registration for previous year 21-22, 21-22, they will have to apply latest by 28th February 2021, one month before the commencement of previous year. This is something is like advanced application, valid for 3 years at a time, it will be provisional registration granted under 12AB only within one month, 3 years period of provisional registration whenever is expiring, 6 months before the expiry of 3 year period or 6 months or 6 months from the commencement of charitable activities, they will have to, whichever is earlier, they will have to apply for final registration. CIT satisfied, they will grant final registration within 6 months from the end of the month in which application made. Such new registration, final registration will be valid for 5 years at a time. Again, upon expiry of 5 years, they can apply for renewal of the registration 6 months before the expiry of 5 year period. Okay, this new registration concept is not all that great, nothing important. So, if you can remember something, it's okay, otherwise let it be. Now, whatever amendments are being made for charitable trust, similar amendments are being carried out under 1023C also, about corpus donation, about spending out of loan or borrowing, spending out of corpus donation, etc. and investment in specified modes. Okay, now before that, I would just like to bring to your notice the amendments which are made under 1023C sub clause 3AD and 1023C sub clause 3AE. Let us first understand this. Now 1023C sub clause 3AD provides exemption to university or educational institution, income from university run by person or income of educational institution, school, college, etc. will be exempt subject to one condition. Similarly, you know, similarly, income from hospital or any medical institution will be exempt under 1023C, both of them subject to condition that profit motive should not be there, it should be for philanthropic purposes and secondly, gross receipts for the whole year should not exceed the prescribed limit. Limit was prescribed by CBDT to be 1 crore. That means gross receipt for the given year should not exceed rupees 1 crore. Now, very first and important amendment is carried out, which is important from exam perspective. Our institute has also asked a question on this in May 2022 attempts RTP, revision test paper. So, this limit of 1 crore is increased to 5 crore. 
now the gross receipt should not exceed 5 crore which is a very positive move truly appreciable of the government secondly this is by way of proviso again proviso has been inserted stating that this 5 crore limit is not for each university each educational institution each hospital each medical institution no if the person is running one educational institution also one hospital also then in such situation 5 crore limit will be applicable to all of them combined together so institute had asked one question that person is running one hospital gross receipts are 3 crore rupees and uh, it is running one college whereby the gross receipts are again 3 crore 3 crore from each of them trust is saying trust is running college and hospital according to the trust exemption is possible because gross receipts are less than prescribed limit answer is no for the purpose of 1023 c sub clause 3 ad a it has to be combined together gross receipts are 6 crore meaning thereby this 5 crore limit is per person and not for per school college or each school college hospital medical institution etc okay this is an important amendment exemption under 1023 c sub clause 3 ad 3 ae were allowed subject to condition annual receipt from school college university education institution hospital medical institution do not exceed prescribed limit which was 1 crore now in limit is increased to 5 crore an explanation has been inserted stating that 5 crore shall not apply to all of them independently but shall apply on an overall basis to the person who runs such institution okay now 3 4 5 6 are similar to what we discussed for public charitable and religious trust to institution explanation 1 to 3rd proviso to 1023c of course you won't be able to remember explanation number and proviso number and all just simply remember that such amendment is carried out in 1023c institute also does not expect you to remember along with clause number sub clause number provision number proviso number explanation number says exemption under 1023c for gross receipt from the school college etc subject to this limit but otherwise in case if it is receiving voluntary contribution then voluntary contribution will be exempt only if invested or deposited in specified modes of investment specified under section 115 in charitable trust it was only for corpus donation here it is for all donation all voluntary contribution everything to be deposit explanation 2 clause 1 and explanation 2 clause 2 to third proviso to 1023c stating that application out of corpus donation will not be regarded as application of uh, income in the current year it will be regarded as application of income in the year in which the amount is redeposited back into specified modes invested or deposited back into specified modes of investment under 115 similarly just like charitable trust amount spent out of application of income for approved object out of loan or borrowing will not be regarded as application in the year of spending money it will be regarded as application of income in the year of repayment of loan whenever it takes place and uh, next point deficit of earlier years that is excess of application of income over and above the excess of application over income of the current year will not be of the preceding year will not be allowed to be adjusted will not be considered as application of 85% of income here there is no concept of 85% getting applicable from next year but right now it's not there with that amendments pertaining to charitable trust are over now penalties penalty part i already explained to you while discussing 234g i'll show you where 234g says that those charitable institutions which are referred to in 80g or scientific r&d section 35 which are registered for scientific r&d okay if you recollect those who are covered for scientific r&d research association or trust institution referred to in 80g subsection 5 they will have to as a donee trust they will have to furnish one statement to prescribe income tax authority and certificate to the donor within the time limit prescribed up till now nothing is prescribed if default takes place there will be fees under 234g of 200 rupee per day plus penalty under 271k minimum 10000 maximum 1 lakh both of them penalty under 271k and 234g were introduced last year and were already taught by us in a last year syllabus but both of them were postponed to the current year so now 271k penalty will be ranging between 10000 to 1 lakh and this penalty will be in addition to 234g 200 rupee per day i am not repeating this it's word to word same miscellaneous provisions chapter in miscellaneous provision chapter 
there is one section 281b which was considered as an important section it is still provisional attachment it is titled as ao could provisionally attach the property any property belonging to the assessee if ao finds it necessary ao could provisionally attach any property belonging to the assessee if he finds necessary to protect the interest of revenue of course with the approval of higher authority without approval he can however this provisional attachment was allowed only if some proceeding is pending two types of proceedings were covered in the section that if any of these two proceedings are pending then ao can attach the property proceeding by way of assessment under any section or proceeding by way of assessment reassessment of income escaping assessment proceeding by way of assessment or assessment or reassessment one more pendency of proceeding has been introduced that even if the proceeding is pending property can be attached even during the pendency of proceedings for imposition of penalty under 271 aad provided penalty amount amounts to or likely to amount to more than 2 crore rupees what is 271 aad 271 aad is a penalty for passing false entry making false entry in the books of accounts or not passing correct entry that is omitting to pass an entry in the books of account correct entry is not passed or wrong entry is passed false entry is passed and the assessee is caught then whatever is the value of that entry omitted or wrong entry value of the entry will be charged as a penalty that is a provision so during the course of 271 aad penalty proceeding imposition during that proceeding also property can be attached equalization levy is the next point okay uh, now what is equalization levy let me just tell you was introduced not as a part of income tax act equalization levy chapter was introduced as chapter 8 chapter 8 of finance act 2016 to know about it financial year 1617 chapter 8 in chapter 8 section 165 was introduced in that year 6% equalization levy 6% of the consideration to be deducted by the payer if payment is made for certain specified services resident person is making payment to non resident person for availing certain specified online advertising related services then the payer will have to deduct 6% equalization levy and deposit with government account provided consideration exceeds 1 lakh similarly last year section 165 a was introduced 2% equalization levy 2% of the consideration this is applicable on non resident e commerce operator non resident e commerce operator on amount received from indian customers or those customers who are using internet protocol address of india resident or non resident anybody but e commerce operator should be non resident this 6% equalization levy is on specified online service this 2% equalization levy is on online sale of goods or online provision of services online sale of goods or online provision of services amount received by e commerce operator non resident 6% is to be deducted by payer deducted by payer and this 2% equalization levy newly introduced is not to be deducted by payer it is to be paid separately by payee to be paid by payee from his own pocket who will be the payee payee will be non resident e commerce operator correct okay now this is on this 6% is for specified service consideration for specified service specified services this 165a is for online sale of goods or services now question is online supply of goods online sale of goods or online services question is what do you mean by online online is now being clarified what do you mean by online so it was believed that in the absence of clarification everything should be online the placing of order offer for sale acceptance of offer payment should be online delivery should be online everything should be online which is one of the possibility in international taxation laws online was already defined but here in equalization levy chapter this online was not defined so now it is defined that in order to be called as online section 164 explanation in order to be called as online provision of services or online sale of goods any one of these should be online 
either acceptance of offer for sale should be online or placing of purchase order should be online or acceptance of purchase order by other party should be online or payment should be online or supply of service should be online partly or wholly any one of them should be online shall include one or more of the following following online activity nothing great this is clarificatory amendment this should have been introduced last year only but government missed it out they did not understand that this is required to be defined and as usual government always just like past history government ends up spending lines and lines and words and words for defining something which is not required and government ends up or government forgets about defining something which is required to be defined government ends up wasting his time money energy everything and leading to litigation court's time will also be wasted 165a subsection 3 clause b inserted by finance act 21 current year but retrospectively from 1st april 20 last year okay now this is in connection with this is 165a so naturally it is in connection with this 2 percent equalization levy for online transaction amount to be paid by e-commerce operator from his own pocket so what is this 2 percent i'll just explain it to you so what happens is let's say e-commerce operator e-commerce operator he receives money from customer suppose in amazon he should be non resident huh? non resident let's say amazon amazon has set up its branch in india and server also amazon dot in so amazon is a wrong example i know that but still just to make you understand just to so that you can connect yourself okay now amazon receives money from customer customer wants to purchase goods he makes payment to amazon say 1 lakh rupees indian rupees and then e-commerce operator is either selling his own goods or e-commerce operator is you know arranging goods and working as a facilitator offering his online platform he is purchasing goods from seller to actually seller is selling to customer but routed through amazon okay so let's say seller is x limited and customer is mr a so customer will make payment of 1 lakh rupee to e-commerce operator amazon and e-commerce operator amazon will deduct its commission let's say commission is 20% and they will pass on 80000 rupees balance to the seller that this is your share 20000 will be the profit so now question is who will pay equalization levy to so equalization levy is payable by e-commerce operator this guy this guy will have to pay on this 1 lakh rupees receipt from customer equalization levy will have to be paid by amazon from his own pocket 1 lakh rupee receipt from customer into 2% that they will have to pay from their own pocket nobody will deduct customer has not to deduct okay now there is a clarification already there in the act that in order to apply equalization levy under section 165 this guy should be non resident e commerce operator should be non resident this is clearly given customer the customer also they have clarified customer has to be resident but in exceptional circumstances or in specified circumstances customer could be non resident also the customer's residential status does not matter there is no clarification however with regards to a uh, residential status of the seller or seller of goods or supposing he is not a seller of goods he is a provider of services he is a service provider there is a service provider providing online services service provider why limited why limited is providing his services through amazon to customer customer makes payment to amazon amazon makes payment to why limited in all this scenario there was a clarification about customer customer could be resident customer could be non resident there was a clarification about amazon e commerce operator he should be non resident this is clearly there there is no clarification with regards to residential status of service provider or the seller of goods seller or service provider so now it has been clarified that these two people should also be non resident seller is non resident e commerce operator is non resident customer is resident or customer is non resident in specified circumstances ideally resident then only equalization levy will apply if the seller is resident then this section or this equalization levy will not apply this is very important amendment and you won't believe most of the teachers 
teaching direct tax have not covered this they don't even know that there was an amendment there were two three amendments three amendments in this particular chapter what is the amendment so this point 1 and point 2 both of them are same only point 1 is for sale of goods for the seller of goods x limited in our example and point number 2 is for service provider that is y limited in our example point 1 and point 2 what is it it says consideration for sale of goods sale of goods and here consideration for provision of services irrespective of whether e-commerce operator owns the goods or not will be subjected to equalization levy however it shall not include it shall not include the consideration for sale of such goods which are owned by person resident in india that means seller is resident in india or permanent establishment in india of a person who is non resident meaning thereby the seller of goods should be non resident and when it comes to provision of services it says consideration on which equalization levy 2% is going to be levied shall not include the consideration for provision of those services which are provided by person resident in India or which are provided by permanent establishment in India of a person who is non-resident in India and the provision of such services effectively connected with P. Simple language, in very simple language, equalization levy 2% under section 165A will be applicable only if e-commerce operator is non-resident and the provider of service or seller of goods is also non-resident. A negative language is used that the seller or service provider should not be resident in India or should not be PE of foreign company or non-resident in India. I hope you are understanding which indirectly means seller of the goods or provider of service should also be non-resident. Plus proviso inserted, this is also an important point that equalization levy will not apply on the consideration which is chargeable to tax in India which is already taxable as royalty or FTS. This we already discussed at the beginning of the video while discussing section 10 clause 50 and that time I told you 10 clause 50 will be repeating again. So what are the contents of 10 clause 50? Before that let us understand as per proviso to 163.3 of chapter 8 of finance act 16, royalty if any consideration which is taxable in India whether it is for specified service section 165 or it is for e-commerce supply or service section 165A whether it is section 165 of finance act 16 or it is e-commerce supply section 165A it shall not include consideration shall not include anything which is chargeable to tax in India in the form of royalty or FTS whether it is considered as royalty or FTS as per income tax act or it is considered as royalty or FTS as per any agreement as per any DTAA under section 90 or 90A. In simple words, if you are confused with the technical language, read only bracketed wordings which is my language. In simple words, consideration which is taxable under the Income Tax Act as royalty or FTS shall not be subjected to equalization levy and therefore these two things will not be exempt also 10 clause 50 income arising from providing specified service from e-commerce supply or e-commerce service made or provided so and so. However, this exemption shall not be available on any income which is chargeable to tax as royalty or FTS under the Income Tax Act. Okay. Why it should not be exempt? Because it will no more be subjected to equalization levy. Why it will not be subjected to equalization levy? Because of this. But that is okay. But why? What is the logical reason? The reason is that equalization levy was introduced for those incomes of non-residents on which income tax was not getting levied. Income tax was not getting levied because of provisions of section 9-1 that such incomes were not deemed to be accruing arising in India. So we were helpless. We were not able to charge tax. Then based on recommendations of OECD in its action plan 1, BEPS action plan 1, we introduced equalization levy. So the whole objective of equalization levy was to cover those transactions where income is not getting taxed because of lack of place of accrual of income. Incomes were not accruing in India. But now there is a clarification that if it is royalty, if it can be classified as royalty or FTS, then to no need to charge equalization levy because it is going to be taxable otherwise also. 
therefore exemption will also not be provided this is slightly an important point from exam perspective keep it in your mind now uh, we are done with i forgot to tell you at the beginning of the video that i have divided amendments into three categories amendments of topics of final ca second is amendments in the topic of inter ca that is five heads of income chapter 6a deduction etc and then the third part is amendments in topics of international taxation so final ca topics are all done now amendments and inter ca topics will discuss in some time but before that i would like to jump to topics of international taxation let me finish off with that so we'll have a better understanding and then inter ca topics amendments will discuss in a while okay because the amendments pertaining to international taxation topics are very small they will get over like this so first amendment is in section 91 and then a second amendment is in section 9a section 9a let me start with section 9a 9a is very simple let me finish on 9a is applicable for eligible investment fund and its fund manager if you recollect a section 9a many teachers are not teaching at ca final level but i have taught in the class in case you are done with it well and good in case you have not done don't worry about it the amendment is not that important this chapter is also not that important from exam perspective institute has never asked the question in section 9a there are few conditions given in section 9a3 there are 13 conditions 13 conditions to be fulfilled by the fund eligible fund they are given in a form of section 9a subsection 3 clause a till clause m a b c d e f g i h i j k l m okay and then there are some conditions given in section 9a subsection 4 there are four conditions to be fulfilled by fund manager these 13 conditions to be fulfilled by fund and these four conditions given in section 9a subsection 4 clause a till clause d a b c d these four conditions are to be fulfilled by the fund manager now from these 13 plus 4 17 conditions government has issued 9a subsection 8a that some relaxation will be given what relaxation will be given that government has not yet clarified has not yet revealed but if the fund manager is located in an international financial service center ifsc and commences operation on or before 31st march 24 in order to attract more and more of foreign investment government has issued 9a subsection 8a that if fund manager is located in ifsc and commences operation on or before 31st march 24 then central government by notification in the official gazette may specify that one or more of the conditions out of the 17 will not apply or will apply with modifications as may be specified so government is going to give them relaxation okay you don't worry you come to india don't worry some condition we will relax for you you don't satisfy now but this is unimportant from exam perspective in case you are done with the section then well and good not done with the section 9a in the class in the regular lecture then you skip this don't worry now section 91 in section 9 subsection 1 clause 1 which talks about income deemed to accrue or arise in india first i would like to discuss this point a point explanation 2a explanation 2a was introduced by finance act 18 so already taught to you this is about significant economic presence sep this is based on recommendations of oecd in its beps action plan we introduced it already in 2018 3 years back and then last year that means applicable from ay 1920 but last year amendments were carried out without any logical reason government postponed it to ay 2223 it was postponed to ay 2223 in the last year's budget okay what is it now concept is that this is basically to capture all those people who are providing online services okay so if you recollect equalization levy which we just discussed the reason i am picking up this right now the logical reason is that we just finished talking about equalization levy now equalization levy is governed by chapter 8 of finance act 2016 equalization levy once applicable equalization levy is ideally applicable on those transactions which were otherwise not going to be taxable in india and once equalization levy is paid or deducted then income from those transaction in the hands of non resident income for non resident will be exempt under section 10 clause 50 so people were making fun of government about this 10 clause 50 that this exemption is given 
stating that equalization levy is paid then in the hands of non resident recipient the income from those transactions will be exempt now two types of transaction income governed by section 165 from providing online specified service and transactions which were covered by 165a transaction of e commerce or online uh, provision of services or online sale of goods uh, people started making fun of government when government introduces 10 clause 50 arun jetli ji people said sir you are exempting the income as if you are doing some favor sir 1050 is a useless section or useless provision because this income was not going to be taxable in india otherwise also this income which is covered by these two sections 6% equalization levy and 2% equalization levy these incomes are not taxable in india otherwise also because they are not accruing in india or nor even deemed to be accruing in india how would you have taxed it if 1050 was not there then how how in this world would you have taxed these non residents on what basis would you have charged tax to them not possible so this 1050 you are making a joke you are making a mockery of indian taxation system so to cover up this mistake to cover up this mistake government introduce in section 911 government introduce explanation 2a to section 911 which is recommended by oecd also in his beb section plan stating that generally which incomes accrue in india or deemed to accrue or arise in india so as per section 911 we don't use the word permanent establishment we use the word business connection so section 911 says that income of non resident from business connection in india will be deemed to be accruing in india income of non resident from business connection in india will be deemed to be accruing in india the explanation 2a inserted now applicable from ay 20 to 23 stating that significant economic presence significant economic presence of non resident significant economic presence of non resident in india will be deemed to be business connection will be considered as a business connection of non resident in india and accordingly income from given transaction will be deemed to be accruing in india even though it is actually not accruing this is basically to justify 1050 that okay 1050 we introduce it is proper if 1050 was not there then we would have charged the tax on these people how so because of explanation 2a significant economic presence sep the government clarified in this explanation 2a further that following two types of transactions will be considered as significant economic presence number 1 significant economic presence of non resident in india would mean two things number 1 any transaction any transaction of property transaction of goods services goods services or property if the collection from india if the collection from india that is received from india collection exceeds the amount collected from india exceeds particular limit particular limit and the limit is clarified to be 2 crore exceeding 2 crore rupees in a year exceeds 2 crore rupees in a year so if non resident even though non resident or a foreign company have no presence in india no office in india nothing is there no dependent agent also they are directly selling goods but if they are selling goods worth more than 2 crore in a year then they will be deemed to be having significant economic presence in india and income from such transaction will be deemed to be accruing in india on the other hand they have also introduced one more point to indicate significant economic presence if the number of users number of users in india of that foreign company or non resident number of users in india exceed the particular limit and that limit is 3 lakh customers 3 lakh customer or 3 lakh users limits are given exceeding 2 crore either collection exceeds 2 crore or number of users in india exceed 3 lakhs now 3 lakh is not a annual limit 3 lakh is not a annual limit 2 crore is a annual limit in a year but 3 lakh is a one time target once the number of customer base shoots up to 3 lakh the non resident will be deemed to be having business connection in india an income from that transaction with those customers number of users in india will be deemed to be accruing or arising in india so what is it let us understand explanation 2a introduced by finance act 
for the removal of doubts it is hereby clarified hereby declared now there is no need to use these wordings for the removal of doubts as if this was already there and we people had doubts and government is clarifying our doubts this was introduced by arun jetli ji it is declared that the significant economic presence of non resident in india shall constitute business connection in india and significant economic presence for this purpose shall mean and once the business connection is there then income will be deemed to be accruing in india significant economic presence for this purpose shall mean number a clause a or clause b clause a transaction in respect of goods services or property carried out by non resident in india goods services property including provision for download of data or download of software in india if the aggregate payments aggregate payments payment by customer for assessi non resident it is collection the collection arising from such transaction during the previous year this is the annual limit during the previous year exceeds such amount as may be prescribed amount is prescribed in rule 11 ud to be more than 2 crore then non resident will be deemed to be having significant economic presence in india or 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 number b systematic and continuous soliciting of business activities or engaging in interaction with such number of users as may be prescribed number of users are 3 lakh however 3 lakh is not the annual limit 2 crore payment is the annual limit because of the wordings during the year during the year but for 3 lakh users it is nowhere stated that during the year that means 3 lakh is at any given point of time then as per rule 11 ud provided that transaction or activity shall constitute significant economic presence whether or not agreement for such transaction is entered into in india even if agreement is outside india then also even if non resident has a residence or place of business in india or not having place of business in india or non resident renders services in india or services outside india makes no difference irrespective of these three non resident has a presence in india or not renders services in india or not has agreement in india or not makes no difference provided global income will not be taxable only so much of the income as is attributable to above mentioned transactions referred to in clause a or clause b only shall be deemed to accrue or arise in india clear about this okay now explanation 1 clause a to section 91 which is very nominal okay what is explanation 1 so first of all if you recollect section 9 subsection 1 clause 1 which clarifies when will the income be deemed to be accruing in india for non resident then it has got nine explanation explanation 1 2 2 3 3 a 4 5 6 explanation 4 5 6 7 nine explanations are there usme explanation 1 has five clauses clause a b c d e five clauses are there clause a says that that if all business connection if all entire business activity is not in india income deemed to accrue or arise in india that is clarified in 911 it has nine explanation explanation 1 clause a says that that if all operations of the business are not carried out in india then only that much income will be deemed to be accruing or arising in india as much as pertains to number of operations carried out in india supposingly i am a businessman i have got my income is deemed to accrue or arise in india as per 911 but i have got only 22% transactions in india remaining 78% are outside india outside india then out of my total income from such transaction only 22% income will be deemed to be accruing in india that means proportionate income will be deemed to be accruing in india as much as is bearing to or as much as is relatable to operations carried out in india so explanation 1 clause a to 91 according to explanation 1 clause a in case of business of which all operations are not carried out in india all operations are not carried out income from such business deemed under this clause to accrue or arise in india shall be only that much income as much as is reasonably attributable to operations carried out in india will be deemed to be accruing in india i give you the example 22% however this explanation shall not apply to business having business connection on account of significant economic presence meaning thereby this explanation explanation 1 clause a will not apply to this 
सिग्निफिकेंट इकोनॉमिक प्रेजेंस वाला कॉन्सेप्ट एक्सप्लेनेशन टू ए इट डज नॉट मैटर दिस डज नॉट मैटर वाई इट डज नॉट मैटर दिस अ वेरी स्टूपिट अमेंडमेंट रीजन इज दैट वॉट एवर इज स्टेटेड इन दिस एक्सप्लेनेशन वन क्लॉज ए विच इट सेज दैट दिस डज नॉट अप्लाई टू सिग्निफिकेंट इकोनॉमिक प्रेजेंस but then whatever is stated here is already stated here also here see only that much income will be deemed to be accruing in india as much as is attributable to transactions carried out or transactions referred to in clause a clause b or activities referred to in clause a clause b so again if only 22% transactions are carried out in india only that much income will be deemed to be accruing in india and not the global income right okay with that amendments pertaining to international taxation and amendments pertaining to final ca topics are over now we will be discussing amendments pertaining to inter ca topics okay now pertaining to inter ca amendments pertaining to inter ca topics that is five heads of income clubbing chapter 6a etc now first one is in salary chapter the amendment carried out in salary chapter uh, there are two amendments being carried out so actually only one the second one is section 89a which is not actually a part of salary chapter but i have included it under the head salary the first one is pertaining to section 10 11 and 10 12 section 10 11 provides exemption with regards to withdrawal and interest on statutory provident fund account and section 10 clause 12 provides exemption on the amount withdrawn principal as well as interest withdrawn from rpf account recognized provident fund account now both these accounts statutory provident fund account recognized provident fund account exemption is available with regards to amount withdrawn whether it is principal amount or interest amount whatever it may be however some high net worth individuals or high level of salary individuals hni or i would say those who are earning salary into nine digits that is around 18 19 crore rupees per annum these employees were contributing to spf and rpf account exorbitantly and claiming exemption on their interest let us try to understand what amendment has been made employer for example pay salary to employee employee is let's say mr a his salary is 18 crore rupees per annum 18 crore per annum now apart from paying salary employer will contribute to his spf rpf account also employer will ideally contribute approximately 9 to 10% of salary 9 to 10% of 18 crore employer contributes 1.8 crore that is okay employee also contributes approximately same 1.8 crore per annum but instead of contributing 1.8 crore employee will end up contributing a larger amount why i will tell you now this employee is earning salary of more than 5 crore rupees he falls under the maximum rate of tax 30% plus maximum rate of surcharge of 37% plus health and education says the effective rate of tax for him will be 72.40 sorry 42.744% Now he ends up paying exorbitant amount of tax. Now after receiving the salary, in case he contributes only 1.8 crore, of course deduction under section 80C will be restricted to one and a half lakh only. But he will not be interested in claiming this deduction under 80C. This is a peanut amount for him. Now imagine after contributing after everything, supposing the salary 18 crore, if assuming it is net of tax, assuming it is after TDS, so it is net of tax 18 crore rupees. if he contributes negligible amount in this rpf spf account 1 crore or 1 and 1/2 crore he will be left out with a major chunk supposingly this guy is left out with around 15 crore rupees he is left with 15 crore rupees after contributing to spf rpf account 1 and 1/2 crore and whatever and after making other expenses 15 crore are left out with him as a savings now what should he do if he, in case he invest in fd fixed deposits company fixed deposit or uh, government fixed deposit or bank fd he will end up receiving interest not more than 7% per annum 7% and from 7% he will end up paying tax 42.744% so after paying tax 42 exorbitant let's say 43% i am rounding it off to which is approximately 3% 3% out of 7% after paying tax after paying tax this guy will be left out with barely 4% per annum so what these high net worth individuals or high salary earners what they were doing instead of contributing an amount equivalent to 10% of their salary 12% of their salary instead of doing that these people 
see employer will keep contributing 1.8 crore only employer will contribute as per the ctc agreement between him and the company however employee instead of contributing 1.8 crore he would end up contributing 15 crore exorbitantly so that interest received by him now interest rate offered by spf and rpf account is approximately 8 percent which is more than the fd rate of interest plus this interest is tax free it is exempt under section 10 11 and 10 12 it was entirely exempt so no tax after paying tax entire 8 percent he could pocket and if you compare it with net of tax interest received from fd account then it is double of fd in such situation these high net worth individuals were contributing exorbitantly to these kind of spf rpf account and claiming exemption on this interest under section 10 11 and 10 12 10 11 for spf account 10 12 for rpf account so now government has brought some restriction government identified that as per article published in economic times there are only 800 high net worth employees only 800 employees in the whole country who are taking undue advantage of exemption available under 10 11 and 10 12 of course see i am talking about their own contribution i am not talking about employer's contribution because employer will contribute subject to particular percentage of salary employee can contribute as much as he wants to so employees were found to be contributing exorbitantly so now government has imposed restriction by introducing two provisos proviso 1 in section 10 11 and section 10 12 both of them have the same proviso so i am not repeating it twice in one shot only so now what will happen is interest on first 2 lakh 50 thousand first rupees 2 lakh 50 thousand of contribution of employee i am not commenting on employer's contribution i am talking about employee's own contribution on employee's own contribution will be eligible for exemption under section 10 11 and 10 12 10 11 10 12 will continue to be available whatever is available now 10 11 10 12 if you recollect exemption is available with regards to or uh, it's up to 9.5 percent of interest 9.5 percent of balance on spf rpf account on first two and a half lakh of uh, contribution whatever is the interest on first two and a half lakh of contribution that will be eligible for exemption if employee has contributed more than two lakh fifty thousand in a year then interest on on contribution of employee interest on contribution of employee exceeding first two lakh fifty thousand in a year will no more be exempt will be taxable on this no 10 11 no 10 12 no 10 11 and no 10 12 nothing would be allowable it will be taxable then there is second proviso but before we come to second proviso which is in the form of some clarification let's first finish this 10 11 10 12 this will be impacting only high net worth individuals or uh, again high net worth individuals but those who are earning salary only 800 such people are there as per a report published in economic times i don't know i have not done any research on this but it's economic times article the idea is that some high net worth individuals instead of investing in fd or investing in other options they were investing exorbitantly in rpf spf so to stop them from doing this and by taking undue advantage of 10 11 10 12 this restriction has been placed first proviso to 10 11 10 12 stating that interest on spf rpf relating to that much contribution made by account holder we are commenting on the contribution made by account holder we are not talking about contribution made by employer employer's contribution whether it is exceeding 2 lakh 50 thousand or it is within 2 lakh 50 thousand makes no difference interest on spf rpf account relating to that much contribution of account holder which is exceeding 2 lakh 50 thousand in a year in that fund on or after 1st april 21 this amendment has been made applicable from 1st april 21 means whatever contributions were made up to 31st march 21 no impact and computed in a prescribed manner so manner has been prescribed by government by issuing notification which i will briefly explain you will not be exempt anymore however instead of 2 lakh 50 thousand a year the limit will become 5 lakhs per annum 5 lakh as per second proviso if there is no contribution in the given fund by employer employer is not contributing only employee is contributing then limit will be instead of 2 lakh 50 thousand it will be 5 lakh second proviso is okay okay mainly first proviso i hope you have understood the first proviso now this interest is to be computed in a prescribed manner so what manner has been prescribed the government has issued a notification clarifying that 
now employer will have to maintain three accounts employer will have to maintain three accounts employer will have to within the same spf rpf account employer will have to divide that account spf rpf account will have to be divided into three parts three parts account one will be employer's contribution employer's contribution irrespective of the amount account number two will be employee's own contribution employee's own contribution up to first two and a half line up to first two and a half line and next will be again third account will be it will be same account only but within the account three partitions will have to be made employee's own contribution in a year exceeding exceeding rupees 250000 now interest on all three will be credited separately whatever is the interest on the investments made out of spf rpf account balance interest will be credited to all three accounts individually so that records can be maintained because interest is always paid on cumulative basis so right now first year one will be able to find out how much is the interest on first two and a half lakh how much is the interest on uh, above two and a half lakh contribution of employee next year onwards or third year onwards there could be practical difficulty in calculation this new system to be followed on or after 1st april 2021 that kind of simple system has been introduced by government by issuing notification proceeding further second amendment is in salary chapter section 89a 89a is totally unimportant from exam perspective because some notification has yet to be issued clarifying some further things what is it let us understand supposingly section 89a there is an employee called mr x mr x but he is working outside india he is working outside india in a country with which india has a dtaa or he is working in a country which is a notified country now in that country in ay 1314 he opens some account similar to spf account rpf account etc let's call it as retirement benefit account he opens a retirement benefit account in ay 1314 and he starts making contribution this account will be called as a specified account this account will be called specified account and in that year he makes contribution there is a contribution by employer own contribution is not going to be taxable if you receive salary of 10 lakh and out of 10 lakh rupees you contribute 2 lakh rupees to your spf account that 2 lakh rupees is not your income it is already considered in your income as a salary of 10 lakh out of that taxable salary you are contributing 2 lakh so that 2 lakh cannot be your separate income so employer's contribution only will be considered as income but in that year the year in which employer contributed in that year he is non-resident in india and he is resident in that notified country in india he is non-resident he is non-resident services are provided outside india this income cannot be taxed in india right but this is a story of ay 13 14 employer contributed now what is happening in ay 22 23 that is current year now he is withdrawing now he is coming back to India and he is withdrawing funds from that retirement benefit account. He has retired. Now in this year he becomes a resident in India. In AY 13 14 he was non resident in India and resident in foreign country. Now this year he has become resident in India but he is non resident in notified country. Things have changed. Residential status has totally changed. Right? Now what is the problem? Problem is that this is employer's contribution in that notified country. In that notified country, employer's contribution, employer's contribution, in India, it is taxable. In India, contribution of employer under the age salary is taxable either at the time of receipt or at the time of accrual, whichever is earlier in point of time, at the time of accrual or receipt, whichever is earlier. So, in India, it is not going to be taxable. In India, as per Indian taxation law, this contribution of employer was ideally going to be taxed in AY 13-14. If taxable, it would have been taxable under uh, the head salary in the year AY 13-14. Receipt year, year of receipt or the year of accrual, whichever is earlier. The year of receipt is AY 22-23, the year of withdrawal, that is the year of receipt. But the year of accrual is 13-14. So, as per Indian taxation law, this amount, if taxable in India, it would have been taxable in AY 13-14. But as per the laws of that foreign country, notified country, it is taxable in the year of withdrawal only. Year of withdrawal is 22-23. 22-23. In India, if taxable, it would have been taxable in AY 13-14. In foreign country, it is taxable in the year of withdrawal, that is AY 22-23. Now, the problem is in AY 22-23, foreign country will tax him. 
foreign country will tax him though he is non resident in ay 20 to 23 in that foreign country foreign country will charge tax to him in india in india he is resident in the current year ay 20 to 23 now the problem will arise is that whether he can claim credit or not whether he can claim credit of the foreign tax or not ftc we call it as a foreign tax credit so how to avail foreign tax credit technically foreign tax credit cannot be availed in india reason is in india this income is not taxable in ay 20 to 23 ay 13 14 it would have been taxable but in ay 13 14 he was non resident in india so no tax correct no tax in india in ay 13 14 in ay 20 to 23 it is not taxed in india therefore technically double taxation avoidance agreement benefit cannot be availed because in order to avail the benefit of dtaa if there is a dtaa between india and that country or if there is no dtaa then unilateral relief under section 91 this is possible ftc we call it as foreign tax credit is possible only if the given income is taxable in both the countries in the same year or at least nearby period so this will create problem in india it would have been taxable in ay 13 14 so in india tax was never offered because in that year it never accrued in india it was not deemed to be accruing in india not taxable in india now in ay 20 to 23 it is taxable in notified country but not taxable in india not taxable in india so technically whatever taxes that he has paid in foreign country in the year of withdrawal that should ideally lapse but government of india says don't worry we will give you some credit under section 89a we will decide the taxation rules for this kind of situation however the rules are yet to be notified therefore question cannot be asked on section 89a right now at least for the next one or two attempts so what is it 89a with effect from ay 20 to 23 where a specified person specified person is a person who was non resident in that year in india but resident in foreign country and in the current year in the year of withdrawal he is resident in india non resident in foreign country specified person has income accrued in a specified account that is interest such income shall be taxed in such manner and in such year as may be prescribed it is yet to be prescribed therefore question is not possible so that is why unimportant for the time being explanation specified account means an account maintained in a notified country by the specified person in respect of his retirement benefit account open in a notified country by specified person for his retirement benefit and the income from such account is not taxable on accrual basis in foreign country but is taxed in such country at the time of withdrawal or at the time of redemption that is ay 20 to 23 specified person means a person who is resident in india right now resident in india who opened a specified account that is retirement benefit account in a notified country while being non resident in india and resident in that country non resident in india resident in that country this is the story of ay 13 14 earlier year but now it is taxable in ay 20 to 23 in that country but now he is resident in india so how to give credit and how the income would be taxable that will be clarified technically this income should not be taxed in india at all neither in ay 13 14 because in india incomes are taxable under the salary at the time of accrual or receipt whichever is earlier and the earlier is 13 14 ay at that time he was non resident in india therefore not taxable now when he is receiving in ay 20 to 23 again it is not taxable in india both the years it is not taxable in india neither in ay 13 14 nor in ay 20 to 23 i hope you have understood what i am trying to say but now how to tax this income that government will clarify with that salary chapter amendments are over salary had only two amendments 89a i have explained you but not to be done again PGBP is the next chapter. PGBP amendments are all introduced with retrospective effect from AY 21-22, though introduced by Finance Act. As I told you earlier, Nirmala Sita Raman ji, since past two years, she is taking undue advantage of Corona fear, and she has been introducing almost 70% of the amendments applicable retrospectively, which is allowed, which is technically allowed. But earlier governments were not doing it like this. Even Arun Jaitley ji were also not doing it. This creates lot of confusion. some amendments from this year some amendments from last year every time you'll have to check which amendment is from which year and exorbitant number of amendment this lady is making but doesn't matter first amendment very important block of asset defined in section 2 clause 11 for depreciation purpose block of asset would not include goodwill of business or profession whether it is of business or it is of profession assets we are not commenting on the definition of asset we are talking on 
on block of asset that is depreciable assets here goodwill will no more be included meaning thereby now onwards second amendment is in connection with the first amendment section 32 subsection 1 clause 2 that now onwards depreciation shall no more be available on goodwill whether it is goodwill or business or profession then explanation 2 to section 36 subsection 1 clause 5a if you recollect it is in connection with this point only you know what i explained you uh, in this employees welfare account or staff benefit account rpf account spf account etc here employer also contributes employee also contributes employer contributes to this account directly employee cannot contribute directly whatever i told you employee cannot contribute directly employee whatever he wants to contribute he has to hand it over to employer and employer will deposit in this account employee himself cannot contribute he himself cannot deposit his own contribution he has to contribute it to employer employer will deposit so that means in the hands of employer there will be two impact first when employer receives from employee it will be income under section 28 taxable under the pgvp it will be deemed to be income and then when employer deposits in this respective account rpf spm employer will get deduction at the time of depositing under section 36 subsection 1 clause 5a however in order to claim this deduction by employer employer will claim deduction there is a condition in 36 1 clause 5a that the deposit should be on or before the due date on or before the due date of the relevant act now what do you mean by due date of the relevant act it is always understood that due date of the relevant act means due date of the relevant fund whatever is the time limit or deadline given in the relevant fund spf account rpf account which is ideally on a monthly basis which is 15th day of the next month the January month's contribution to be deposited by employer by 15 February. February month's contribution by 15 March. So due date used to mean the due date of the relevant fund. However, in between there were two, three high court decisions starting with the Jharkhand high court. Jharkhand high court couple of years back in the case of Khicha Sugar, they took decision in favor of Asasi holding that, that the due date to be to deposit this uh, employee's contribution shall not be shall not necessarily be the due date of the respective fund it could be the due date given in the income tax act given in 139.1 for filing it return that means khicha sugar in the case of khicha sugar jharkhand high court say that that the due date here should be understood as due date given in section 43b that is due date of filing it return however government this was not the real intention of government here the deadline will not be the deadline of filing IT return or due date of filing IT return but will be deadline given in the respective fund which is 15th of the next month. So there is a clarification inserted which was already there but we knew about it but because of this 2-3 high court decisions going against the intention of government, government has now clarified it is a clarificatory amendment stating that the provisions of 43b shall not apply and shall be deemed to have never been applicable for determining due date of the relevant fund and the due date of relevant fund would mean the due date as per relevant act applicable to that fund. This is clarificatory amendment. Similar amendment is carried out which I have not covered specifically. Similar amendment is carried out in section 43b also corresponding amendment by inserting explanation 5. So now it is very clearly given that due date will be due date of the respective fund. 43ca amendment is very important. 43CA of the PGBP chapter is similar to section 50C of the capital gain chapter. 43CA of PGBP, 50C section of capital gain chapter, both are similar, which are applicable to the seller selling immovable property. Whenever immovable property is sold, the sale consideration will be higher of the two, either actual sale consideration or the stamp duty value as on the date of registration, whichever is higher, actual sale consideration or stamp duty value. However, couple of years back some amendments were made, provisos were introduced, first proviso was introduced in 43 CA as per first proviso, stamp duty value is to be taken into account only if the stamp duty value is greater than 110 percent of actual, meaning thereby if the actual consideration is 100 lakhs and the stamp duty value is 105 lakhs, then stamp duty value not to be taken into account. because stamp duty value is 105 percent of this 105 percent of actual if stamp duty value is 111 lakh which is 111 percent of actual then stamp duty value will be taken into account and higher of the two will be considered 
However, due to Corona, house property market was very badly hit. The property prices had started dropping down, but the corresponding stamp duty value was not reduced. So, government carried out this amendment by way of press note and now it is officially introduced in the form of second proviso to section 43 CA that instead of 110 percent, the tolerable band will be 120 percent if four conditions are fulfilled. 110 shall be substituted temporarily by 120 percent, meaning thereby stamp duty value, the comparison between actual sale consideration and stamp duty value is to be taken into account only when the stamp duty value is more than 120 percent of actual consideration. If actual is 100, stamp duty value should be more than 120 lakhs, then only it will be taken into account, otherwise it is to be ignored. This 120 percent is applicable only if four conditions fulfilled. However, this amendment is carried out in 43 CA, but not in section 50 C of capital gain chapter, it is only for 43 CA. And when is 43 CA applicable? 43 CA applies when the immovable property is sold as a stock in trade. If it is sold as capital asset, then 50 C, sold as stock in trade, then 43 CA. Which are these four conditions? Number one, it should be residential unit. The immovable property should be residential unit. It should not be commercial unit, factory, office, etc., shop, showroom, go down. It should not be land. It should be only residential unit. Second, it should have been transferred between 12th November 2020, which is last year, last financial year, till 30th June 2021, which falls in current year. 12 November 20 falls in the last year and 30th June 21 falls in the current year. This is an important condition, important condition. You will have to remember the dates 30th June 21. That means only first three months of the current year, April, May, June. Thereafter, this 120 will once again become 110, right? Third condition is that it should be transferred by way of residential unit should have been transferred by way of first time allotment of the residential unit, meaning thereby it should have been purchased by individual customer, by purchase by customer, customer by any person, need not be individual, customer, end user should have purchased it directly from builder, should have been purchased under primary market and not under secondary market, it should not be second hand property, that is called first time allotment. And last condition, consideration for such transfer does not exceed rupees 2 crore per property. Four conditions, date you will have to remember, 2 crore you will have to remember. Okay, our institute has asked one nice question, MCQ question in RTP of May 2022 based on this particular point. Corresponding amendments are carried out in section 56 subsection 2 clause 10 also. So let's jump, PGBP we will keep pending, let's jump to IFOS chapter, IFOS amendment. Are you clear? Four conditions you will have to remember, then 110 will become 120. So section 43 CA applies to seller, the builder. And IFOS chapter section 56 subsection 2 is applicable to the buyer. 43 CA, this amendment is carried out in 43 CA and it is carried out in 56 subsection 2 clause 10 sub clause B. 43 CA is for seller and 56 subsection 2 is for buyer. Buyer also will not be taxed for the differential amount under income from other source. In case if the difference between stamp duty value and actual consideration paid by him does not exceed 20 percent of actual. So here it was 10 percent, tolerable band is increased to 20 percent. Okay, so fourth proviso has been inserted with the same four condition that it should be residential unit, should have been transferred between 12th November 2020 till 30th June 21. First time allotment, consideration should not exceed 2 crore, then 10 percent of consideration shall be substituted by 20 percent of consideration. Concept is same, but in 43 CA we have a different language and in 56 subsection 2 for buyer we have a slightly different language. Here we talk about stamp duty value should exceed 120 percent of actual and here we say difference between the two should be exceeding 20 percent of actual, actual consideration. Concept is same, whether it is 120 or it is 20 percent, concept is same. Then what is 56 subsection 2 clause B that I briefly clarified here, earlier provision, which is not required if you recollect, if you know about it. Whatever is given in bold italics, only that much is the amendment, clear? Now coming back to PGBP, the next amendment. So this particular amendment is very important, which is in 43 CA for seller in PGBP chapter and in 56 subsection 2 for buyer, okay? But no such corresponding amendment has been carried out in section 50 C. Why in 50 C it is not carried out capital gain chapter? Because one of the condition is it should be by way of first time allotment. 
and first time allotment is not possible if section 50C is applicable. 44AB again an important amendment in 44AB tax audit, compulsory tax audit, 44AB has various clauses. Section 44AB has got 5 clauses, 44AB clause A is applicable to person who is carrying on business in case of sales gross receipt or turnover of the current year, sales gross receipt or turnover from the business, from business exceeded rupees 1 crore, then he has to get his books of accounts audited. Instead of 1 crore, proviso inserted in 44AB clause A, proviso 1 inserted stating that this proviso was inserted last year, stating that, that instead of 1 crore, the limit will be 5 crore, limit will be tax audit will be required compulsorily if turnover etc of the current year exceeds 5 crore if two conditions satisfied, if two conditions satisfied, which two conditions, number one, out of total gross receipts in the current year, out of total receipts, not more than 5% of the total receipts is by way of cash or I would say cash receipts do not exceed 5% of total receipt. First condition with regards to cash receipt and second condition with regards to cash payment. Cash payment including business expenditure should not exceed 5% and cash payment should not exceed 5% of total payment. Now what is the amendment? Amendment is that, that last year when government introduced this first proviso by enhancing the limit from 1 crore to 5 crore, people responded very quickly, people were very happy with this kind of because people generally small businessmen having turnover between 1 crore to 5 crore, they do not like to get their books of accounts audited and they do not like to pay the fees to chartered accountant, they find it very exorbitant. So, this particular step of government was very much welcome. This was considered as an initiative to, or promotion of initiative taken by government of digital economy. So, to promote it further, this year limit is increased to 10 crore with same two conditions that total receipt should not exceed, I mean cash receipt should not exceed 5% of the total receipt and cash payment should not exceed 5% of total payment. This limit is now increased to 10 crore. Up to 10 crore turnover of the current year, no need to get books of accounts audited which is again going to have a very welcome move, but it is saddening for we chartered accountants because our business will be reduced. But does not matter, economy is growing, so there will be more and more number of people having more than 10 crore turnover, more and more of people. So now audit will be required only if turnover of the current year exceeds 10 crore, provided these two conditions fulfilled. Now one more proviso inserted, which was a mistake of government, which government has rectified. So last year when this proviso was inserted, government stated cash received cash payment, government use the word cash, which is not correct. Instead of cash, they should have used the word uh, receipt and payment otherwise by way of account pay check, account pay draft, ECS through bank or and other electronic mode should not exceed 5 percent. That kind of language they should have used, but government used the word cash. So now to rectify that mistake, this proviso inserted in the current year, but everything applicable from last year, every all changes are applicable from AY 21-22, stating that. If the payment is made by check or receipt is by way of check or a draft which is not an account pay, if check or a draft is a bearer check or only a cross check which is not an account pay check, which is not account pay, then it will be treated at par with cash. It will be considered to be payment or receipt in cash. This is an important amendment. Please keep it in your mind. So, as per first proviso, 5 percent of the total payments and total receipts ka 5 percent is not by cash, right, then limit will be 5 crore. This 5 crore limit increased to 10 crore, but retrospectively and second proviso inserted stating that payment or receipt is by way of check or a draft which is not an account payee, then it shall be deemed to be receipt or payment in cash. 44 ADA again an important amendment, 44 ADA is a presumptive taxation scheme applicable to professional people professing 11 notified profession, profession of accountancy, law, engineering, interior decoration, information technology, company secretary, representative, film artist, etc. Now here 44 ADA was applicable to all resident people, all resident including resident individual, resident in HUF, company, partnership firm, LLP, everyone, all residents, but carrying on 11 notified profession. Now amendment has been carried out to make it at par with 44 AD but a minute change that now this section will be applicable only to resident individuals and resident partnership firms other than LLP. That is it, it will not apply to anybody else. That means up till last year it was applicable to resident HUF also, resident company also, resident LLP also, 
these three people will no more be eligible for 44 ADA benefit even if they are carrying on notified 11 notified professions given in rule 6F. Any which ways, this is an important amendment applicable retrospectively from last year. All amendments are from last year for PGBP as I already clarified at the beginning. Okay, so now what will happen is, what is the difference between 44 AD and ADA? Now difference between 44 AD ADA is that 44 AD is also for resident people. The resident, it is applicable to resident individual, HUF and partnership firm other than LLP, other than LLP, other than LLP, but they should be resident, resident. So, I would put it this way, 44 AD is applicable to individual HUF and partnership firm all three, but 44 ADA has a lesser coverage is applicable only to individuals and partnership firms other than LLP, not applicable to HUF. This is also if you make comparison between these two sections. Okay, 44 AD is a bit important, 44 DB is unimportant, 44 DB talks about business reorganization of cooperative banks. Normally, there is an amalgamation or there could be demerger, but amalgamation demerger terms, these two terminologies are restricted to companies. There can be amalgamation of only companies or demerger of companies. But few years back, not few years back, quite a few many years back, government recognized amalgamation and demerger of two cooperative banks also. And whatever are the tax benefits available on amalgamation and demerger of companies, same tax benefits were given by government on amalgamation demerger of cooperative banks also. However, since they, they are not called as amalgamation demerger, instead of calling it as amalgamation demerger of cooperative bank, it was called as business reorganization, whereby some tax benefits of predecessor cooperative bank would be handed over to successor cooperative bank. Now, the um, apart from amalgamation demerger, the business reorganization of cooperative banks will also include, shall include conversion of a primary cooperative bank into a banking company. Primary cooperative bank getting converted to banking company means from cooperative bank it becomes company instead of cooperative cooperative society it is now converted in the form of company. This will be regarded as business organization of cooperative banks and accordingly whatever benefits were available to primary cooperative bank will all be handed over to banking company. But it is not an important amendment from exam perspective. Capital gain chapter has got couple of amendments, some amendments are very big. Capital gain chapter has got two very big amendments, one is pertaining to slum sale and one pertaining to uh, transaction between partnership firm and the partner. Okay. So, the amendments pertaining to transactions between firm and the partner or AOP, BOI and their member, those provisions I have covered at the end of the sheet after covering the amendments of international taxation topics also towards the end of the chapter, end of the sheet. Reason being very simple that the amendments pertaining to capital gain chapter pertaining to transaction between firm and partner, they run into around 4-5 pages, 4.5 pages, they are very big. Therefore, I have segregated them, covered separately. Here we will discuss all remaining amendments pertaining to capital gain chapter. Very first is section 2 clause 14 sub clause C. This we already discussed, capital asset to now include units of ULIP unit link insurance policy provided exemption under 1010D is not available on such maturity of such ULIPs as per fourth and fifth provision. When is the fourth proviso to 1010D applicable? I mean when is the exemption under 1010D denied on ULIP if three conditions fulfilled? Number one, ULIPs are issued on or after 1st February 2021 that is the date of announcement of budget. Secondly, annual premium exceeds 2,50,000. 250000 at any time during the tenure of the policy and the policy matures otherwise than by way of death, otherwise by way of death of the policy holder. If three conditions are fulfilled, they are called high premium ULIP. Exemption will no more be available on the maturity proceeds under 1010D. If exemption is not available, then under which head it would be taxable? Taxability will arise. However, in the absence of clarification, up till now it was considered that it would be taxable under the head IFOS. And now it is clarified, it will no more be taxed under IFOs, it will be taxed under the head capital gain. Capital gain. So, capital assets definition has been amended and second amendment carried out is in introduction of 45 clause 1b. As per 45 1b, it will be taxable. So, I am drawing a connective connection line here. Two amendments are left out in between, I know that. So, number one, ULIP will be capital asset. 
provided exemption is denied as per fourth and fifth proviso to 1010D. Secondly, gain arising will be taxable under the capital gain. It will be taxable in the year of receipt, that means in the year of maturity. Receipt of maturity proceeds including bonus of unit link insurance plan will be regarded as transfer. Provided exemption under 1010D is not available due to 4th and 5th proviso. Secondly, what will be taxable will be the profit, profit arising due to same. Entire amount of maturity proceeds will not be taxable, only profit element will be taxable. How to compute profit that government was going to clarify by issuing notification. Instead of government, it has been, the procedure has been clarified by CBDT. We will come to that. Okay, profit arising due to the same will be taxable under the capital gain. Number two, it will be taxable in the year of receipt, that is in the year of maturity proceeds, receipt of maturity proceeds. Taxability manner, how to compute, because whether indexation will be allowed or not, when will it be called as long term, when will it be called as short term, everything is clarified by CBDT by issuing circular number two of 2022 dated 19th January 2022. You are neither required to remember the circular number nor are you expected to remember the date. CBDT clarified this from exam perspective. CBDT clarified this entire story in the form of 11 examples. I would strongly recommend that to have a better understanding you glance through these 11 examples. But the gist of it I have covered here. Number one, the maturity proceeds will be sale consideration. Maturity proceeds including bonus will be the sale consideration. And annual premiums paid or monthly premium or whatever, premiums paid till the date of maturity will be cost of acquisition and cost of improvement. Indexation will not be allowed, naturally for the reasons not difficult to understand. And such ULIP will be considered, okay, one more point, but before that, understand very clearly, how much will be the cost of acquisition, indexation not allowed, premiums paid till now will become cost of acquisition. I would strongly recommend you to glance through these 11 examples to have a proper understanding. Where one of the example talks about if there is a money back ULIP policy, ULIP is money back, money back means that tenure is 20 years. But the entire maturity proceeds are not going to be received in the 20th year. Maturity proceeds are going to be paid by insurance company in installment every 5-5 five, five years. 5th year, 11th year, 16th year and 21st year, insurance company is going to pay some amount. Then this 451 b will have to be applied at 4 different stages. Whenever there is a maturity proceeds received, whether it is received entirely in the 21st year or it is received partially in between under money back policy or whatever is the name of the policy, then how to compute that is also clarified, right. It is very simple, very easy to understand. Secondly, if you recollect while discussing 1010D at the beginning of this amendment, uh, beginning of the video, I had explained it to you that ULIP will be treated at par with units of equity oriented fund, units of equity oriented fund, EOF. But when will it be called as units of equity oriented fund? When are the units of mutual fund called as units of equity oriented fund? Units of mutual fund are called as equity oriented fund only if more than 65 percent of the proceeds available under the fund, available under that scheme is invested by mutual fund in listed shares of domestic company, invested in listed shares of domestic company, listed shares of domestic company. ULIP will be considered at, at par with units of EOF only if, only if here also insurance company invest more than 65 percent of the proceeds available under that scheme in listed equity shares of domestic company. Then only ULIP units will be called as EOF. If this condition is fulfilled, so I would write it in a different way, I would write it again, ULIP insurance company insurance company makes investment to the tune of more than 65 percent. Sometimes the limit is 90 percent, but I do not think so 90 percent while a limit will apply here, but let us keep it 65 percent. And in case if the amount invested in listed shares of domestic company is less than or equal to 65 percent, then what will happen? If the investment is 65, more than 65 percent, then ULIP will be treated at par with units of equity oriented fund, EOF. But if this condition is not fulfilled, then ULIP units will not be considered at par with units of equity oriented fund. If ULIP are considered at par with units of equity oriented fund, then what will happen is that period of holding to be called as long term, period of holding is more than 12 months, more than 12 months, then they will be called as long term capital asset 
if the period of holding is up to 12 months then it will be called as short term and again clarification inserted that if the units of ulip are considered as units of equity oriented fund because of more than 65 percent investment then the benefit of section triple one a benefit of triple one a and benefit of 112 a will be available however if investment by insurance company is less than 65 percent then units of ulip will not be considered at par with units of equity oriented fund and accordingly in order to be called as long term the period of holding has to be more than 36 months more than 36 months up to 36 months then it will be called as short term long term short term i hope you are understanding instead of 12 months and in this and in such situation if they are not considered at par with equity oriented units then triple one a and one one two a benefit will not be available these two will not be available i hope you are clear with this right okay so what is it such ulip will be considered as units of equity oriented fund unit if greater than 65 percent of the proceeds of the scheme are invested in listed equity shares of domestic companies okay but as far as eof for concern no equity oriented units equity oriented unit here more than 65 percent has to be invested on an average on an average we have to take annual average of the monthly averages of the investment but for ulip 65 percent condition is applicable all throughout the tenure of ulip and not only for not computed not on average basis for equity oriented fund unit 65 percent to be computed on average basis and here meaning thereby if it drops below 65 percent sometimes it is above 65 you average it out but in ulip it is not to be based on average average is not to be found out the investment should be more than 65 percent all throughout the tenure of the policy accordingly such ulip will be considered as long term if the period of holding is more than 12 months and triple one a one one two a benefit will be available however understand what i have written in bracket this is also important from example if, if the condition of 65 percent investment is not satisfied then ulip will not be considered as ulip units of equity oriented fund accordingly period of holding of 36 months will have to be taken into account and triple one a one one two a will not be available clear okay uh, now next is section 47 section 47 if you recollect which is a part of capital gain chapter stated that that 34 transactions will not be regarded as transfer one of them is distribution of asset by huf or transfer of asset by huf to its member asset transferred by way of gift gift will inheritance asset transferred by holding company to subsidiary subsidiary to holding amalgamating company to amalgamated demerge company to resulting company etc there were 34 transactions in this bandwagon government has introduced four more clauses from ay 20 to 23 onwards so resulting into total 38 transactions which will not be regarded as transfer and accordingly no capital gains tax one is section 47 out of four first two are 47 clause 7 ac and 47 clause 7 ad both are in connection with the same thing both of them are in connection with relocation of fund relocation of fund what is relocation of fund relocation of foreign fund so what is it let me explain it to you briefly what happens is this is very much similar to amalgamation amalgamation in case of amalgamation what happens is there is this amalgamating company amalgamating company there are two parties amalgamating company transfers its assets to amalgamated company amalgamated company then it will not be regarded as transfer as per section 47 clause 6a and accordingly there won't be any tax just like amalgamation of two companies there is something called relocation so what is relocation in relocation there are two funds this is with regards to investment fund mutual fund etc one is called original fund original fund and the new fund will be called as resultant fund resultant fund original fund resultant fund original fund is located outside india outside india in a country it is resident of foreign country such a country with which india has a dtaa now this original fund is setting up units in india or setting up its a separate fund in india original fund which is ideally fii earlier fii's were having branch in india instead of having branch government invited them that why are you setting up branch and paying higher tax if you if you are a foreign fund outside india if you set up a branch in india you will have to end up paying more amount of tax higher amount of tax rather you create a separate fund in india let the investment and investors be outside india only but the fund create a separate fund in india 
So now if original fund sets up resultant fund and transfers its assets, assets to India, assets to that resultant fund, resultant fund is the one which is located in India, in India and not only that it is located in India, it should be located in an IFSC, International Financial Service Centre. Then this particular transaction of transfer from original fund to resultant fund will not be regarded as transfer as per section 47 clause 7 AC. 47 clause 7 AC. Let me give you a better idea. What was happening was this is USA. In USA there is this fund which is called original fund. Original fund. This original fund from USA had investors also located in, in USA. These people are investors. Investor bolo, shareholder bolo. You can call them a shareholder also, unit holder also, interest holder also. Investors who are residents of USA, non-resident in India, investors of the original fund, both of them, investors and original fund, both are residents of USA. Instead of investor, here we will be using the word shareholder, unit holder or interest holder. This fund already had a presence in India. This fund had set up a branch in India. This is the branch. And you know pretty well branch is called as permanent establishment and from branch they were investing in India and whatever income the branch would earn they would have to pay tax. The government invited them, government said why are you paying 40% tax rather what you do is that the way you have the fund, original fund, close down this branch, whatever assets this branch has, close down this branch, government told them new strategy that you close down this branch, set up a separate fund totally separate fund in India, registered in India, that fund will be called as resultant fund. That fund will be called as resultant fund and transfer all your assets from your branch to resultant fund. And when you transfer from branch to resultant fund, is it technically on paper it is, branch does not have a separate identity of its own. Branch means original fund itself only, present in India. What is branch? Say JK Shah classes, Andheri branch, Boriwali branch, Mulun branch. The Mulun branch it does not have a separate identity, it is JKSC only, it is JKSHA classes, right. So same way here also, branch of original fund in India having assets in India cannot be considered as a separate entity, it is original fund. So when I say that branch will transfer assets to resultant fund, it is technically on paper original fund transferring Indian assets to resultant fund. Original fund is located outside India, non-resident. But assets are located in India, no? assets are in India, therefore gain arising to the non-resident from transfer of assets located in India would be ideally be deemed to be accruing in India as per section 9 subsection 1 clause 1. However, this will not be regarded as transfer if some conditions fulfill. So instead of amalgamating company transferring to amalgamated company, here original fund which is outside India, which is non-resident in India, I would say non-resident in India is transferring his assets through its branch in India, through his special purpose vehicle in India to resultant fund which is set up and registered in India in an IFSC. The government invited them that whatever benefits we were giving you, same benefits we will give to resultant fund also, tax concession, 10% tax rate, everything. But you close down your branch, set up another unit in IFSC, we will give you all the tax benefits. Okay, so actually there are two types of transactions which are not going to be charged to tax, 47 clause 7 AC that is asset transferred by original fund to resultant fund as a part of relocation. This will be, this entire scheme will not be called as amalgamation, this will be called as relocation. Relocation. Well, it is a very stupid terminology used by our government. I really feel sorry for them. What do you, what do you mean by relocation? So here they are saying assets transferred by original fund to resultant fund is relocation. This is not relocation. The dictionary meaning of relocation basically means totally one person is shifting, is changing his address, shifting from one place to another place. But the person remains the same. Person remains the same, the address is changed, location is changed, that is called relocation. So here technically what happens is original fund is not getting shut down. It is not original fund shifting from USA to India. They are not shifting from USA to India. It is just that they were having a branch in some place in India. From branch, they are shutting down the branch and converting themselves into resultant fund. This should be considered as conversion rather than relocation. Any which ways, it is government's choice. Now, the way in amalgamation, there are two parties involved or two types of people who transfer. One is amalgamating company itself and apart from that, there is shareholder of amalgamating company whose shares in the amalgamating company will stand cancelled 
and he will receive shares of amalgamated company exchange shares of this company are given away and shares of this company are received this technically should amount to transfer but in capital gain chapter this transaction also is exempt or this transaction is also not regarded as transfer so in section 47 with regards to amalgamation two types of people receive benefit number 1 the amalgamating company itself and number 2 its shareholder shareholder of amalgamating company so same kind of concept should be applied here also the answer is yes, applicable here also so here also original fund will have its unit holder also whose units in original fund may stand cancel or the value may reduce and they may be allotted with the units of resultant fund so original fund will get exemption under 47 clause 7 ac and unit holder will get exemption under 47 clause 7 ad 7 ac 7 ad ha huh? so let what is it let us understand ay 2223 both of them are applicable from any transfer in a relocation of capital assets by original fund transfer to the resulting fund will not be considered as transfer in the hands of original fund and for now some people might think that that sir the transferer here is original fund who is non resident in india if the original fund is non resident then what is the use of 47 clause 7 ac tax was not going to be levied otherwise also these people are non resident answer agreed these are non resident but understand the capital asset which are getting transferred from original fund to resultant fund those assets are located in india no assets are located in india then as per section 9 subsection 1 clause 1 capital gain arising on transfer of assets located in india was going to be taxable in india it deems to accrue or arise in india assets were located in india in the name of branch clear 47 clause 7 ad so that means what i mean to say is that that if somebody tells you that this is nonsense provision it was not going to be taxable otherwise also in india no that's a totally wrong understanding of the provision it was going to be taxable if 47 clause 7 ac was not there 47 clause 7 ad transfer now the benefit available to shareholder unit holder or interest holder we don't know what terminology is used in that country where the original fund is located there they may call it as shareholder they may use the word unit holder for describing investors or interest holder they are in the relocation of capital assets they are giving away shares units or interest in the original fund and in place of that they are receiving as a consideration they are receiving share unit or interest in the resultant fund there is an exchange it will not be regarded as transfer just like amalgamation now three things are clarified original fund resultant fund and relocation so let's start with relocation relocation means transfer of assets of either original fund original fund or transfer of assets by wholly owned spv special purpose vehicle of the original fund you can call it a branch of original fund either the assets are transferred by original fund or assets of wholly owned spv or wholly owned branch of original fund are transferred provided transfer takes place on or before 31st march 23 where consideration for such transfer is discharged in the form of share unit or interest in the resultant fund against the shares of original fund there is allotment of shares of resultant fund whether those shares are allotted to the shareholder unit holder interest holder of the original fund or they are allotted to original fund itself makes no difference clause 1 clause 2 these are not relevant from exam perspective this one you can cancel relocation means this one what is original fund what is resultant fund original fund means a fund established incorporated or registered outside india which collects funds from its members for investing in india for their benefit and fulfills following condition number 1 original fund is not resident in india number 2 it is resident of such a foreign country with which india has a dtaa or it is a notified country notified by central government most important is a first condition and a third condition fund and its activities are subject to applicable investor protection regulation as per the law of that country in which it is incorporated established or registered an important condition and last fulfills other prescribed condition nothing is prescribed yet so technically only first condition to be remembered that original fund should be non resident in india and at the max second condition it should be resident of treaty country or it should be resident of notified country resultant fund means fund established incorporated etc in india in the form of trust company llp and it is granted certificate of registration as category 1 category 2 or category 3 aif alternative investment fund and it is regulated by either of the two people regulated under sebi 
ऑल्टरनेटिव इन्वेस्टमेंट फंड रेगुलेशन सेबी ए आई एफ रेगुलेशन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व और इट इज रेगुलेटेड अंडर इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल सर्विस सेंटर ऑथोरिटी एक्ट टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन आई एफ एस सी ऑथोरिटी एक्ट टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन एंड इट इज लोकेटेड इन आई एफ एस सी करेक्ट नथिंग टू बी रिमेंबर जस्ट सिंपली रिमेंबर दैट सच काइंड ऑफ रीलोकेशन टेक्स प्लेस देन इट विल नॉट बी रिगार्डेड एज ट्रांसफर फॉर द ओरिजिनल फंड और एस पी वी ऑफ ऑरिजिनल फंड एज वेल एज इट विल नॉट बी रिगार्डेड एज ट्रांसफर फॉर द यूनिट होल्डर शेयर होल्डर और इंटरेस्ट होल्डर ऑफ द ऑरिजिनल फंड नाउ फोर्टी सेवन क्लॉज सेवन ए एंड क्लॉज सेवन ए एफ सेवन ए इज नॉट इंपॉर्टेंट एट ऑल बट इट्स इंट्रोड्यूस बोथ ऑफ दम आर इंट्रोड्यूस विद इफेक्ट फ्रॉम ए वाई ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी थ्री सेवन ए ई सेज दैट असेट ट्रांसफर्ड बाई इंडिया इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर फाइनेंस कंपनी लिमिटेड आई आई एफ सी एल इंडिया इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर फाइनेंस कंपनी लिमिटेड which is one of the public sector company to an institution as it transferred to an institution which is set up under an act of parliament and notified by central government established for financing the infrastructure development in india totally unimportant no question is expected in exam on this you can ignore it but i have covered it 47 clause 7 af you know pretty well that government has been disinvesting certain public sector companies like lic etc so this has been introduced in connection with notified public sector companies that asset transfer transfer of capital asset by one public sector company to either another notified public sector company or transfer to central government or state government one psu transferring to psu is transferring asset to either another notified psu notified psu or it is transferring to central government or state government then it will not be regarded as transfer now in connection with these four points introduced in capital gain chapter we have connected point applicable under the head ifos so capital gain is not at over capital gain chapters amendments are left out but i am jumping to ifos and finishing off that particular amendment of ifos so in ifos there are two amendments first is 56 subsection 2 clause 10 sub clause b that we are done with if you recollect in 56 subsection 2 clause 10 sub clause a money sub clause b immovable property and sub clause c movable property there were 20 exceptions that entire 56 sub section 2 clause 10 will not apply if the money immovable property or movable property is received on the occasion of money immovable and movable property received from relative received on the occasion of marriage received upon death of the donor or as per will inheritance of the donor contemplation of the death of the donor received from charitable trust or organization received from local authority etc there were 20 exceptions 20 in those 20 exceptions four more exceptions have been introduced four more exceptions have been added to the list which four exceptions that 56 subsection 2 clause 10 will not apply in case of those four transactions of section 47 which we just discussed 47 clause 7 ac and ad in connection with the relocation and 47 clause 7 ae and af that is transferred by india infrastructure limited and 47 clause 7 af is for public sector company to another notified public sector company these transactions will not be attracting section 56 subsection 2 clause 10 in the hands of recipient so with that ifos amendments there were only two both of them are over coming back to capital gain chapters amendments remaining amendments are still there so the next one is in 491 491 if you recollect it says whenever asset is received from previous owner asset is received free of cost that is without paying consideration then cost of acquisition of such asset under specific situations will be either cost to the previous owner or it will be equal to the cost of the previous asset in exchange of which current asset is received either cost to the previous owner or cost of the previous asset as the case may be in specific situation in this list they have added 491 will also apply now this concept will apply to these four types of transactions also which we just finished 47 clause 7 ac ad ae af that in relocation i am the shareholder of the original fund my original shares were acquired for 1 lakh dollars now those shares stand cancel and i am receiving shares in the uh, in the new fund resultant fund the so cost of acquisition of resultant funds shares will not be zero will be equal to cost of acquisition of previous asset that is cost of acquisition of shares of original fund slum sale slum sale major amendment has been made and it is very important from exam perspective and in fact institute has also kept one question on slum sale in may 2022's rtp these amendments are made by finance act 21 but applicable retrospectively from ay 21 22 what is slum sale you know pretty well transfer of the entire undertaking transfer of entire undertaking or entire division or entire unit 
for a lump sum amount without bifurcating the sale consideration amongst assets and liabilities. Say I am transferring my particular unit for 100 crore rupees and out of 100 crore how much is received for which asset bifurcation not to be made. Slum sale is defined in section 2 clause 42 c where some major amendment has been made. Up till AY 2021 in order to be called as slum sale it had to be transfer of the undertaking one or more undertaking as a result of sale and sale means asset is given money received asset given money received that combination was called as sale. So in order to be called as slum sale it necessarily transfer had to be by way of sale only. Now, now that was not the real intention of government so government changed the language now the transfer of unit or undertaking need not be by way of sale it could be by any means any means meaning thereby there could be exchange also asset given asset received with retrospective effect from AY 21-22 this is the first amendment. Obviously rest part is continued to remain same for a lump sum consideration without values being assigned or without bifurcating the sale consideration amongst assets liability. Another major amendment major 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 amendment has been made in section 50b which describes the procedure to calculate capital gain. If you recollect section 50b the undertaking will be called the undertaking which is transferred or the unit which is transferred will be called as long term if the period of holding is more than 36 months period of holding is up to 36 months then that gain will be gain or loss will be short term this is there then long term more than 36 months long term up to 36 months short term secondly indexation benefit not allowed even if it is long term indexation not allowed and the computation methodology was described this way sale consideration assuming net of expenditure sale consideration I would say net sale consideration net sale consideration minus that is gross sale consideration minus transfer expense that will give you net minus cost of acquisition and cost of improvement but there is a clarification that cost of acquisition and improvement shall not be actual cost of acquisition improvement it shall be equal to the net worth of the undertaking transfer net worth of the undertaking transfer and net worth used to mean net worth would mean assets minus liabilities of the undertaking which is transferred asset minus liability that will give you net worth net worth is to be subtracted from this and then balance what you get will be your long term capital gain or short term capital gain or long term capital loss or short term capital loss as the case may be capital gain or loss long term short term as the case may be. So what all changes have been made so two major changes have been made one major change that has been made is in a definition of uh, 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 slum sale that we already discussed. Now, two more amendments have been made number one up till now what was to be taken into account was sale consideration sale consideration had to be actual actual sale consideration now it shall no more be actual sale consideration sale consideration will be higher of the following two will be higher of following two number one FMV1 fair market value 1 FMV1 and number two FMV2 FMV1 and FMV2 and these two FMV what are these I will tell you second amendment that has been made is that that the definition of net worth remains same assets minus liability assets to be computed as per income tax act as per income tax act income tax act and liability to be computed as per books of account liability as per books of account that remains same the only small change that has been made in the definition of asset is that that in case of self generated goodwill if the goodwill is self generated then the cost of acquisition of that goodwill whether it is of business or profession cost of acquisition will be considered to be nil cost of acquisition of while computing net worth we need assets minus liability assets to be valued as per income tax act and now cost of acquisition of self generated goodwill if it is a purchase goodwill then whatever is the amount paid to purchase and if it is received from previous owner free of cost then cost to the previous owner that will remain same but if it is self generated goodwill then cost of acquisition to be taken into account will be nil that is one amendment and second amendment is made in the definition of sale consideration it shall be higher of the following two and these two FMV to be computed as per rule 11 UA UAE rule 11 UAE FMV1 means what FMV2 means what whichever is higher will become sale consideration FMV1 means FMV of assets given FMV of the assets of undertaking of the undertaking of the assets of the undertaking of the undertaking transferred 
an FMV2 means FMV of the assets received, FMV of the things received, received. Simple language, FMV1 would mean FMV of the assets which are outgoing, given away, that is assets of the undertaking transfer and FMV2 would mean the FMV of the assets which are received or FMV including money received, money. Again, the valuation is to be done as per rule 11 UAE. In rule 11 UAE, many teachers have not covered in the regular lecture, but I have covered in the regular lecture also and I am going to teach you here also. So, please understand that is the most important. The three amendments, first amendment is in section 2 clause 42 C, that is ordinary amendment. Second amendment is in a meaning of net worth, self generated goodwill cost will be nil if it is self generated, whether it is goodwill or business or profession. And the third major amendment that has been made is in the meaning of sale consideration. Sale consideration will no more be the actual sale consideration, it will be FMV. Now what happened was, up till now everything was fine, but then many people were ignoring if the slum sale is by way of exchange, by way of exchange. So in exchange, people were transferring assets, land, building, etc. for a value much lower than stamp duty value and were completely, you know, uh, absconding from the applicability of section 50C, 50C. So now to cover up that, government has introduced all these things. You know, some people do tax ka chori and all other people have to suffer by studying these provisions. Okay. So, cost of acquisition of self-generated goodwill will be nil as per explanation number so and so. And secondly, sale consideration will no more be actual, will be equal to a higher of FMB 1 and 2 to be determined as per rule 11 UA. Rule 11 UAE sub rule 2 is for FMB 1 and sub rule 3 is for FMB 2. FMB 1, FMB 1 will be A plus B plus C plus D minus L. Now A, B, C, D, first 4 are 4 different types of assets, 4 different types of assets. Of course, we have to consider FMB only, but how the FMB, which FMB, so at some places it is FMB as per rule 11 UA some places it is FMV as per registered values report and at some place it is stamp duty value. So, four different types of assets are there and minus L. What is L? L means liabilities, liabilities and not what you were thinking about, what your dirty mind was thinking about, right? So, please focus on studies, okay. So, what I am doing is we will discuss ABCD, meaning of ABCD. So, I am starting with B, I am starting with B because A is the residuary assets, all other assets other than those which are covered by BCD. So, B is the jewellery and artistic work, jewellery and artistic work we have to take FMB. Next is shares and securities that is point C, again we have to take FMB only. So, shares, securities, jewellery and artistic work we have to take FMB. The question is what is the difference between B and C, both are same only. Answer, there is a minute difference, difference is that for shares and securities we have to take FMB as per rule 11 UA. But for jewellery and artistic work, though we have to take FMV, the FMV has to be as per valuation report of registered valuer. Shares and securities not to be valued by registered valuer, the jewellery and artistic work to be valued by registered valuer. And D point, D point, if it is immovable property, land building, land plus building, then we have to take stamp duty value. So, these are the three different types of assets of which jewellery and uh, artistic work FMB as per registered values report, shares and securities again FMB but as per rule 11 UA, immovable property, stamp duty value. Barring these 5 assets, all other assets, all other assets other than jewellery, artistic work, shares, securities and immovable property, barring that you take, for all other assets we will have to take book value. Book value becomes the FMB as appearing in the books of accounts of the undertaking. Okay. However, the following amounts which relate to such undertaking or division shall be excluded from the amount of value of other assets. Which two things? Number one, this is unimportant, so I am still discussing with you, but you do not need to focus upon it. Number one, income tax paid minus income tax refund. Income tax paid minus income tax refund claim if any. Okay, that excess, simply excess tax paid over and above what was payable. Okay, that will not be considered as asset. And number two, unamortized amount of deferred expenditure. In accountancy language, we call it as deferred revenue expenditure to the extent not written off. Deferred revenue expenditure to the extent not written off appears on the asset side of the balance sheet. You know about it. That is not to be considered as asset and accordingly that you remove. Okay. So, three types of assets, four types of assets, ideally you have to take FMB. 
oh, what comes up in the exam, in exam they will always give you only two types of asset. They will not give you jewelry, artistic work, shares, security, all these things are never given. What is given are only two things, immovable property of the undertaking transfer, immovable property and some plant machinery that is depreciable asset. So depreciable asset where will it fall and land where will it fall? Land will fall under point number D, stamp duty value we have to take here and depreciable asset will fall under point A, other assets for which you have to take book value that is WDV, WDV but WDV as per income tax act, it will be very simple, clear? Okay. Then we have one question in May 22 RTP which I will be solving after this video is over in the next video that will be recorded separately and shown to you. Okay, that will also be uploaded here and L means book value of liability. For liability we have to take book value as per books of accounts only. However, liability will not include following 6. Following 6 will not be considered as liability. Number 1 paid up share capital in respect of equity shares. Why paid up share capital not to be considered as liability? Why it is to be removed from the total of liability? For a reason that paid up equity share capital is owner's capital. It is not an outside liability. It is owner's capital. It is not the liability payable to outsider. Therefore, it is not to be considered as liability. Similarly, reserves and surplus also will not be considered as outside liability. It is the amount payable to shareholder, owner. Therefore, it is not a liability. Number two, amount set apart for payment of dividend on equity shares as well as on preference shares provided such dividends have not been declared as on the date or before the date of transfer of undertaking or division. Means whatever dividends are already declared, that's your genuine liability that you are, you are liable to pay to shareholder. But whatever dividends have not yet been declared, have not been declared a day prior to the transfer of undertaking, a day prior to slum sale that cannot be considered as your actual liability. It is not a liability which is created till now. Therefore, you exclude it. Third is over. Fourth one. Fourth one is nonsense. Excess provision for taxation. Excess provision for taxation other than income tax paid minus income tax refund claim. To the extent such provision is over and above, over and above the tax payable on book profit under any law. Simple language it is excess provision for income tax over the book profit tax. This is unimportant point. Provision for unascertained liability and last is contingent liability. Now these two are on the same lines. Contingent liabilities or unascertained liabilities are those liabilities which you have estimated as an assessee but which are not actually payable as of now, which have not materialized, which have not been concretized other than arrears of dividend on cumulative preference shares. So six things not to be considered as liability. Primarily from exam perspective you need to remember share capital. Reserves and surplus, these two items and any unascertained liability, these three items. Okay. What is FMV2? Achha, now after finishing this explanation of FMV1 and FMV2, remember questions have come uh, in the RTP based on this FMV1, FMV2 calculation. What some teachers have done, they have just told the students that there is a concept of FMV1, FMV2, uh, whichever is higher is to be taken into account and uh, FMV1, FMV2 will be given in the question. No, this is totally misguiding students. Please don't fall trap of these people. Don't fall, don't get victimized of tactics of these teachers. FMV1, FMV2 is asked in the exam. So you need to do it. FMV2, what is FMV2? FMV2 means FMV of the assets which are received, things which are received. It will be E plus F plus G plus H, E, F, G, H, four types of things. Number E is very simple. It is a monetary consideration. Money actually received. Now this is this has its own monetary value, therefore this is not required to be valued. Received or accruing as a result of transfer, this is not required to be valued. It has its own value. F, G and H. Let me start and finish with H. H point is stamp duty value of immovable property. For immovable property, here in FMV1 also it was stamp duty value of immovable property this point. But here it was that immovable property which is given away. And in FMV2, we are talking about immobile property which is received in exchange. For that also you take FMV, okay, stamp duty value. Stamp duty value of immobile property received or accruing as a result of transfer. In case the non-monetary consideration is represented in the form of immobile property. Okay. And F and G, these two points, you have to take FMV, FMV. But FMV, just like FMV1, here you have to take FMV of those assets that is non-monetary consideration of those assets 
which are in the form of property referred to in rule 11 ua sub rule 1 so you are receiving some asset which is covered by rule 11 ua then fmv to be determined as per rule 11 ua sub rule 1 and next point g point is fmv based on registers value report of non monetary consideration being movable property which is not referred to or not covered by rule 11 ua 1 so f and g both are same only only thing is g point covers those assets which are not covered by rule 11 ua and f point covers those assets which are covered by rule 11 ua so whatever assets are covered by rule 11 ua find out fmv as per rule 11 ua and whatever assets are not covered by rule 11 ua again you take fmv but based on register values report that is the only difference fmv or stamp duty value both should be as on as on the date of slum sale and not as on the date of actual transfer as on the date of slum sale so slum sale is taking place on 1st april but the assets are actually transferred on 15th april there is a 15 days of delay in actually in actual transfer then we have to take a stamp, a stamp duty value or fmv as on 1st april then for this slightly difficult to remember fmv1 fmv2 so what i have done is i have summarized them whatever is relevant from exam perspective fmv1 means fmv of assets given away jewelry and artistic work take fmv as per registered values report shares and securities again take fmv as per rule 11 ua immovable property takes stamp duty value all other assets take book value book value as per books of accounts but two assets not to be considered income tax paid minus income tax refund claim and number two unamortized expenditure unamortized deferred expenditure this is okay a and b basically you need to remember for which assets you have to take what this is simple but this is fmv of assets given fmv of assets given away given away okay and now for liability less l l means liability liability means liability book value of liability as per books of account other than following six paid up equity share capital amount set apart for dividends which are not yet been declared reserves and surplus contingent liability and unascertain liability excess provision of income tax is unimportant that never comes in exam now fmv2 summary form fmv2 if it is monetary consideration valuation is not required this point is covered as point number e then f g and h what is h immovable property takes stamp duty value property referred to in rule 11 ua1 property not referred to in rule 11 ua1 if it is referred to in rule 11 ua1 take fmv as per rule 11 ua and if it is not referred to in rule 11 ua1 then take again fmv but based on valuation report of register value very simple so fmv1 and fmv2 the calculation methodology is ideally more or less same only only difference is fmv1 is assets given fmv2 is incoming assets clear about this this is very important from exam perspective please do it thoroughly rtp when we pick up we'll be solving one question 54 gb is the next section 54 gb if you recollect nine types of exemptions available under the ed capital gain chapter section 54 to 54 gb 54 gb says individual huf transferring residential house property and investing in the shares of new company eligible company then exemption is available the last date to transfer the residential house property plus land upper tenant day to the last date to transfer was 31st march 21 which is now extended by one year to 31st march 22 nothing great 55 subsection 2 clause a this is slightly important keep it in your mind 55 subsection 2 clause 8 defined the cost of acquisition of intangible asset however while discussing the cost of acquisition of intangible asset this section or this clause covered only some specific intangible assets this section is an exclusive section it does not say intangible asset being so and so so and so so and so etc it does not say etc means whatever assets are given intangible assets this is an exclusive list it talked about cost of acquisition of intangible assets like copyright trademark franchisee loom hours uh, stage carriage permit and goodwill of business it talked about goodwill of business that for these intangible assets the cost of acquisition will be governed by sub clause 1 2 and sub clause 3 section 55 subsection 2 clause a sub clause 1 sub clause 2 sub clause 3 if these intangible assets which are covered here are acquired from previous owner acquired from previous owner by paying consideration then cost of acquisition will be equal to consideration paid 
but if acquired from previous owner without paying consideration then cost of acquisition will be equal to cost to the previous owner acquired by paying consideration then whatever consideration is paid acquired without paying consideration then cost to the previous owner but if it is self generated then cost of acquisition will be nil however whatever is stated here was applicable on goodwill of business goodwill of business it never covered goodwill of profession so for goodwill of profession we had supreme court decision of uh, bc shrinivasa setty i have covered here cit versus bc shrinivasa setty 1980 whereby supreme court stated that that, that this particular clause 55 subsection to clause a is an exclusive clause which does not talk about goodwill of profession therefore cost of acquisition of goodwill of profession cannot be ascertained therefore entire computational methodology will fail therefore if you are transferring goodwill of profession then capital gain will not be there at all no tax no capital gain according to supreme court in 1980 however this supreme court decision will stand slightly negative to the extent now this 55 subsection 2 clause a has been amended amendment is highlighted in bold italics rest all is the background of this section has been amended but retrospectively from last year to include goodwill of profession also apart from goodwill of business whose cost of acquisition will be same as given in sub clause 1 2 and 3 as stated above however because of this amendment the about goodwill of profession supreme court decision will will no more be applicable no more hold good with regards to goodwill of profession however supreme court decision is still applicable this decision bc shrinivas society will continue to apply for those intangible assets which are still not covered by 55 subsection 2 clause a that is for example tdr transferable development rights 55 subsection 2 clause a still does not cover couple of intangible assets for all those couple of intangible assets supreme court decision of bc shrinivas society will continue to apply and accordingly there won't be any capital gains tax on transfer of such intangible assets next is 55 subsection 2 clause a proviso proviso states that that for intangible asset being goodwill whether of business or profession cost of acquisition will be this way either nil if self generated or cost to previous owner or the actual consideration however if goodwill is the one on which depreciation was claimed up to 31st march 2020 earlier depreciation was allowed but today only in this video we discuss while discussing pgbp chapter related amendments we discuss that depreciation is no more allowed on goodwill of business or profession so now there is a clarification that once upon a time depreciation was allowable now it is no more allowed but in case if assessee has already claimed depreciation in past on the value of goodwill whether of business or profession then the cost of acquisition will be same as wdv as on 31st march 2020 and will not be equal to actual cost of acquisition so it was originally acquired for 100 lakh today the wdv as on 31st march 20 wdv is 40 lakhs then cost of acquisition will be 40 lakhs and not 100 lakhs the original cost of acquisition clear depreciation is no more allowed on goodwill of business profession on or after 1st april 20 last year on was depreciation is no more 454 section 9b and 48 clause 3 this i have covered at the end of the sheet due to its voluminous size it's very big runs into one this single amendment runs into four five pages four five sides therefore i have covered separately right with that capital gain related amendments come to an end ifos is already done by us there were two amendments that is done now set of carry forward and chapter 6 set of carry forward mein 72a sub section 1 if you recollect section 72a before that if you recollect while discussing that chapter we had discussed that according to section 78 sub section 1 and 2 losses and on a losses of one person can be carried forward by that person only if i have suffered a loss in business or any loss i only can carry forward somebody else cannot carry forward to this general rule there are few exceptions amalgamation de merger conversion from partnership firm to company sole proprietorship to company company to llp etc so if there is amalgamation of two companies amalgamation of two companies then the losses of amalgamated uh, amalgamating company will be allowed to be carried forward and set off to the amalgamated company with fresh 8 years period non speculative business loss we know about it right however this benefit is available given in 72a subsection 1 which are all exception to 78 1 
78.1 says one person's loss other cannot carry forward. But 72A1 says that amalgamating company's loss can be carried forward and set off by amalgamated company subject to fulfillment of conditions. Some conditions to be fulfilled by amalgamating company, some conditions by amalgamated company. One of the condition is that in 72A1 that amalgamation should be of any of the following three types given in clause A, clause B, clause C to section 72A1. Clause A says that amalgamation should be between company owning industrial undertaking or a ship or a hotel with another company or clause B says that there should be amalgamation of a uh, banking institution with uh, banking company and clause C says that there should be amalgamation of uh, public sector company engaged in operation of aircraft with another public sector company engaged in similar business. Now the language which is used in 72A subsection 1 clause C, clause C has been changed. Earlier it was there should be amalgamation of one or more public sector company engaged in business of operating aircraft that is Indian Airlines with one or more public sector company engaged in a similar business that is Air India. Airline, uh, Indian Airlines was getting amalgamated with Air India. Now the wordings, the type of business which they should have been engaged in business of operating aircraft is removed. Simply there should be amalgamation of one public sector company with another public sector company. Very simple amendment 79 2. 79 subsection 1 and 79 subsection 2 are applicable for private companies, but we do not call them as private companies, we call them as instead of private companies, we call them as company in which public are substantially interested. Private company can carry forward its losses and set off only if 51 percent share holding continues in terms of in terms of number of shares. 51 percent share holding should continue means there can be change in the share holding up to maximum 49 percent. 51 percent has to be preserved from which date to which date. So, 51 percent share holding shall continue from the date on which the law from the last date of the year in which the losses were incurred till the date on which the losses are set off or carried forward as the case may be. Last day 31st March of the year in which losses are suffered versus 31st March of the year in which losses are set off or losses are carried forward between these two 31st March 51 percent shareholders shall continue then only losses are allowed to be carried forward. In this condition of 51 percent there are some 4 5 exceptions, 4 exceptions were there, fifth exception has been introduced newly by virtue of clause E. 51 percent shareholding carrying voting rights has to continue. To this condition there were 4 exceptions given in the form of clause A, B, C, D given in section 79.2. One of the exception was transfer of shares due to death of the shareholder. Another one was transfer due to gift by shareholder to his relative, etc. One of them was amalgamation of foreign, foreign holding company. One more exception has been introduced that nothing contained in the 79.1 that means 51 percent continuation of shareholding condition will not apply to any change in the shareholding taking place on account of relocation referred to in 47 clause 7 AC and AD. What is relocation? We have already discussed original fund transferring to resultant fund assets in India. So, with regards to this 47 clause 7 AC and AD, we discuss them in capital gain chapter also 47 clause 7 AC AD. Capital gain chapter, then we discuss them while discussing 56 subsection 2 clause 10 as an exception it is introduced in IFOS chapter and now in section 79.2 also it is introduced. Okay. Now pertaining to chapter 6a, amendments pertaining to chapter 6a. Amendments pertaining to capital gain, capital gain chapter some of them are left out which we will be discussing section 9b which we will discuss towards the end after finishing this. Chapter 6a deduction first is ATEEA, ATEEA was introduced couple of years back only whereby housing loan is taken for the first time buyer, a buyer who did not have his own house earlier in his own name, he is buying the house for the first time, residential house, first time buyer taking loan from bank or financial institution, interest on such housing loan will be allowed as a deduction under chapter 6a up to 150,000, up to 150,000 is allowed as interest on housing loan, right. Okay. Now, there was a condition that this deduction would be allowed only if the loan has been sanctioned 
between by financial institution between 1st April 19 to 31st March 21. Now the deadline of 31st March 21 has been extended by one year. Now the loan should have been sanctioned up to 31st March 22. Similar amendment is carried out in ATIAC. ATIAC is for eligible startup business. If you recollect, eligible startup business nowadays many people are setting up startup business. There is a TV show also on Sony TV called Shark Tank based on this new startups. Many people have uh, ventured out with startups and government is also very positive. Government is encouraging people. So, government has given deduction under ATIAC to those people who set up a new eligible startup and take permission, not permission, but a certificate from IMBC that is Interministerial Board of Certification. Now, in uh, now this deduction which is 100 percent of eligible profit from eligible business, 100 percent profit is allowed to be deducted in any three consecutive years out of first 10 years, agreed, right. However, there is a condition that turnover should not exceed so and so, so and so plus new business should have commenced that is eligible startup business should have commenced between 1st April 16 to 31st March 21. Now, the deadline has been extended by one year, deadline extended to 31st March 22. ATIBA again has similar kind of amendment, ATIBA is 100% deduction of profit from developing and building housing project, developing business of developing and building housing project. One of the condition for claiming this 100% deduction was that, that the housing project plan, that the project should have been approved by competent authority, that means should be approved by municipality at any time between 1st April 16 to 31st March 21. The deadline for taking approval of competent authority for the plan or the project approval date has been extended by one year 31st March 22. If you observe ATEEA, ATIAC, ATIBA, three places the deadline has been extended by one year. One more amendment has taken place, there are two amendments in ATIBA, one is deadline is extended for taking approval and secondly up till now deduction was allowed only for one type of business, which business? Business of developing and building housing project. Now, apart from developing and building housing project, one more business is notified which would be eligible for this 100 percent deduction that business is business or rental housing, rental housing project. Apart from developing and building housing project, business of rental housing project. However, this is unimportant from exam point of view for May 22 attempt for sure because what is rental housing project that has not been clarified. It says it means a project which is notified by central government in the official gazette on or before 31st March 22, on or before 31st March 2022. Today is 24th, 25th March, I am recording this lecture 25th March 2022 and government has not yet notified, deadline is 31st March 22 plus fulfills other condition. I am sure government will extend this deadline and notify it next year only. As of now nothing is notified therefore in May 22 attempt definitely question will not come based on rental housing project but just keep it in your mind. ATLA is the next section, ATLA is a deduction allowable, first 5 years 100 percent, next 5 years 50 percent and plus there is one more combination also. Three types of businesses are eligible or three types of incomes were eligible under ATLA. Basically for a deduction allowable to and this deduction is allowed even if somebody, even if the associate has opted for section 115B AA or 115B AB or 115B AC, BAD, etc. Okay. Now, this ATLA, three types of incomes were deductible. Number one, profit of offshore banking unit, profits of offshore banking unit of scheduled bank or foreign bank, profits from offshore banking unit located in SEZ or profit from another branch dealing with unit in SEZ or income of unit of IFSE, International Financial Service Center. One more item has been added which is relating to 10.4.F which we had discussed in the, at the beginning of this chapter. But however, this is something really nonsense, I do not think so question will be asked. One more income, fourth income has been made eligible, income from transfer of an aircraft or aircraft engine, income from transfer, meaning whereby this ideally would be capital gain income. Well, government should not have included this particular income here in ATLA, rather they should have included it in capital gain chapter somewhere in the form of one more clause to section 47. Transfer of an aircraft or aircraft engine including helicopter and helicopter engine by a unit who is transferring unit of an IFSC is transferring to anybody, transferring to anybody 
बट इट इज सच एन एयरक्राफ्ट और सच एन एयरक्राफ्ट इंजिन और सच ए हेलीकॉप्टर और हेलीकॉप्टर इंजिन विच वॉज लीज गिवन ऑन लीज बाई सच यूनिट इन आई एफ एस सी टू एनी डोमेस्टिक कंपनी इट इज सच एन एयरक्राफ्ट विच वॉज गिवन ऑन लीज टू एनी डोमेस्टिक कंपनी नाउ दैट एयरक्राफ्ट इज ट्रांसफर्ड बाय दैट यूनिट इन आई एफ एस सी टू एनी बडी टू एनी पर्सन प्रोवाइडेड सच यूनिट एज कमेंस्ड इट्स ऑपरेशन इन इंडिया ऑन और बिफोर थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर इन एन सर्विस सेंटर गुड अमाउंट ऑफ डेडलाइन प्रोवाइडेड परमिशन और रजिस्ट्रेशन अंडर इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल सर्विस सेंटर ऑथोरिटी एक्ट टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन हैज बिन ऑप्टेन एंड कॉपी ऑफ सच परमिशन इज अटैच विद आई टी रिटर्न दिस टोटली अन इम्पॉर्टेंट ऑल्सो रेफर टू टेन फो एफ न्यूली इंट्रोड्यूस बाई फाइनेंस एक्ट ट्वेंटी वन रेट्रोस्पेक्टिवली एप्लीकेबल फ्रॉम ए वाई ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी टू वॉट इज टेन फो एफ टेन फो एफ इज इनकम ऑफ नॉन रेसिडेंट नॉन रेसिडेंट हैज गिवन एयरक्राफ्ट इंक्लूडिंग एयरक्राफ्ट इंजिन और हेलीकॉप्टर और हेलीकॉप्टर इंजिन टू एयरक्राफ्ट इज गिवन ऑन लीज एयरक्राफ्ट इज गिवन ऑन लीज टू यूनिट ऑफ आई एफ एस सी आई एफ एस सी एंड दैट यूनिट ऑफ आई एफ एस सी गिवन दैट एयरक्राफ्ट ऑन लीज ऑन लीज टू एनी डोमेस्टिक कंपनी डोमेस्टिक कंपनी आई अंडरस्टैंड How stupid government has drafted this? This unit of IFSC would have been paying lease rent to this non-resident. Income of non-resident by way of royalty or interest received from IFSC unit would be exempt under 10.4F. And income of this unit of IFSC from transfer of this aircraft to anybody, which was given on lease to domestic company, now they are selling it off. that particular income which will be capital gain or business income whatever may be that income will be deductible under atla this kind of ridiculous it is any which ways amendments pertaining to inter ca topics are not at over some capital gain uh, chapters points are left out section 9b and 454 are left out amendments pertaining to topics of international taxation we are done with okay now on the next page after this we have section 454 section 9b 48 clause 3 and rule 8 ab this is quite complicated you need to understand you need to focus okay first of all 454 and 9b one by one we'll be discussing first i am discussing 9b 9b is not introduced as a part of capital gain chapter it is not introduced in capital gain chapter is ranging between section 45 the charging section till 55a so 9b do it is taxing capital gain but 9b is introduced separately because in 9b some part of the transaction could be capital gain income and some part covered here could be pgbp income therefore 9b is covered separately and not as a part of this chapter that's one thing secondly these sections are applicable in case of dealings between partnership firm including llp or aop boi and their partner so first of all whether it is section 9b or it is 454 for both of them for both these sections the transactions are uh, the, these two sections are applicable with regards to assets transferred by partnership firm firm transferring asset to partner firm transferring asset to partner then there is a clarification that firm includes llp also but this these two sections are applicable not only on firm or llp transferring to partner they are also applicable to aop bo Association of person body of individual transferring capital asset to their member. Member. So rather than you know using form LLP AOP BOI again and again, so these people are being given a name. These four people will be known by the name of specified entity. That's the first thing. Specified entity. Well, these provisions are quite complicated. Therefore, I'm going little slow. some of you might find me very slow some of you may find me fast some people are slow learners and some people are fast learners so i have to take care of everyone because you are not sitting in front of me so i can't find out whether you have understood it properly or not therefore i'm going at a particular medium pace these people partner or member of form aop llp etc these people will be called as specified person specified person so sections are applicable when specified entity transfers assets to specified person okay now these sections when are they applicable so first of all 
9b newly introduced but applicable from retrospective effect from ay 2120 specified entity means form aop boi including llp specified person means partner of form llp or member of aop boi and there is something or reconstitution reconstitution also acha let me clarify one small thing one more small thing that section 9b is applicable whenever there is this is applicable whenever there is a reconstitution of the form llp etc reconstitution or whenever there is a dissolution whenever there is a dissolution whereas section 454 is applicable 454 is applicable whenever there is or only when there is reconstitution okay so 454 is applicable only if there is a reconstitution and 9b is applicable whenever there is reconstitution or there is a dissolution reconstitution is common between both of them meaning that by whenever there is a reconstitution of specified entity both of them will get attracted both of them how and what will happen we will understand nirmala sitaraman ji has created lot of confusion lot of confusion cbdt is also confused we also get confused we can't expect our clients to understand all these provisions okay that's one thing so what is reconstitution the reconstitution is same as what we discussed in partnership firms chapter if you recollect either retirement or death of the existing partner or member or admission of a new partner retirement that means somebody is going out of the firm or somebody is coming inside the firm in such a way that at least one of the old partner continues to be the partner or one of the old member continues to be the member of aop boi or no one is leaving no one is joining afresh but there is a change in the respective share of all of them or some of them there is a profit sharing ratio change or loss sharing ratio change okay now now understand asset now section 9b we are discussing first let's finish off this and then there is a question in may 22 rtp based on this this is very important from exam perspective strongly expecting question whenever there is a transfer of capital asset or stock in trade capital asset or stock in trade is transferred or both of them are transferred by specified entity to the specified person form is trans simply out say in my language form is transferring to partner upon dissolution of the form or reconstitution of the form then form will be considered as having transferred that asset specified entity will be chargeable to tax form will be chargeable to tax on capital gain and pgbp as the case may be if the asset transfer is capital asset then it will be taxable under the at capital gain if stock in trade is transferred then it will be taxable under the at pgb as the case may be in accordance with the provisions of the act in whose hands will it be taxable so point number 1 to be understood will be taxable in hands of specified entity of course transferer is specified entity it will be taxable in the year in which asset or stock in trade or both is received by specified person very rarely it can happen that i am partnership firm you are a partner i am transferring it to you on 31st march 2022 i am transferring you on 31st march 22 financial year 21 22 you are receiving it on 1st april 22 then in my hands gains will be taxable at the time of receipt by you you received on 1st april 22 so i will be taxed in financial year 22 22 what will be the sale consideration so sale consideration will be equal to fmv which assets are transfer either capital asset or stock in trade so both of them we will consider fmv because here actual sale consideration is missing no i am partnership firm you are partner either there is a dissolution or there is a reconstitution reconstitution me you are leaving in dissolution everyone is leaving i am transferring something to you i am not going to receive money back for that therefore by default sale consideration is missing 9b is a deeming provision which says take fmv of capital asset or fmv of stock in trade or both as on the date of receipt of the same by specified person fmv as on which day fmv as on the date of receipt by partner clear differential amount will be capital gain or pgbp income very simple 9b is over 9b is over 9b is very simple but 454 is going to create some confusion and 48 clause 3 is going to create further more confusion so there are four things which which you are going to discuss simplest one was 9b that is done but remember in 9b some part will go under the pgbp gain pertaining to stock in trade 
for both the assets we have to take FMV to be the sale consideration. 45.4. Now 45.4 is applicable when there is reconstitution, only reconstitution means if there is a dissolution no, or only 9B will apply. If reconstitution of form is there or specified entity, 9B and 45.4 both will get attracted. Huh? I have covered this in a chart form in your notes, do not worry. Whenever there is a payment of money, now here which assets are transferred, money or capital asset or both. Section 9B applies in case of dissolution or reconstitution. Asset transferred is capital asset or stock in trade. And here what is happening? What is transferred by firm to partner? Money or capital asset or both. By specified entity to the specified person in connection with reconstitution of the specified entity. Then any profit or any gain arising therefrom will be chargeable to tax under this head in the hands of specified entity. Here also gain will be taxable in the hands of specified entity only and not in the hands of partner. Everything, both the sections are applicable to the firm, firm, LLP, AOP, BO. Taxable under the capital gain, taxable in hands of specified entity, taxable in the year in which money, capital, asset, etc. is received by partner. How to compute capital gain here? So first of all, before we jump to computational methodology, some of you might be getting confused. sir. 9B applies in case of reconstitution, 45.4 also applies in case of reconstitution. Here what is transferred is capital asset, I will write with a different colored pen. Here capital asset or stock in trade is transferred or stock in trade. And in 45.4 what is transferred is capital asset or money, capital asset or money. Meaning thereby, when will there be a clash between these two, both of them will get attracted. Both of them will get attracted only when there is number one reconstitution, which is common between the two. And as a result of reconstitution, asset transfer is capital asset. Then only both of them will be attracted together. If stock in trade is transferred, in case of reconstitution, only 9B will apply. Only dissolution takes place, only 9B will apply. Reconstitution takes place and only money is transferred, only 45.4 will apply. If there is a reconstitution and asset, capital asset is transferred, then only both of them will get attracted. Clear? Okay. Now, how to compute? Formula is given. A is equal to B plus C minus D. A is equal to B plus C minus D. A means capital gain. B means money received or amount of money paid by firm to partner. Money plus C means value of capital asset, FMV of capital asset as on the date of receipt by partner. Money, money has its own monetary value, it is not required to be value. If money is transferred then value of money, amount of money, capital asset is transferred then FMV, but everywhere here FMV has to be taken into account as on the date of receipt by specified person. In slum sale wala point, it had to be stamp duty value or FMV as on the date of transfer of undertaking. Here FMV or whatever is to be taken into account will be as on the date of receipt by the partner. Balance minus D, D means balance in the capital account in any form, balance in the capital account of the specified person. In any form means what? Any form means whether it is in a form of capital account, current account, floating capital, fixed capital account by whatever name you may call it. At the time of reconstitution of the specified entity, some wordings are missing here of the specified entity. It is due to alignment adjustment, some wordings are of the specified entity. Money plus FMV of asset minus capital account balance. Well, what is happening? If the answer of A above is negative, answer is negative, means your capital account balance is 35 lakhs and firm is giving you something worth 32 lakhs. You invested 35 lakhs, I am giving you something worth 32, so there is a loss of 3 lakh rupees. Loss of 3 lakh rupees. So, what will happen is, I am not giving you any money, money is 0, I am giving you asset worth 32 lakh and your capital account balance is 35 lakhs, then there will be a loss, negative 3 lakh. If it is a loss, it is to be ignored, it shall be deemed to be 0, ignore it, okay. Now complicated part has yet to come. Now some of you might be thinking that there would be, both the sections are applicable to the firm, that is specified entity, both the sections and in both of them there will be taxability in hands of firm. 
some of you might be thinking that sir technically here in 45.4, 45.4 the tax should be in the hands of partner. Partner is going to receive, say partner's capital account balance is 32 lakh and partner is receiving something from firm worth 40 lakh, then partner is gaining 8 lakh rupees, partner should be taxed, no. How can firm be taxed? But remember both the sections taxability will be in the hands of specified entity only, that is the first point to be understood, right. Second, when are these sections applicable? 9B applies whenever there is dissolution or reconstitution. And uh, when does 45.4 apply? 45.4 applies only in case of change in the constitution or reconstitution, I would call it as. Achha, the amount of gain will not be same. Some of you might be thinking that, sir, if, if there is reconstitution and the asset transfer is capital asset, then same capital asset, SSC partnership firm is paying tax twice, one under section 9B and second time under 45.4, answer no, there, there would not be any double taxation, both these amounts will be totally be different. In 9B what is happening is FMV of the asset, capital gain will be FMV of the asset minus, minus cost of acquisition or index cost of acquisition of the asset. Say, FMV is 80 lakhs, cost index cost of acquisition was 42 lakhs, 38 lakhs will be the capital gain under section 9B. Whereas under 45.4 what happens is amount will not be same, asset is same and the starting point is also same, we take FMV of the asset transfer, FMV of the asset which will be same 80 lakhs minus we do not subtract the cost of acquisition of the asset minus what we are subtracting is capital balance, capital account balance of the partner, of the partner or specified entity, which is suppose you need 32 lakhs, 32 lakhs. So here there will be gain of 48 lakhs, 38 lakhs, 48 lakhs. Are you understanding? So there are two different concepts. Huh? Both the gains will be taxed in the hands of firm only, uh, that is specified entity but the amount will be different. Technically, this is the gain of the firm. I am the firm, I acquired the asset for 42 lakh, I am giving it to you free of cost, FMB is 80 lakh, so this 38 lakh is technically my gain, I am paying it. But the gain which we will be calculating under 45.4 is actually not the gain of the firm, it is the gain of partner. Partner has received 48 lakhs above and over what he should have received, 48 lakhs more than his capital account balance but still both of them will be taxed in the hands of firm only, clear, okay. If answer of A is negative, ignore it. Proviso to 45.4, balance in capital account of the specified person, balance in the capital gain of capital account, whether fixed capital or floating capital, capital account balance should be without considering, without taking into account increase in the capital account due to revaluation of any asset or due to self generated goodwill or any other self generated asset. This is an important point, this proviso to 45.4, keep it in your mind, institute may ask a question and when I am when I'm telling you institute may ask a question, that means the chances are very high that institute may ask a question, okay. Of course, I am not almighty, it is not in my hand, okay. The balance in capital account which we are taking into account, capital account balance should be without considering two things, without considering which two things, without considering number two self generated asset, self generated asset, increase in the capital due to self generated asset and number one increase due to revaluation of any asset, revaluation of any asset to be ignored, self generated goodwill creation should also be ignored, increase in the capital account because of this, okay. Now, explanation 2 to section 45.4. So, explanation 2 to 45.4 talks about whatever we already discussed that if capital asset is transferred, only capital asset not money, in connection with reconstitution, only reconstitution not dissolution, then it is a combination of for reconstitution and transfer of capital asset by specified entity, then 45.4 will operate in addition to 9b, both of them will get attracted both of them will get attracted in addition to each other, okay. Secondly, it would be worth to know that I already explained it to you, the amount of capital gain would be different under 9b, different under 45.4.
here will be 38 lakhs, here 48 lakhs, amount would be different because calculation methodology is different. I hope you have understood this. It would be worth to note that amount taxable under 9B will be different than the amount taxable under 45.4, correct? Next is fourth point, in both the above cases, in case of 9B as well as 45.4, taxability arises in the hands of specifier entity only. Nothing will be taxable in hands of partner, nothing will be taxable in hands of specified person, okay? Then fifth point I am keeping pending, we will discuss later. If you observe this table given in six point, I have converted into a tabular form, partnership firm, only partnership firm I have covered here, but this table is applicable to LLP also, AOP also, BOI also, all of them are specified entity. Whenever there is a dissolution, only 9B will be applicable if you have understood, if you observe. But if there is a reconstitution, then 9B also gets operated and 45.4 also will be triggered. Meaning thereby, if 45.4 is applicable only in the case of reconstitution and 9B is applicable in case of reconstitution also and dissolution also. In 9B, what is getting transferred? Capital asset or stock in trade or both. And in 45.4, what is getting transferred is capital asset or money or both. Capital asset is common in both of them. So, what is common in both of them is reconstitution and transfer of capital asset. 9B, if capital asset is transferred, then how to compute capital gain? Full value of sale consideration will be equal to FMV of capital asset minus cost of acquisition or index cost of acquisition. Difference will be this. Cost of acquisition or index cost of acquisition we already have. Sale consideration was missing so in, because there is no actual sale consideration received by firm from the partner. So, we take FMV. Stock in trade also we have to do the same thing. The only thing is for stock in trade there cannot be indexation and the head of income under which it will be taxable will be PGV. Full value of sale consideration will be FMV of stock minus cost of the stock, differential amount will be business profit. 45.4, 45.4 applies only in case of reconstitution, reconstitution. In 45.4 what do you do is that full value of sale consideration will be equal to here two things are received or transferred by firm to partner, capital asset, money or both. So if it is money, money has its own value, value of money. We don't say FMV of money, value of money plus FMV of capital asset. Take the total minus cost of acquisition of the asset name, minus what? Minus balance in the capital account of the partner as on the date of reconstitution, whatever is the balance, whatever may be the nature of capital account. Capital account, fixed capital account, floating capital account, current account by whatever name you Difference will be long term or short term capital gain. Loss. If there is a loss, it is to be ignored as per proviso to 45.4. We already discussed. If it is a negative, the firm, the partner had to receive 35 lakhs from the firm. Capital account balance is 35 lakh. Firm has given him something worth 32 lakhs. So there will be loss, 3 lakhs. Loss to be ignored, make it zero. Okay. Now 48.3, but before we jump to 48.3, one very important thing, 45.4 is also done. But 45.4 and 9B both are attracted in the hands of specifier entity. Calculation methodology is different, understand it very carefully. When are they applicable? That also you need to remember. 9B applies in case of dissolution as well as reconstitution. 45.4 applies only in the case of reconstitution. In 9B, capital asset or stock in trade is transferred. In 45.4, capital asset or money is transferred. And nine, third point, in 9B, some income will go under the at PGBP, some income will go under the at capital gain. 45.4, it will be entirely under the capital gain. If it is negative, it is to be ignored under 45.4. It is to be made zero. Okay. Now, in 45.4, if this difference amount, this is negative, it is to be ignored. Loss, then ignore. Agreed. No problem. But what will be the characteristics of this differential amount? Long term or short term? What is the asset here? What are we subtracting? Which asset is getting transferred? So, it is FMV of the asset receipt minus balance in capital account. A capital account is technically not a capital asset. It is not a capital asset, but partner had invested 32 lakhs and he is receiving something worth 35 lakhs. He is receiving 3 lakh extra, so that 3 lakh should be taxable. Agreed, no problem. But what would be the status, long term or short term? So, he is a partner since past 3 years, more than 3 years than long term, less than 3 years than short term? No, cannot be done like that. So, now what will be the status of this particular capital gain is clarified in rule 8AB, which is very confusing, rule 8AB. 
government forgot to clarify government made a very big blunder and government's blunder is covered up by cbdt thank god there was cbdt otherwise government would have been in a very oh uh, you know such kind of position where government would not have been able to show its face to anybody i have a lot of respect for this government it's not that i'm against government please don't consider me as anti national or anti government is just that i'm pinpointing government's weak points or wrong points so that government can carry out necessary rectification i am concerned with this i am concerned with this subject that's the reason right if government makes a mistake here i have to face the consequences while teaching to students okay what will be the status will depend upon not the period for which the partner was a partner in the firm but will depend upon the status the period of holding of the remaining asset understand very clearly there is no double taxation happening now rule 8 ab clarifies that whatever gain we calculated as per 9b that is the real capital gain fmv of the asset minus cost of acquisition of that asset 38 lakh was a real capital gain taxable in hands of firm this is the gain on transfer of the given asset gain on the asset transfer asset transfer but the gain on the same asset calculated on the same asset by considering fmv of the same asset 80 lakhs the gain which is arising here this 48 lakh rupees of gain this gain whether long term or short term on the same asset we have taken same fmv 80 lakh 80 lakh but this gain is not because of transfer of that asset this is the gain or capital gain attributable to remaining assets this is the gain under 9b attributable to asset which is actually transferred and 454 wala gain is the gain attributable to attributable to the remaining assets which are left out with the firm after reconstitution remaining assets because when the reconstitution took place the partner retired one of the partner say you are the partner you retired you had to withdraw from the firm 32 lakhs as per your capital gain account as per your capital account so firm will have to as on the date of reconstitution as the as on the date of your retirement firm will have to carry out revaluation of all the assets all the assets firm had three asset asset 1 2 and 3 asset 1 2 and 3 all of them had a cost of acquisition of 10 lakh 10 lakh 10 lakh all of them are revalued all of them are revalued the new value as per registered values report is 40 lakhs 40 lakhs 40 lakhs 40 lakh 40 lakh 40 lakh by what amount they have been revalued what is the increase in the value increase in the value is 30 lakhs 30 lakhs 30 lakhs now you are retiring firm is giving you away this asset firm is giving you this asset this asset is given to you the gain arising on this asset would be calculated as per section 9b gain arising on this asset which is actually transferred by firm to you gain will be computed under 9b now there is a gain now when you are retiring you will ask for your share not only in this 30 lakhs pertaining to asset 1 you will ask for your share in the, these two 30 lakhs also remaining assets getting my point or not you have a right to demand for increase in the value of all the three your share in the increase in the value of all the three assets and not only in the increase in the value of that asset which is actually transferred to you right you have a right in all the three assets so asset which is actually transferred by firm to you calculate capital gain under 9b if any asset is sold to outsider say asset number 2 is sold to outsider sold to outsider then money would be received then calculate capital gain as per 451 regular provision the way we are calculating for other us the asset which is left out say asset number 3 is left out as on the date of reconstitution left out this asset which is left out which was increased by 30 lakh rupees 30 lakh rupees is unrealized gain this is not the gain actually realized because asset is just revalued not yet been sold or transferred then the asset which is left out after reconstitution the increase in the value will also be taxed in hands of firm by way of 454 so 454 what is getting taxed is the is the value or gain arising due to increase in the value of remaining assets which are left out with the firm getting this point 
9b and 45.4 both of them become applicable on the same asset on the same asset or in the same situation reconstitution then what happens is asset which is actually transferred by firm to partner 9b will apply assets which are left out 45.4 will be applicable this particular increase 30 lakh rupees will be taxed under 45.4. But then government says, government says this 30 lakh which is unrealized gain, unrealized gain which is taxed right now under 45.4, what if this asset is actually being sold, it was increased, the value was increased from 10 lakh to 40 lakh, 30 lakh was the gain, unrealized gain, should not have been taxable but as per 45.4 methodology we are paying tax on that, firm will have to pay tax. Now tomorrow when this asset is actually sold for 90 lakhs, when this asset, asset number 3 actually sold, asset 3 sold in future for 90 lakhs, actually sold, ignoring indexation, ignoring indexation. So what should happen? Sale consideration 90 lakhs, less cost of acquisition 10 lakhs, cost of acquisition is 10 lakhs, no? 10 lakhs. So, 80 lakhs should be taxed. But government says this is wrong. Out of that 80 lakh rupees of gain, out of that 80 lakh rupees of gain, ignoring indexation, 30 lakhs was already taxed under section 45.4. 30 was already taxed in the year of reconstitution, which was not realized, it was unrealized gain, but then also it was already being taxed. So, now that much lesser amount will have to be taxed. So, now what will happen is this 30 lakhs which was taxed under 45.4 at the time of reconstitution needs to be reduced. Reduced from where? It is to be reduced as per section 48 clause 3, 48 clause 3, reduce. Where to reduce from? One possibility is that we reduce from sale consideration, we will reduce 30 lakh from here. Another possible way is that we reduce it from the capital gain amount or another possible way is that we add it to the cost of acquisition cost becomes 40 lakhs, 3 possibilities are there. So, 48 clause 3 says that do not add to the cost of acquisition, do not reduce from capital gain, reduce it from the sale consideration. So, now when this asset number 3 is actually sold in future for 90 lakh rupees, now what will happen is sale consideration 90 lakhs minus as per section 48 clause 3, this 30 lakh which is already taxed under 45.4 already taxed at the time of reconstitution 45.4 this is to be reduced and the sale consideration to be taken into account will be 60 because out of 90 lakh 30 lakhs has already been taxed under 45.4 now only 60 lakhs left on minus cost of acquisition index cost of acquisition as the case may be 10 lakh 50 lakh should be taxed right now in future as capital gain 30 already taxed 50 should be taxed total capital gain 80 lakhs full 80 lakh will be taxed clear about this so, 48 clause 3, still some complicated part is yet to come, huh? have patience. Newly introduced by Finance Act 21, but applicable with retrospective effect, deduction from full value of sale consideration. Government has totally failed to clarify this, government, if you read the language, you will feel that what, what exactly is, you will not understand only anything. What has government written, understand, in case where money, capital asset, either of them is received by specified person that is partner from the specified entity that is firm referred to in 45.4. Referred to in 45.4 means received in connection with reconstitution of the specified entity. Money, capital asset or both in connection with reconstitution then that much part of the income of the specified entity which is already taxed under 45.4 that much part of the income of the specified entity under the capital gain which is already taxed under 45.4 and is attributable to capital asset. Now here government has gone wrong. Here they should have clarified attributable to remaining capital asset. Attributable to remaining capital asset. That is, so I have mentioned it in bracket that is attributable to the remaining capital assets which are left out with the specified entity after the said reconstitution. Calculated in a prescribed manner shall be deductible from full value of sale consideration. 30 lakh will be deductible from 90 lakhs of sale consideration of those remaining capital assets when they are sold or transferred in future. The language which is used by government is very confusing. I modified the language so that you can understand it. Okay. 
clear 48 clause 3 what is to be reduced. However, in our example, there was only one asset left out. Out of three assets, first asset was handed over to a retiring partner, second asset is sold in the open market, only third asset is left out. So, entire 30 lakh rupees of 45.4 capital gain under 45.4 pertains to this asset only. What if more than one asset is left? For example, asset 1, asset 2, asset 3. Original cost of acquisition is 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 30 lakhs. All three of them are revalued. FMV as per values report is 40 lakhs, 40 lakhs, 40 lakhs. What is the value of increase? Increase by what amount? Increase by what amount? This is increased by 30. 10 becomes 40 to increase by 30. 20 becomes 40 that means increase by 20. 30 becomes 40 that means increase by 10. This asset is handed over by firm to partner. So, this 30 lakh of increase is already con considered, already taxed under 45.4. 45.4. This is gone. This asset is gone. Two assets are left out. Two assets left out. The gain arising on transfer of this asset, actual gain is already taxed under 9b, must have been 30 lakh. And now, something is getting taxed under 45.4 also, but what is getting taxed under 45.4, suppose any amount getting taxed under 45.4 is hypothetically, uh, suppose in the, it is 36 lakhs. 36 lakhs was taxed under 45.4. So, now, government says, this 36 lakhs is not pertaining to this asset. 9B capital gain was 30 lakh, 30 lakh pertains to this asset, asset actually transferred. And 36 lakhs which calculated, which is calculated under 9B, this is not attributable to this asset, this is attributable to asset number 2 and asset number 3. And now this 36 lakhs will have to be bifurcated amongst asset number 2 and asset number 3. Asset 2 asset 3. How to bifurcate? It is to be bifurcated in the ratio of increase in their value. Bifurcated in the ratio of increase in their value. What is the ratio of increase in their value? Asset 2 and asset 3 increase in the value increase by 20 lakh and 10 lakh. Ratio is 2 is to 1. 2 is to 1. So, now 36 lakhs out of 36 lakhs of capital gain taxed under section 45.4 will be a portion amongst these two, 24 lakh will be pertaining to asset 2 and 12 lakh will be pertaining to asset number 3. Getting this clear? Okay. Now, what to do is that, why am I discussing so much? The reason is that the amount taxed under 45.4, 36 lakhs, we were discussing that what will be the status of this 36 lakhs, long term or short term? 36 lakhs is the amount of difference under 45.4. Amount of difference is 36 lakhs. Long term or short term? How to decide? So, long term, short term depends upon the period of holding of the asset transferred. So, which asset is transferred here? So, here actually there is no asset transferred. The, what we subtracted was the capital account balance, which is not an asset. So, 36 lakhs under 45.4 out of that the status of 36 lakh will depend upon period of holding of these two assets as on the date of reconstitution. As on the date of reconstitution, asset number 2 was long term and asset number 3 was short term, long term and short term. Then in such situation, 24 lakh that is gain pertaining to asset 2 will be long term capital gain and 12 lakhs gain pertaining to proportionate capital gain pertaining to asset 3 will be short term capital gain. Isn't it complicated? This is nothing still further yet to come. Wait, 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 wait for the time being. Complicated part is yet to come. That was 48 clause 3. 9b is simple, 45.4 is also simple. But in 45.4, what will be the status of capital gain? That will depend upon what is the status of remaining assets. Okay, also refer to rule 8AA sub rule 5 and rule 8AB. 8AB newly introduced, 8AA was there, sub rule 5 newly introduced and CBT circular. 
CBDT has issued circular giving four examples on 48 clause 3 and 45.4.9b. Four examples are given. All four examples are simple example. They have not covered any complicated situation. I am going to write a letter to CBDT. Sir, what if this is the situation, this is the situation, this is the situation, then what will happen? Government does not find it necessary to answer all these questions. Maybe complicated situations do not come up in their mind. 48 clause 3 is extremely unclear, but rule 8 AA sub rule 5 8 AB somewhat attempt to clarify the position. Now it clarifies, 8 AA sub rule 5 clarifies and 8 AB states that, that the taxable capital gain calculated under 45 4, 36 lakhs in our example, is not due to the capital asset actually transferred by firm to partner, but it is attributable to those other capital assets which are left out with a specified entity after the reconstitution is over which is due to revaluation of those remaining assets. This 36 lakhs is arising because of increase in the value of other assets as per rule 11u of the income tax rules. The gain attributable to capital asset which is actually transferred by specified entity to specified person is already taxed under 9b that is a real capital gain. Now what is getting taxed under 45.4 due to transfer of same capital asset by specified entity to specified person. Now what is getting taxed in connection with reconstitution is actually the gain attributable to increase in the value of other remaining assets which are left out with the specified entity. When these remaining assets are sold or transferred in future, at that time there will again be some capital gain arising of which some part has already been taxed under 45.4 at the time of reconstitution. This will result, this may result into double taxation. To avoid double taxation, 48 clause 3 was inserted stating that whatever is already taxed under 45.4 pertaining to asset 2 and asset 3 that is 24 lakhs and 12 lakhs will have to be reduced whenever these two assets are sold in future. You can anytime pause the video and copy down the examples. Huh? Do not wait for me to pause. Okay. Whenever they are transferred in future. However, what is to be done as per rule 8AB is again a little bit complicated. So, understand what is to be done. And again 45.4 though we completed 45.4 is also not very simple. In 45.4, we subtract capital account balance of the partner. So, capital account balance is not to be directly picked up from balance sheet. Capital account balance is to be computed or recomputed as per methodology given in rule 8AB. Rule 8AB step number 1, calculate capital gain under 9B. First, you calculate capital gain under 9B. Okay, no problem. If 9B is applicable, when will 9B be applicable? 9B will be applicable whenever there is a reconstitution plus transfer of capital asset. Capital gain arising due to transfer of capital asset by specified entity in connection with reconstitution. Step number 2 calculate, so this I am erasing, simply calculate capital gain under 9b. Step number 2 calculate capital gain tax, income tax payable on such capital gain on the above capital gain as per income tax act provision, as per income tax act provision plus surcharge plus health and education says whatever is applicable, final tax, tax. Step number 3, step number 3, once again calculate capital gain, but this time you calculate capital gain as per books of accounts on the same asset. Calculate capital gain once again on the transfer of same asset, but as per books of accounts and not as per income tax act. This will be called as book profit, book profit. What will be the difference between the answer in step number 1 and answer in step number 3? Both of them are capital gain, but here we are calculating capital gain as per income tax act by taking into account indexation and same capital gain you are calculating here without indexation as per books of account. So, instead of capital gain, this will be called as book profit. In other words, indexation will be ignored, book profit will be equal to FMV. Again, sale consideration is missing you will have to take into account FMV only even though you are calculating as per books of account. FMV of the capital asset minus book value of such capital asset or original cost of acquisition as per books of account. And now from this book profit subtract the tax which was calculated in step number 2 actual income tax. From such book profit calculated in step 3 subtract income tax including surcharge and health and education says. The resultant amount will be called as net book profit. So, net book profit is equal to book profit calculated in step number 3 minus income tax on capital gain calculated in step number 2. Getting this point? Okay. 
सो नाउ दिस इज द नेट बुक प्रॉफिट एज पर बुक्स ऑफ अकाउंट दिस नेट बुक प्रॉफिट डिस्ट्रीब्यूट और अलोकेट और अपोशन नेट बुक प्रॉफिट अमंगस्ट ऑल द स्पेसिफाइड पर्सन ऑल दी पार्टनर इंक्लूडिंग रिटायरिंग पार्टनर न्यूली एडमिटेड पार्टनर ने नॉट न्यूली एडमिटेड पार्टनर ओनली रिटायरिंग पार्टनर और डिसीज पार्टनर इंक्लूडिंग द पार्टनर्स हु आर देयर इमीजिएटली बिफोर रिकॉन्स्टिट्यूशन दिस विल इंक्लूड रिटायरिंग एंड डिसीज पार्टनर ऑल्सो इन वॉट रेशो इट इज टू बी अपोर्शन इन प्रॉफिट शेयरिंग रेशियो दिस विल बी एडेड सो दिस एक्स्ट्रा शेयर विल बी एडेड टू देयर रिस्पेक्टिव कैपिटल अकाउंट बैलेंसेज कैपिटल अकाउंट बैलेंस विल इंक्रीज ओरिजिनल इट वॉज थर्टी टू लैक्स नाउ फोर लैक्स एक्स्ट्रा अंडर दिस पर्टिकुलर रूल न्यू कैपिटल अकाउंट बैलेंस बिकम्स लेट से नॉट थर्टी सिक्स लैक्स न्यू कैपिटल अकाउंट बैलेंस सपोज इन देर इज एन इंक्रीज बाय बिकॉज ऑफ रूल एट ए बी इंक्रीज बाय टू लैख रुपीज न्यू कैपिटल गेन अकाउंट बैलेंस इज थर्टी फोर टेक दिस थर्टी फोर एंड देन अप्लाई फोर्टी फाइव फोर With this increased capital account balance, now calculate capital gain by applying formula A is equal to B plus C minus D, where D will be the new capital gain account balance, capital account balance. Simply, what is happening is step by step. Step first, calculate 9B, capital gain under 9B. Step number two, now you apply rule 8AB, rule 8AB, and bifurcate how much is the increase in the capital gain. then you find out net book profit add this net book profit and find out new capital account balance new capital account balance and with the help of new capital account balance you apply 454 and whatever is the gain in 454 that you apportion or allocate the amount of gain amount of gain under section 454 to the remaining assets allocated amongst remaining assets and then last may you will be applying section 48 clause 3 whenever these remaining assets are transferred in future then gain attributable to that particular asset will be reduced from the sale consideration of that asset are you understanding first you apply 9b find out tax on 9b also 9b capital gain and then you apply rule 8ab find out net book profit that is same 9b capital gain after as per books of account minus tax add it divided amongst partners find out new capital balance then apply 454 with the help of new capital account balance and then the gain arising in 454 that you will be allocating amongst the amongst the remaining assets and then based on that you apply 48 clause 3 okay our institute asked a question in may 22 rtp covering all of them covering all of them covering all of them it was in the form of case scenario mcq we will be solving it you will have a better understanding then step number 7 capital gain computed in step number 6 is to be attributed to the remaining capital assets still left out this apportionment is to be done in what ratio this whatever i discuss with you allocate amongst remaining asset this is to be done in the ratio of increase in their value asset 2 was increased by 20 lakh asset 3 was increased by 10 lakh in our example so ratio became 2 is to 1 so 36 lakh was apportioned amongst them in the ratio of 2 is to 1 in the ratio of increase in their values of remaining assets due to their valuation based on report of register value of course government has failed to clarify that what if instead of revaluation there is a devaluation three assets are left out two of the assets there is revaluation increase in the value one of the asset there is a devaluation then what to do particular asset there is no revaluation out of three remaining assets one of the asset is no revaluation then what to do government has failed to clarify okay let it be step number 8 now apply 48 clause 3 how to apply 48 clause 3 you know pretty well apportion amount in step number 7 will be reduced from the amount of full value of sale consideration whenever such asset is sold or transferred in future i have given this example example which i already explained you then some notes i have given example i am not covering because i have already explained it to you you can read it and understand by yourself what will be the status of capital gain of 30 lakhs calculated under 454 in our example it was 36 lakh this also i explain you out of 36 lakh the status of 36 lakh will depend upon the status of remaining assets if the remaining assets are short term 
then that much part of 36 lakhs will be short term whatever is pertaining to long term asset that much will be long term short term long term as on the date of reconstitution as per rule 8 double a sub rule 4 status of capital gain of 30 lakhs in our example it was 36 lakhs 30 lakhs 30 lakhs as per this example where did we get 30 lakhs from this will not depend upon status of capital asset actually transferred but will depend upon status of remaining assets as on the date of reconstitution as on the date of reconstitution remaining assets are remaining asset is short term then capital gain under 45 4 pertaining to pertaining to that much pertaining to that asset as on the date of reconstitution will be long term or will be short term depending upon this in this above example total gain is 30 lakhs but out of them asset 1 is short term asset 2 is long term at the time of reconstitution then out of total gain of 30 lakhs under 45 4 10 lakhs will be short term 20 lakh will be long term in our example 24 lakhs will be long term 12 lakh will be short term i modified the example as per 48 clause 3 this is done 48 3 is applicable not only for non depreciable asset it applies for depreciable asset also okay now details of capital gain under 45 4 are to be submitted along with it return electronically in form number 5c on or before due date of filing it return this point is not relevant from exam perspective in exam you can't they can't expect you to do this second point which we had skipped let's do it 48 clause 3 read with rule 8 AA and 8 ab amount of capital gain computed under 45 4 is to be reduced from full value of sale consideration of the remaining assets proportionately however whatever has been discussed now affects only the sale consideration of the remaining assets it is not to be added to the cost of acquisition of the remaining assets cost of acquisition will remain intact so in this example i told you that we have three options 30 lakh to be reduced from sale consideration 30 lakh to be added to cost of acquisition or 30 lakh to be reduced from capital gain the correct answer is reduce it from sale consideration don't add it to cost of acquisition don't reduce from sale consideration or don't reduce from capital gain that's it with that all the amendments pertaining to ay 20 to 23 in ca final direct tax paper 7 are over wish you all a very good luck all the best see you in the next video where we'll be solving rtp thank you